Are we ready? Do you need to call the meeting to order? Oh, great. Um, I will call the meeting. Uh, December 13th, 2023, uh, City Council meeting will to order. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We got all kinds of food over there. We've got lunch coming um, this in part of the day. So please help yourselves move around. Um, we are going to start with a little bit of an overview. Um, you've seen my narrative, um, a couple of changes to the narrative just since um, last year is how we sort of described what's going on in each department a little bit uh, differently. So there's a little bit of like look backwards, a little bit of sort of goal setting going forward. Um, and some metrics and what sort of the key changes are in those budgets. Um, we are doing the strategic planning process right now. What we hope to achieve from that is a work plan of sorts that we will work through with the council and then that can kind of feed the committees. And so that what you're seeing in here now, I think will look a little bit different next year when we've got kind of this system that we are collectively moving forward towards a similar path. Um, but I think this is a great start so you can kind of see a little bit more of that kind of summation of what's going on and what, what folks are thinking about. So um, overall, this is a 7% increase. As I said here, this is higher than I would like it to be. Um, Jess and I did a lot of sort of looking and seeing what we can kind of cut back on between what we got from the departments and what you've got in front of you. Um, we did a, uh, a good amount of that, but um, it feels like not enough. It seems like this is this is still too high. Um, so happy to work through this with you. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, on the little table there, you see that um, the what we've done in the past kind of highlight and define sort of the big pieces that are in there that are different from this current fiscal year. Um, and a little bit of a note for me on what I think would be really difficult to cut, but of course, everything is open to cut. Um, Okay, and just like last year, $100,000 equaled roughly 1% on the tax rate. So you can kind of just sort of think about that in the in the back of your mind. Um, big um, thing I did want to point out um, in the notable issue. Oh, sorry, let me just sort of touch base quickly on... Um, Compensation and benefits. So what we have in here right now is um, a just sort of overall 4.5% pay increase. Um, what we have, what we saw from the other municipalities surrounding us on average, folks are doing 5.5% increase um, for in their proposed budgets for FY25, I'll say. Um, the salary study, um, we've got the preliminary report out right now. And essentially, in comparison to the market, um, based on um, data collected in August, September of 2023, um, so essentially this, this, this fiscal year, um, we are overall as an organization doing okay. A lot of the folks at the bottom level are not in line with the market research. And really uh, the, the plan recommendation is that those folks are brought up. Um, a good amount of the upper half, I'll say, um, are not necessarily, when you think about it in terms of a market comparison, um, in need of an increase to accommodate uh, where we are in comparison to the market. Um, there's a second uh, recommendation in the salary study that uh, wanted number one step try to get those folks who are not at minimum to minimum um, and then a second phase of sort of bringing in a longevity <clears throat> lens to that and uh, shifting folks to that so um, we can work and do some um, back end figuring of how much that will cost in comparison to what this 4.5 percent um, actually looks like. Uh, so just some thoughts on that. Um, 
can ask a question on that or yes. you want to dive into that? Um, I, can ask it later. I think you can this first. I think you can ask it now. All right. Are you saying that you're going to look at 4.5 as an average and take the lower, we, we talked about folks on the lower third or half, right? Are you going to address that more heavily and less as they as you rise up, and that average will be four percent of an increase across the overall salary benefit salary budget? Or are you? So I think the what's in the budget is four point five percent. That may change based on what folks you what you folks want to do, and then I think that just gives us a dollar amount. Basically, we can figure out how we actually apply that to the individual okay. based on um, what that full dollar amount is. Okay. Um, Jess and I can give you more information about what, how much of that plan can be achieved within that, what 4.5% gives us right now in terms of the dollar amount. That okay. makes sense. Right. I do have a question about just broadly the staff salary. Question. Yeah. I believe it was last year we had a group of a one time bump to everybody to help account for inflation. Yes. Was that taken out from this? That has been given to people this year. It was not that 1.25% was not an increase to the salaries, but did it look that way in the budget? Right. Yes. To make Colin is what you're asking. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So where was that then? So it was last year, it was in the budget as 1.25% on everybody's rate, but we gave it as a one time lump sum. So this year's budget mm -hmm. is reflecting the current hourly rates for all staff that does not include that 1.25 one time bump. Okay, or, so 4.5 yes. is on the south, is on the base salary, yes. it's not on that. Okay, correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, what else do I want to point out here? Um, so we've got some notable ish, issues that I pointed out as well that starts at the bottom of page two and goes into page three. Um, the uh, big one that um, is quite nerve wracking, I'll say, is um, a very low un unassigned fund balance. Um, of 236,000 at the end of FY23. Um, I'll say that preliminary number, the audit is still being finalized, but um, likely to be uh, not likely to uh, change in any real significant way. Um, so that um, is something we really want to keep in mind and focus on um, and, uh, and think through um, how to address that. Um, ideally over a number of years to really get that up. Um, we've got a couple of other things um, that are out there that we don't have fully funded. Um, we still um, are getting more information and trying to figure out exactly um, what to do about a corrosion problem on the frame of the ladder truck. Uh, that initial estimate is 294,000. Um, and so we, at the moment, do have that worked into the rolling stock fund in FY25, I believe. Um, but that rolling stock fund is, is real tight. So um, it's in there, but know that that's a, that's a big uh, pressure point. Main Street Waterline project, as you folks know, we ran into ledge on the upper end of that project. Um, still need to figure out what that what that looks like. Um, that it will be in the uh, um, that's in sort of the water fund side of things, but still this it's all kind of comes together. <laughs> um, so we'll know more about what that looks like hopefully over the couple next couple of months. Um, then we've got the economic development fund. So um, as of right now, this is the last fiscal year that we actually have that as a revenue source. We will be asking the voters in April to approve that going forward as well. Um, and what you've got in your budget packet is a projection of what that would look like for the next three years if it is approved. Um, if it is not approved, 
We uh, can cover the Crescent Connector need, we can cover the Main Street Park need, and only about 450-ish, I think, thousand of the Amtrak match. Um, to Lincoln renovation, very, very first cost estimate, it's 500,000 over. We are working pretty significantly at trying to get that down to 2.5 million, which is what we've got left of the ARPA funds for this renovation. Then also uh, litigation. We talked last year about increasing those funds, just generally speaking, because we're doing more code enforcement work. We want to be doing more code enforcement work. Um, and uh, we've got a big uh, litigation um, on the table right now. And so just to be clear, if, if it goes full, full many years, we don't have that fully covered in the budget right now. Um, okay. Then uh, what you've also got in your narrative are what each of you talked about and um, asked about for council roles back in September. Um, You've got that in your packet. I don't know that uh, we need to go into that in detail, but does anybody have any questions about how anything was addressed or? Okay. Um, all right, so the tax illustration. So essentially what we're looking at right now um, it, at a 7% budget increase is um, basically $184 on a, more over what folks are paying FY24 on a $208,000 home. Um, I'll just say, uh, broadly speaking, which has been in the news quite a bit, is education funding is going to be, I think, quite painful for folks. Um, so just want to kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So another part of this overview is to just look at the revenue um, budget, just in terms of um, overall what that looks like. So we can switch over to that unless anybody else has any kind of overarching questions, comments, thoughts we want to touch on right now. I do in regard to the projects. Is this the appropriate time or would that be later? Sure. We got time right now. So, so on the three projects that you that are talked about in this overview, my question is in regards to priority because there's a certain part of me that at this particular point, based on priority and what we're looking at with the water line and everything else, I get to the point where I don't think Main Street Park is a priority. I get to the point where I start to my real thinking is. Let's not do it if we don't have to. Let's save these funds. It would be nice to have that beautified over there, but at the same time, I also know in the future that if we're going to continue down the path, I believe we we will. There is more to come for that particular intersection anyway, and so there will be another time and another discussion to green green up that space and beautify that space. And right now, it feels like this is a time when. We don't have to spend these funds. Yeah. Do we have any requirement to spend, but given the fact that we got the grant, or do we just give it back? Uh, okay. We we can look into that, but I uh, presume we would give it back. Um, I, I think we have to spend it. Is it this this yeah, coming year? Twenty twenty four is when we would have to spend okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had some of the expenses already on the design of that project, but we had, we would basically pay for that out of the economic development fund and um, not, uh, so we can cover what's been spent so far, no problem. Um, it's, uh, we will have a little bit of work to do probably in relationship building with the state, just because we're not making use of a grant that we asked for, but um, I think I think that is a potential if that's the direction the council would like to go in. Where um, is that grant from? It is from the downtown transportation fund. Well, let's put it towards Amtrak. That's downtown transportation project. I mean, writing them a nice letter saying, <laughs> hey, guess what? And and so a follow-up question to that is totally related is the the I keep hearing um the there's creep, it feels like in the Amtrak grant match number. I thought initially 
that it was somewhere around 500. And this could just be me. So, and then I thought I heard 600, and now I'm seeing 750. Yeah. So what what's going on with that? Um. So the I was working with a six hundred thousand dollar number. Um. Because just in the way you think about the match cal calculation, are we talking about a total project amount of three million, or are we talking about three million plus what the local match requirement is? So it turns out it we I mean we can access whatever we can access from that $3 million based on whatever match we can provide. So we can access less of 3 million if we have less match that we can bring to the table. If we wanna access the full 3 million, we actually need $750,000 match to get the full 3 million from the federal government. And this was, Chris just worked this out by finally being able to put some time into getting to the details to figure out exactly what this situation is and do we think that the uh, full plans in the terms in terms of what we think we're going to do with that will require the um, so so backing up sorry so that's yeah. 3.75 million dollars is three million seven hundred fifty million yes dollars for the project yeah the plans thus far and what were submitted are really conceptual so the first step of this um, project to move it forward is to put out an RFP to get a um, consultant on board to really do bring it to a more workable design level that we can then actually get a more true cost estimate. Mm -hmm. And all of that is money. So we, if we're moving forward, we should do that. If we're not moving forward, we should not do that. But there's, yeah. And is there any any part of this process where does the does the owner of the facility have a requirement or an ask or a match on this? Because this is the city and the feds beautifying this is essentially private property. It's there's no requirement. <clears throat> so I think they, you know. It would be interesting to find out if that would be considered a downtown transportation project to which two hundred and some odd thousand dollar grant could be transferred. Um, I'm, I'm guessing no, but it's worth an ask. I think they just came out with a new round. The the uh, announcement that was open again. You can apply for a new grant. I don't know if matching funds can be, can be sourced from yeah. another grid. That you're trying to match. <laughs> probably not. Somebody probably thought of saying no to that. There are but, cases where it can be because we're doing but, that with Crescent Connector. Hmm. Um, the state's funds are our matching funds um, okay. because that's a federal grant as well. So it, it's possible. That yeah, I think it is where it happens, but yeah, it depends on the programs that are funding. Yeah, and if the state, if that state program is federal funding, then right. no. But if it's right. actually state funding, then. And then another thought I had to help fund that, and we can have this conversation another time. I'm going to drop the word paid parking um, in that area, uh, especially in the area surrounding the multi-level transit center that we're now is private and we're funding. Um, I think this year is a great year to have to begin a conversation around the true cost of providing parking. Um, and what that means in the long term. Um, just as I try, this is my personal, but just as I try to get my head around what we're doing with the train station, um, I feel like it is going to bring a lot to this community, but I just like we think about the lot, I think we need to think about who's using it and, and what that means um, and what we're giving up, what we're managing as a community for free. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there for maybe something to discuss over the next year um, for funding. But it would be yeah, it would be interesting to figure out if we can move that grant. Um, I don't disagree about the park at all. I don't know what other people think. I would agree completely with Marcus on this. Um, that was one of the first things I noticed when I read the binder. Um, as important as our downtown is, that five corners location we already have a monument downtown that's crumbling that we are not 
spending money on repairing. And it's a very small part. More is to come in that location um, is far more important and will have far more economic impact on Essex Junction and surrounding towns if the train station is relegated. So I, I'm not a fan of the part. I don't disagree. Um, I think one of the concerns that I would have is if we can't ship the funds to Amtrak and we give the funds back, does that put us in a position of potentially not getting any funds? Like, do do we get like, you know, red flag to ever get any additional funds from the state because mm -hmm. we've done that? And so, and I don't know that we are going to get a straight answer from the state on yeah. that question, uh, but that would be one of my concerns. One other portion on the uh, train station since I came up with the match, um, <laughs> depending on the how the uh, spending was requested or was designed, the match may or may not need to be at the rate that is currently offered. That might be negotiable, uh, but that would depend on the statute for that funding. Uh, so that might be worth exploring, as well as whether or not, since it came from Leahy and he's no longer there, this might not be possible, but um, there have been precedent in the past where congressional designated spending was originally designated in one path, that then the request was made to have it go through a different funding channel, and not all funding channels require matching. So there may be ways to reduce that, but it would take the, the, the call to the designation or to our um, legislative designation. Okay. Okay. Also wondering if that, like, what's the timeline on that match spend? You know, like, how many years does that spread out? If it's, you know, 125 at first to get the first stage you're talking about, mm -hmm. and then we're going to spend another 350 in two, three years, is that a different, um, does that change anything? Yeah. Because I'm imagining it's not 750 in one year. Correct. Yeah. So if the, and that's going to be important to know, I think, as we talk to the community about that. Renewing the economic development thing, you know, really projecting that out for for three to ten years. I think, because um, I mean, in my head right now, in the past week, I've been thinking about it as, as all at once, but that's not always the case. Yeah, we the way it's shown right now is over that four year time span between FY twenty four. Um, Amtrak is not in FY twenty four. It's between FY twenty five and FY twenty seven, sort of spread out over those. Those three years. Yeah. Um, and the, and I track, have, sorry, oh, sorry. I have one more question about the train station. Back when previously I'd been on the board, we were also talking about doing work on you know, Ridge Railroad Street, Railroad Ave, the street that goes along the, the bus station. We were talking about waterline work under there and also even possibly changing the direction of the road to accommodate new bus routes. Is that still, I don't know about the road, the direction change, but all the waterline pipes needing to be updated on that road? Like, are we going to need to think about a project at the same time as this train renovation? I think that is still in the capital um, plan. And is that part of the, the 3.75 or is that a separate project? A separate That's project. So but we, since we're already doing construction over there, we would want to do the waterline work at the same, at the same time. time. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, that's a very interesting question because I wonder if that is match worthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there's going to be a lot happening between mm -hmm. the end of the next construction season and the two or three years following as we do traffic impact studies seeing how the Crescent Connector impacts that whole area, yep. playing around with direction changes, Park Street. Okay. Um, all right, this is helpful. We will find some things out. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the revenue real quick. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Jeff, I actually showed that that railroad app is like the next on the list. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, it is. 
Yeah, 244 and change with 120. This is just the most recent one that we haven't. There's updates to this, yes. but yep. 127 out of the water fund and 116 of the general fund. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, so not too um, much different to sort of uh, point out here. Um, the biggest um, difference that you uh, see here, I'm not entirely sure where we see it, but maybe we don't have that because it does. Um, it's going to be actually a summary for you. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah, because that's the overall rate. Right. Right. Not yeah. right. Okay. So, um, looking at the general fund summary and the revenues that we see there, um, one of the uh, big changes that you see is in community development. That's up 172%. That is, um, there are two increases in there. We are assuming an increase of just the general community development fees because we did increase those. Um, but also really what you're seeing there is the rental registry um, revenue fund, revenue side of things there. Um, so if that, um, if over the next couple of months for whatever reason, if we don't move that program forward, that will come down, but also so will the expense side of the um, equation on that. Um, uh, the other things, Jess can correct me here if I've got this wrong, some of these um, movements around are um, on the IT line, I think that's an adjustment. Um, where are you looking? Sorry, IT is down. Oh, gotcha. Yep. Okay. So, um, we're allocating IT expenses differently than we are this year. So that fourteen thousand this year was a direct transfer in from wastewater. We've included IT in the admin allocation for all funds this year. So there's still revenue. It's just reflected under the um. Um, the admin transfer in rather than this IT line. Okay, anything else to point out? Um, the only other thing with revenue, and it's not very much revenue uh, under, I'm going to flip to the, the actual revenue budget here. Oops. Um, we had a uh, rent and royalties line. So we used to rent out parking space to chase moving like way, way back. Mm -hmm. um, and that agreement expired because properties changed hands. Um, so that was taken out for this year. The other thing, so the dollar that shows in there now is technically the rent that we charge ships, which we don't actually charge, <laughs> um, just to explain what's in that mm -hmm. in that line. <clears throat> so if we were at a place where we started charging rent to anyone that's in our spaces, um, that line also could be increased. Um, if, if I Organization wants to use a space, like let's I'm trying to go down this road right now. But if the room across the hall is not being used, and an organization wants to use it uh, regularly, do we now charge them rent? I noticed when I was looking into the senior center, what other communities did with their spaces and everything. It, it mm -hmm. became really apparent that uh, so I an example. They do. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't. We don't have a lot of those spaces. But once we renovate the building, mm -hmm. um, this space, the senior center, whatever spaces we have, um, I'm not saying we can make a ton of money, but we might be able to recover some cleaning fees yep. and some other things to just, um, and even, I don't know, the cold board room, mm -hmm. um, but there might be a philosophical issue with that, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know that there is other communities. Mm -hmm. And I think um, <clears throat> there might not be in the wider community. Uh, the philosophical issue to that. So I think we need to really, I mean, this, 
that's the kind of networking that you need to get to at some point. Um, so just pointing that out. Yeah. And there is a space use policy um, that was a village policy from several years ago. <clears throat> and I think it does outline small fees. It's like ten, twenty dollars or something like that. But we that's another policy that we could look at revising and um, potential revenue if after renovation we have space that we can use. I'm renting the conference room of the Waterbury uh, town offices next month, and it's one hundred and twenty-five dollars for mm -hmm. the day. Yes, so everybody charges. Yeah, yeah. the police the district charges too. Yes, yeah, the police department does not. Use their community room. I mean, there, it's it's an interesting discussion. It's not necessarily cut dry, but I think, yeah. Or maybe there's a category of use. You know, there's a delineation of nonprofits or something. I don't, I don't know. Oh yeah, and it's certainly mm -hmm. there's yeah. city if there's municipal committees, they don't get charged right. and they get precedence. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There are also other libraries in the state that do charge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just there are absolutely. We're we're under so much pressure right now that I think we just need to. Think about those things. Um, okay, we're a couple minutes over. Um, anything else? Any other questions on Okay. All right. So, um, Chief Caborio is uh, joining us on Zoom. Don't see him yet. Yes, oh, uh, I should be here. <laughs> <laughs> it did seem odd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jess will get to your budget here. All right. Um, so, Chris, anything you want to highlight or point out about um, what you've got here on your budget? Um, I I will just point out that there is a uh, the big kind of change here is um, paying folks for their time to actually volunteer, which is not what we not what we currently do, um, and. Um, there's a few other um, changes that are in here um, based on just our better understanding of what costs are these days. Uh, but yes. Chris, anything you want to point out? No, basically in summary, just that um, the big increase would be moving. Uh, currently we pay individuals for their response to fire calls. What we're looking at doing is making a change so that we would compensate individuals for training hours that they attend. So, you know, we do require people, individuals to remain active. They have to have uh, 10 hours of training every quarter uh, as a minimum. So um, we do require them to maintain that. So all we're looking to do is in turn, we'll start compensating uh, those individuals who attend training either on Monday night or Thursday mornings, uh, we run two sessions a week. So um, that's where the big increase comes from. Everything else down below, uh, a lot of it, again, just tied to inflation, um, you know, so my, minor increases uh, just to keep up with that. Uh, but those are, that uh, salary line is, is really the big one this year. Can you differentiate? Good morning, by the way. Um, can you differentiate the increase between the increase from twenty to twenty-one dollars an hour and the paid training time lump? Is it off the top of your head? Yeah. So all we do is um, we'll take the individual pay rates. So they vary based on your years of service, based on your um, level of certification. So in other words, we have a minimum base hourly rate of seventeen fifty an hour, but we do have step increases for those individuals who are certified. Therefore, if you are a uh, certified firefighter one, you would get an extra dollar an hour. If you're an engineer, so your your 
um, qualified to operate all our apparatus. That's a that's another level. You'd be uh, you'd you'd get an extra dollar an hour. EMTs get an extra dollar an hour, and AEMTs get an extra dollar an hour. So all I do is take the hourly, <clears throat> excuse me, the hourly rates of everyone active, and simply drag that down in an Excel spreadsheet to get an average uh, hourly rate. So based on all of the increases, last year that average rate was $20 per hour. This year that average rate is $21 per hour. So we use that as the basis to um, you know, add the hours in and we use that as the factor to come up with the dollar value. Thanks, makes sense. I think, Raj, um, if I understand your question, you wanted to know what's the what's the difference between the pay increase versus the difference of what the, this change in operation and paying volunteers for their time. Yeah, but I guess I guess it sounds so. It sounds like we're not necessarily giving a pay raise across the board, as opposed to that is just a normal step increase firefighters are getting as they add certifications. So I. My question isn't really relevant at that point, so never mind. Because it's right. My question was wondering if we were giving an across the board increase, and I didn't understand the step nature of it. I thought everybody was getting a flat twenty, and now they're getting twenty one, and then we're adding the training. Yeah. Um, so now I understand. Yeah. yeah, that just gets us to our base number, so that we're we do a lot of it just based, uh, Raj, on just adding hours. So looking at this. We figured this to be an increase of about 300 hours a month. So again, to get us to that financial number, we do our average hourly rate, multiply it by the 300 hours, um, you know, to get us that amount of 86,400. Um, the other thing here too is again, what we're seeing this year uh, based on calendar year, we're running, we're going to be running about 10% increase in calls over last year. So, you know, it's hard to base your salary numbers. You know, it's a roll of the dice as to what's going to happen. Uh, last year, we ran about 500 calls for service. This year, we're on track to be closer to 550 calls for service. So, um, you know, that, and, and immediately I can see that where I am, you know, year to day to my salary line, we're, you know, probably about $5,000 over budget currently so just hoping that that you know averages out in the next six months but yeah so part of this part of this increase will be paid training and hopefully to compensate for a slightly higher call volume in um, fy 26 25 five yeah what's the, <laughs> what's the nature what's the general nature of that the calls what's the increase can you pinpoint it or is it I, I would say that our, our yeah our call volume is getting higher. I mean we're doing and being called um, more regularly, if you would, for um, EMS assistance. You know your EMS call volume is really really high. Um, again, Essex Rescue, uh, you know if they if they had their way, they would like to see us dispatched to all of their calls here in the city. Um, I have told them we're not going to do that. We that that would just burn out our people. Um, but that's what they would like to see. I can appreciate, you know, I certainly understand where they are and um, I hope they understand where we are. Um, but we get dispatched for um, automatically if they're not in service, we get dispatched to any unresponsive individual. If, if a person is reported to be unresponsive, they dispatch the fire department along with rescue so that we meet, we can get there and, and assist them with uh, CPR if that's required. And, um, and then just um, lift assist moving, moving patients. If they're, you know, you got somebody that's on the second floor or down in a basement needs to come upstairs. Um, you know, you, you need personnel to uh, assist you in making that happen. And unlike rescue, they have their own reimbursement challenges, obviously, but unlike rescue, we're not seeing a reimbursement on those EMS calls, correct? Correct. 
I do have a question and comments. Um, for the, the comment first, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, inflation is only 3.2%. So I think we should be very cautious as to when we're going to say uh, inflation as to why costs are going to go up 20 something percent. That's not going to uh, really look good if anybody asks us about that. So uh, if the if the reason for increases are not inflation, but rather to align with historical spending, um, that might be a better narrative to put into the uh, to the charts. Um, also, we're looking at a 7.1% overall budget increase. So coming into this, my lens is, is really more of a cutting lens. And so I'm curious, Chief Gaborio, if there were things in, or are there things in here that you believe could be cut without sacrificing the ability of the department to respond to calls for, for service? Always a challenge, Andrew. Um, you know, again, we don't we don't really get to the end of a budget year and find ourselves with a lot of excess funds that you know we're able to spend. Um, I can certainly appreciate, you know, consumer price indexes that reflect inflation rates. I would, I you know, and, and you're right. We could we could change the text. But the inflationary factors on those items that impact us are a lot higher than what consumers see. That's for sure. Um, you know, again, in uniforms, uh, you know, our gear, we're, we're to the point where we're just about to uh, the point of $4,000 just to, to put a brand new coat and bunker pants on an individual. It's about two thousand dollars a piece, really. So, and and it just it's crazy, um, but yes, I understand that. Um, is there anything else here that can be cut? Again, we could, I could sit down and take a look a lot closer, but I don't know that I could get us down to seven percent. Totally understand that, and uh, please know I'm not asking you to cut out uh, what would end up being what fifty thousand from your from your budget. Mm -hmm. That's that's not the intent of the question. Um, and certainly, looking at your uh, your historical spending, you do usually come in right around two to seven thousand or so uh, from budget to actual. So no, it doesn't seem as if you are um, regularly padding the budget or anything like that. So please know that's not the intent, but rather. As we're having these conversations, um, curious of your thoughts on it uh, to make sure that when we go back and deliberate, it's not a let's just cut 50,000 from the fire department. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. It, I would honestly say to you that it would be a, it would be a challenge um, to find money in this budget. Yeah, thank you. Chief, if I can ask uh, in regards to your defining su success metrics, um, you say that you want to maintain 100% response to calls for fire response. I assume that you're also in that statement stating that this year you've been able to do 100%. And so you're hoping to repeat that next year, correct? Correct. This is a real challenge. I mean, you know, we do have a, if you could look at our roster, we, I would say we have a healthy roster. You know, we have uh, 25 to 30 active individuals, um, but you drop tones for calls at any time of the day or night. And, you know, sometimes there are some real challenges in, in getting support for fire call response. You know, individuals, a lot of individuals working during the day. Um, we, ha we have a number of people that work different shifts. The worst time of day is probably that six o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the morning, where you've got those that work a regular shift kind of getting ready to go into work and those coming off an, an odd shift if they work a 24 shift or a 12 hour shift and they're not off yet. So, you know, you got that period where, you know, it's it's sometimes a challenge. So it's uh it's tough. I, I again we had 
had another individual this week that has resigned, be you know, due to family issues, uh, time commitment, uh, 10 years, 10 years. He's trained to a firefighter too. He's an AEMT. Um, it's a big loss. You, you don't, you don't replace those people. You don't replace those people overnight. It takes years. So chief on that particular note, speaking about retention, because I know that a portion of what this increase, you know, paying for this training, doing these things is, is one, I think being much more fair to these individuals who are giving their time to help protect our city. What I also assume, and I, I know in previous conversations, it's also about trying to help with retention of our volunteer fire, fire department. Can you speak to that and how this increase is going to contribute to that and what other things you may need if they're not in this particular budget that you're going to need in order to, again, retain these, this fighting force? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big thing. We've we've had individuals that have, uh, you know, we do monitor, you know, people's people's response, people keeping up with training. And if we see individuals kind of dropping back, um, I know the line officers have done a great job with contacting them. Hey, what's going on? What's happening? And we've had a couple of individuals that have like, hey, I've had to take a second job. I need um, I need more income, you know, to uh, to be able to maintain um, living here in the city of Essex Junction. So that's why, you know, we're looking at Okay, maybe if we compensate training and, and, and get some more paid time here, then what that does is gets a, um, you know, a little bit stronger income coming from the fire department to uh, to help sustain those those living costs here in the city. Chief, can you talk a little bit about what beginning planning for the station replacement looks like? Sure. I mean, we brought this up. I brought this up probably for the last five years. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think what we need to do, my recommendation would be to hire a consultant that's, you know, familiar with um, planning for, for fire services, emergency services, and... Um, coming in and taking a look at where we are today, what's available to us and, and, you know, what we should be, where, where we should go, how big of a, how big of a station, how large of a station do we need to, to suit the city for the next, you know, 60 to 70 years. And where, where can that station be? Um, how big does it need to be? and give us some kind of an idea as to cost so that we can take the next step and plan for that replacement. And you haven't planned for this consultant in your budget, correct? That's not in? No, I have not. I, I, uh, okay. my view of the world would be that would, that would come from the city. That would, you know, yeah. the city should be planning for that to be done. Just checking. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> I'm also going have any other questions for Archie for you. I'm good. Good for him. Regina, how about you address? Uh, we can, if if you'd like, we can also just look at the uh, fire building budget real quick yeah. while we've got the sure. chief um, on. Um, yeah. I've got a perhaps a silly question. Um, Comcast is listed under buildings. We've got BT for the library. Do we have one internet provider for the, I just want to know this, for the city, or are we spacing them out based on facility? 
Um, uh, it's a good question. Um, we have been focused right now more on phone service because we've got um, First Light for phones and it's uh, getting rapidly more expensive. And so we are looking at um, switching that service. Burlington Telecom is, a, is an obvious choice. Um, we also have Integrity, which is a separate company that actually runs our voicemail and phone system. Um, so we're looking at Burlington Telecom because that could sort of all be wrapped up into one, one system and hopefully the um, cost of that monthly service will, will come down. Um, I don't know off the top of my head in terms of internet service per building. So internet service, we essentially have two providers for each location so that we have that backup. Um, and we're living under what the town had set up for us um, with the idea being that as we go through the renovations here at Lincoln, um, those will all be looked at to see, you know, because like Berlin, even getting Burlington Telecom in here is requiring everything. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be services that they can provide more holistically that we could, you know, cut ties with another provider. Um, so I think that was kind of the plan okay. going into the renovation process was to look at all of that it, phone, internet combined. Great. <clears throat> Is this a bid process that you go through in order to determine these things? How does that process work? Or do you just make the call? Because obviously there are multiple competitors. I'm not saying that Burlington Telecom is not a great option. I'm just wondering because there are multiple services that can provide these things. Yeah, the um, I think it would probably be more in the realm of get, gathering various quotes, um, but depend based on our purchasing policy, but. Um, and that's what we've been working on right now um, for this building, at least. Yeah. Sorry, Chief, there's a little bit of a side. Sorry, <laughs> no, no problem. With, with regards to us at the fire station, um, we are now connected to the city services. So this Comcast line uh, for us will be disconnected uh, probably at the end of December. <laughs> so do we need that for your $172.90 in the budget um, for that Comcast line? Chris, I think, I'm reading it. Yeah, so Chris, that Comcast line that's in the building budget is for the TV, right? Uh, no, the television would be, that's a separate bill that's like $21 a month. So this 172.90 was our internet. Now that they've brought that fiber line over to the fire station um, and everything, you know, we've had it up now for like two months. Uh, so our plan is to remove the Comcast service for internet from the fire station. So I think that 172.90 can come out of the building budget. Woo. I did that specifically for Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> that was all you get today. That was your one. Keep it in, and that goes to coffee. Oh. <laughs> you know where I live. <laughs> also, Amber likes pennies. Yes. Much, much. <laughs> <laughs> is the first light not to get too much into the weeds but is the first light a uh, a contract like that shouldn't be that okay yeah all right it's kind of curious as to why the increase if they're fixed contracts <laughs> because they can raise rates when <laughs> they see fit and get approval okay yeah how long are we contracted for i think we have another year on the, on first light it's the contracts are different by building i think it's about a year six months to a year and there's no potential l clause 
You um, have to pay termination fee. There's a wicked termination fee, but we're at a point where it may be with the renovations, it may be worth it to pay that termination fee because we'll save it in what we're paying by moving to something else. <clears throat> Okay, anything else for Chris? All right, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, we'll Chris. Keep, you, keep you on schedule. Good luck. All right. <laughs> It'll get off track. Cool. Okay. The police department is up first in health and health and human services side of things. Um, uh, so we can have that conversation first if you would like. Sure. sure. Um, and uh, I think there's there's two pieces that we pointed out. Um, one is the um, additional expense for the gasoline. This was, as I understand it, Greg could explain more, but um, was always in the uh, public works building budget and they're reassigning out to the various departments that that um, relates to. Um, and there's also the budget is lower because um, previously the vacancies that the police department had was still kept in the uh, salary line. Uh, this year, the recommendation is to um, lower that budget assuming a vacancy is a real vacancy for the year mm -hmm. if i'm saying that correctly you guys should explain what's okay. going on <laughs> greg's thanks for getting coming down Morning, all. Morning. 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 All right. You want to start? I'll try. Yeah. I'll try first first because, uh, um, so you might remember uh, back when Sarah Macy was here. We, you know, we had a lot of vacancies in the police department. We were having. Um, we, we took a look back historically in the past several years to then up to ten percent of um, uh, the uh, staff. We typically were short staff by about ten percent. So rather than creating having fund balance, we saw this trend. We decided to do I think we called it like a discount rate. So. Um, or discount for vacancies. So we had 10% in uh, patrol and 10% in dispatch. Um, the 10% in patrol is still happening this year. Um, we have some retirements that are coming up. We're actually just down one one officer right now. But right. We, we do have uh, the expectation that um, we'll have some more openings coming up in the coming year. Hopefully we'll fill them. Um, hopefully it's going to be a good problem for us to have to be, be fully staffed. But at this point, we're still at that 10%. Um, dispatch, we're fully funding. We're up to full staff and dispatch. We don't foresee any uh, staffing shortages there. So that is back up. Um, one of the changes that we made, I don't know if this is Regina, what you were referring to, um, health insurance in the town, we had typically budgeted, uh, we have an opt out plan. So uh, people who decide not to take health insurance can um, save up town money and also they get uh, the stipend or bonus for not taking it. Um, we always budgeted those people as as being on a single plan, just for budgeting purposes, thinking that something changes or or counting for something. We took a closer look at that this year, and historically, there's not much change. People who opt out opt out. Um, there's always a little bit of turnover, but we made a big change. We we budgeted everybody for what they're actually taking for health insurance. So that um, I think hit the police quite a bit. That resulted in some savings. Um, other changes, personnel in the police, uh, we had a records clerk dispatcher who recently left, um, that position has been filled with just a record clerk, um, coming in at a lower salary, so there's some savings there, uh, staffing-wise. 
I think those are the big things. And Regina, I don't know if that answers what you were trying to get at. Um, but those the, the high level mm -hmm. staffing and personnel side of things. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just start with the with the record clerk thing. So you'll see a you'll see a change in where that staffing person is actually located. It was in dispatch, now it's in admin. So it's just a simple change of, of where that person is is living, where that position is living, because the person no longer dispatches. Um, so we have just a records clerk now. So that's that. Um, I don't have a whole lot of like new initiatives to talk about or anything like that. Um, basically, we're just trying to keep up with increased cost and that kind of thing. Um, I don't have a whole lot of Whole lot of money that we want to spend more than what we did last year, but I'd like to go over just a couple of the things for you that we are that we are trying to keep up with. So um, probably we'll notice that there's an increase in the legal fees line, and the legal fees line was added uh, when when the two entities split, um, so to, re to reflect the actual cost that, that it cost uh, for the police department to run. Uh, we do rely on legal fees as, or, and legal advice quite a bit, as you can imagine. Um, so we're that's in there uh, now. Um, as we go down, looking at um, training, we've, we've tried to increase that, or at least when I came in as chief, I wanted to increase that budget by two thousand a year for five years. Um, if we're in the fourth year, this will be the fourth year of, that, of those increases. So we're trying to bump that up a little bit by two thousand um, dollars. We uh, have a, a contracted increase with community outreach that we're trying to support. I believe that's around three, three or three and a half percent. Um, so we're so that's included in there. That you'll see that. Um, we'd like to replace two marked vehicles this year. Um, we've had a lot of issues over the last three years trying to get vehicles. Uh, we waited for about two years to finally get Ford to deliver vehicles for us, and when they did, they delivered them all at once this summer. Uh, but now we're we're set for or at least we've caught up for the last three years but now we'd like to continue um, with the replacement of those vehicles unfortunately our costs for vehicles have gone from about thirty nine thousand per vehicle to about fifty six thousand anticipated in 2025 budget year um, just and those those will be hybrids if we can find them um, those are becoming increasingly difficult for us to get um, Ford is making as many as they used to and the vendors that we're that we're using um, can't seem to find them. So uh, this past summer, we had to change our plans of buying hybrids, uh, two hybrids, and actually bought two uh, normal police vehicles um, because we needed the vehicles. Um, we are saving a little bit this year when we transfer the equipment over from the old vehicles to the new vehicles, however, um, because we won't be having to buy new, we'll be transferring some of the old equipment out of those, those other vehicles. Um, they are halfway through their life cycle. Um, that equipment is so so that that'll be a benefit to us the next time that those cars are replaced those will be replaced with with new equipment so that's our that's our plan to do that um we're trying to also replace an unmarked detective's vehicle that has about 130 135 000 on it now so we're trying to replace that one uh next year uh, we've got a little small increase in uniforms and equipment. We're trying to get that to actually where it reflects the actual cost. Each officer is, a, is allotted according to the contract, $450 a year to buy uh, equipment that's uh, in uniforms that are not provided by the department. The department provides all the uniforms and that type of thing. He does other boots and gloves and things like that that they, that they would need. So we're trying to reflect the actual cost in that line item. Um, Again, increase in vehicle vehicle maintenance because we have hybrids. Uh, our vehicle costs have gone up to maintain those. Um, so we're trying to we're trying to keep up with that. Costly tires and cost of oil changes and everything have gone up. And then uh, finally, I have a note here about an increased contribution for CJC to cover cost of living increases for the folks at the at the CJC. They've traditionally never gotten that, and we've never had that in our budget. That has always just been. Like we're gonna do that, but we're gonna find the money somewhere. So we'd actually like to like to put that in our in our line item so that when our contribution goes to CJC, there is a there's known that that's what's going to go for. Um, those are really the the major increases um, that we're that we're talking about. Um, other than that, we've had we we would like to put money into capital improvements because we've spent some money. Uh, in uh, in keeping up with our um, communications, 
Uh, we just recently, the town replaced uh, microwaves for us, not the kind of microwaves for you know, like kosher food, but the kinds that connect together and via radio waves. So we, we spent quite a bit uh, to replace those. They have about a 10 year life cycle. So we've had to replace those and we'd like to continue putting money into capital to, uh, to do that. Um, probably the, the biggest, as far as like amount uh, that yet you would see an increase in our budget home would be salaries and, and benefits. And that's to, that's most of it is negotiated through a prior contract with the, with the FOP and the local um, employees association that comes up next January. I think we'll start I negotiating year into their contract. And they'll be in their last year of this contract in July. We'll start their last year of the contract. Okay. Up. So that's reflected uh, as far as what's already been what's already been agreed upon. So, and th and that's really all I have to to talk about. Um, animal control has a small increase in there. I know that folks have have asked questions about that. And from time to time, I always get questions about animal control. <laughs> and 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 it's and it's mainly we. So just to make it make it understood for folks out out there listening is that we contract with Heart Animal Services for our animal control. Um, it's a uh, lady. Um, who provides that service to us on the contract. Um, and we also have a contract with, uh, with Humane Society uh, for our boarding and that type of thing, where we give them a certain amount of a year to at least save space for us. Right now, we're very fortunate. Um, the other only uh, boarding facility here in Chittenden County is getting ready to close and tell all the police departments that they're no longer taking dogs. Fortunately, we're not affected by that because we're with the Humane Society. We're the only police department at this point that's allowed to go with the Humane Society. So, um, mm -hmm. other than that, I don't really have too much else. If somebody has so any one, questions, one more yeah. um, okay. personal item. We just made a change uh, late last week, Jeff. I'm not sure if we were able to relay this to you yet. Uh, this affects all of our personnel and yours too. There's a 0.44% um, child care tax that we yeah. introduced. Yeah. Through, so. Um, that may not be reflected in what you have there. I think it's a grand total of $35,000 the entire town. So probably minimal increase, but a small increase to the police budget uh, assessment as well. Is the town paying the full cost or are you paying the town's portion and employees are responsible for the employee portion? Because it's 0.33 and 0.11 okay. to make up the 0.44. Okay, I'm going to have to check with okay. HR and finance. Yeah. There's some places that are opting to cover the entire amount, okay. um, the employee share as well. So I just wasn't sure what you guys were doing. We've got it, like, we're paying the city's share and the employees are paying their share. Okay, I'll check with that. Okay. Can I just ask a process question? Do you all have a line item for the police? Because I don't have one in my budget. It's an open. Well, I we have this, yeah, we have this like four. I have a short one, yeah. but we don't have a cheap budget. No. Yeah, I mean, I got it online. Right. Right. Yeah, but we online. Don't have it included. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's about twelve pages. Look, fifteen pages. Looks like in the pounds. Yeah. Um, It'd be nice to have that. Um, yeah. Okay. Can um, how is the community advisory board going? Uh, it's going okay. I would say I would say it's been interesting the last three months because we're kind of like in the forming process. Mm -hmm. um, our first meeting was just simply getting people acclimated, uh, and then the second meeting was picking officers. And now we're actually at the point where we're going to try to at least this coming meeting uh, try to get a work a, like a work plan. What what would like to be done? What what we would like to do? Um, I think it's important that we do that, and we've had, I know we had some change over now that, that we need um, the city to fill. Um, we've had one of the appointees who hasn't, come, hasn't participated, um, so we're going to be looking at having y'all appoint another person for us. Hmm. Um, and Regina here. will get to that, she's aware of it, but she'll yeah. get to it. So. Okay. And just, uh, yeah. um, I'm really glad to see that you put a line item in for CJC for increases. Mm -hmm. What is the status of the state funding for CJC? So right now there are no changes as to what they have been doing. My understanding is that they're going to continue funding it the way that it is. I will I will caution that in that there is some discussion around the state about forming regional CJCs. If that was to happen here, the talk would be that it would be an RFP that would be put out to any of the local CJCs to take over the whole county on a countywide basis. Um, and that that funding would go to that CJC only. So we would start relying on 
I'm just going to, I'm not going to make a prediction, but I would say that Burlington CJC might step up and say, we're going to do this for, for everyone. But isn't the Essex CJC doing a lot of services for lots of towns outside of Burlington? Yeah, currently they, you know, they serve, uh, what, five different towns. Yeah. And um, Burlington, we've also decoded the work for um, the for news team. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that could be brought under one. I know, like I said, that's been talked about for the last, well, since I've been here, so probably the last five years. Um, and so far, DOC hasn't made any decisions on that. But I know that I know that there are also some in the in DOC who feel that they shouldn't be doing pretrial um, referrals for individual towns. That they shouldn't be paying for that. They should only be paying for um, COSA work and that type of thing. So that's also a discussion that's going on that that funding could get cut at some point. Hopefully not, because I think it's a really important thing that we're doing. Um, and I know that that's a big benefit to, to our community, so I yeah. hope that it's not. So are, they're still receiving this like $200,000 a year is the amount yeah, that they get from uh, the state every uh, year? Yeah, it's uh, it's over, it's almost $300,000 okay. that they're receiving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we'll take this opportunity to, now that you're here. Yeah. It's not so much budget related, but I guess it, it could eventually be. But everything that's been going on for the past six to 12 months, it feels like... Um, we're getting to a, a slightly chaotic point uh, every night in both of our communities. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested in, in your view, um, since we have you here. Um, what challenges are you facing with this? What have you all discussed for potential solutions? What would you like people to know? And is there a budget impact that you see? You know, I, I, I don't think, and I've said this before, it's completely a law enforcement issue, no. but um, certainly is in your, in your purview. So, yeah. Yeah, I, what I would tell you is most of the thefts, and I assume that's what you're talking right. about, the overnight crimes thefts, that you've been having, package, and break in the vehicles, yeah. that type of thing. Um, most of that, from, from at least talking to other chiefs and other, other folks that are in the intel business around here, most of that has been caused by juveniles. Mm -hmm. And when I say juveniles, I mean under 16 years old. Um, there are two separate groups of juveniles that have been working essentially as groups. They're like, this is my group, this is my group over here. And they've been working in concert to go out and do these thefts of vehicles, breaking into vehicles, uh, you know, transferring whatever they can find to money. And somehow we've seen, even seen some of it, you know, the firearms being transported down to, down to Springfield Mass, being traded for different things down there. Um, this is a larger problem not than just us. It's all over Chittenden County, and even and as we saw down in down in um, Madison County as well. Um, there's some connections down there, so we're seeing a lot of that being related to one or two people, uh, or I shouldn't say one or two people, one or two groups, which are probably a total of about 20 people total here in Chittenden. Um, our our thought process on um, how we're dealing with that is that when we make charges on these juveniles, which we have made charges on them, they need to be pursued. Some of the folks that we've been dealing with are not your normal juvenile crime people. They are folks that are more advanced in their crimes. Uh, they are uh, tendencies of violence and that type of thing. And unfortunately, here in Vermont, we don't have a secure facility for them. So that's some of the challenges that we've had over the last couple of years is that we keep dealing with the same people over and over and over again. Um, there has to be some type of solution. The chiefs have made that have made that known at the legislative level. Um, and I'm really hoping that this legislative session, something gets done with that. Um, as far as locally, I mean, we have stepped up our patrols at night. Um, we've had our detectives out at night driving around in unmarked vehicles uh, to try to catch some of the folks in the act of doing it. Um, I would just tell people, please lock your cars. Don't give them the chance to like just enter it and make it a little bit more difficult because what we're seeing is people just come along and they're just checking door handles. And the ones that they can get into, they get into and they take whatever they can. Well, that's kind of what I'm, one of my curiosities. I mean, now, according to um, the community social media page, someone had a firearm stolen out of it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is getting to the point now where um, some dumb decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing most of this as, as an opportunity? People are not taking the precautions. That obviously, they're, they're probably actually breaking into some yes. But um, 
So your big advice would be to yeah. lock, lock, your car. lock your vehicles, lock your house. You know, you know, you nine, your house. At 9 p.m. Everyone should make sure everything is locked before they go to bed. Um, yeah, a lot of it is has been crimes of opportunity. And it's just people walking through neighborhoods at night. And if they find vehicles open, they're going to go in those. Yes, we have had some vehicles that have been actually forcibly broken into. Um, but those have been really, really the far and in between. Um, it's most of it's just the vehicles unlocked and they're and they're getting into it. Um, the the Kia challenge that was going on this summer, if you're familiar with that, I mean that was real um, and it still is. I mean Kias have a fault in them where a vehicle can be opened and stolen relatively easily. And I believe we recovered at least one here at the fair this year. Uh, we recovered four stolen vehicles before I worked in the fair this year, including one the very first hour we were there on that Friday night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of those were occupied by, if they were occupied, there was one that wasn't, but three of them were occupied. They were occupied by juveniles under 16 years old. And because of the rules that the legislature has made and the Vermont Supreme Court has made and our state attorney has made, um, we weren't able to charge a lot of those juveniles with actually being in the car. So, and the idea is you take a car and you completely destroy it while you have it, and then you just dump it somewhere. And that's what we've been seeing all over Chittenden County. Um, please lock your vehicles. So, um, on that on that particular note, because I, I would like to, in having conversations, having a ride along, and having conversations with others about this, um, I really get the sense that what's part of this process, and I just want to make sure that it, it's clear, if it's not, if it's not really understood, um, that. I get the sense that there's a real disconnect again between your investigations, passing those along to the state attorney's office, and then there's it sounds like a couple of different problems. First off, without some place to house a juvenile who's got correct problems going, those cases are either not then being looked at or they're being put aside. Either way. That process is being seems to be being held up at the state's state attorney's office. Is that is that correct? I, I wouldn't blame it all on the state's attorney's office. I would say that it's it's a combination of the the policy of the state's attorney's office and the uh, the court, the judges that here in Vermont, the decisions that they have made, including the Vermont Supreme Court, and then in our legislature. So I would say it's a combination of there. We send cases to the, to the state's attorney. They face some really hard challenges as far as what to do with juveniles once they have them in the system. Department of Children and Families is stressed just like everybody else is. Probably they're very stressed. They have they only have certain resources as well. Um, but once they have that child in, in their custody, then they have to be able to find a place to put that put that child or what what do they do with them? And we get parents all the time that are at their wits' end of like I don't know what else to do. Um, and I don't know where to put them. So I wouldn't blame it on one entity. It's a combination of it's a combination of all. The other thing I want I want to bring up, and I want to say thank you because you and I had an email exchange over a couple of issues, and uh, I, I do want to say, uh, as a previous firearm instructor, thank you for the level of detail you gave me, um, because I brought up the question in regards to. The type of ammunition that's currently being used in the market, you know, in, mm -hmm. out there, um, you know, we heard about specifically the red tipped bullets that were used in the um, the unfortunate shooting of three Palestinian Americans. Um, and, you know, again, the thing that I just want to I just want to say thank you. This is not really a question. I just want to say thank you because it really helped me understand a little bit better about how you and the department are prepared in order to handle these particular situations. Thank God this situation. I wish it didn't happen at all, but I, you know, at least it didn't happen in Essex Junction. Um, but you, it sounds like you and the department are prepared yeah. for these situations. And but it sounds like the marketplace is changing with the type of firearms and with the type of ammo that people are wanting to get into. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, nine millimeter until continues to be the most popular round in the world. And there's a reason for that. There's more firearms that are nine millimeter than any other gun. Um, so it's it's the most common because and also because it's cheaper than a lot of different types of ammunition. So we see a lot of that. The, the, the ammunition that was used in Burlington was 380 
as I, I, when I explained to you, that's a smaller, that's a smaller round um, than a nine millimeter, and it doesn't have quite as much stopping power as a nine millimeter would. But I mean, we we see rifle rounds and those types of things on the street all the time. There's a lot of rifles in Vermont. There's a lot of rifles in you know in the U.S. So uh, just another threat that, that we have to worry about. Good job. Um, I see that in the operating budget for the police department that the payment to the CJC um, is this transfer between funds for non-capital. Where is the revenue for that state grant? Uh, it's in a separate part of the budget there. <laughs> I believe it's called the CJC um, budget. I didn't see it. Yeah, Nor do I see the CJC budget broadly. The CJC should be a separate part of our budget that's included in underneath that. Let me see. I know I just looked at it. I'm not sure if you have this page, but uh, I'm looking. I'm looking at our at our the yeah. police department budget, um, and it's the community justice center is included underneath our our incomes and revenues coming in there. Is that page sixty six? Uh, I I don't know if that's on there or not. Like I'm pulling this from from our internal system. Okay, I can show it to you in hand if you like to. I, I just I guess part of my question is really making sure that the revenue for the CJC that's coming through is also kind of offsetting what we then pay through our contracts. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so it's down here actually in there. Okay. And I think we can probably find it in yeah, we can get it pages if we want to. Yeah, that, that. that'd be appreciated. And so I assume then that, that is part of the the calculation into our contract and that that's being offset. Yeah. How's the um I remember a few years ago how there was a conversation about the communities who do also participate are not paying paying their fair share. Mm -hmm. Is that conversation still ongoing and still inequitable for us as Essex residents and that town and city were paying more for the same service than what the other towns are? Uh, we Jill always asks um, primarily uh, Colchester and Milton to pay. Um, Colchester has told us they're going to fully fund the request this year. Um, mm -hmm. Milton, we don't expect to again. We've had conversations with the state about it. They basically tell us we have to keep providing that service. This is the yeah. CJC we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we send a bill to Milton every single year mm -hmm. just for this purpose because we want to make sure that we're following up on this every year. So Jill sent them a bill again, um, asking them for contributions. I believe that was about October a couple months ago. Yeah. A couple months ago, and we've got no response from them. How much Which, are you talking about? Yeah. I'm sorry. How much is that? Roughly seventeen thousand. Yeah, about sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars. Yeah. But they can pay their town manager one hundred seventy thousand without a problem. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and and like Brian said, I mean the the response that the response that we've gotten from from DLC is that uh, we consider the amount of funds that we give you to be what we give you, and it covers their 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 costs as well. And if they don't choose to put in anything, then so be it. And I, I sent this next part to to Regina earlier. One of my struggles, I don't I don't see or I don't understand why. Um, uh, the GIS coordinator, I see that 10% of their salary is now being paid for through the police department. Uh, assess assessing. Yeah. I don't understand why that's considered a direct and not an indirect cost as a part of our 3.5%. It's an assessing, so not police. It's an assessing, okay. So what's next? Which didn't, which didn't gotcha. have that 3.5% for just for the police. Gotcha. Are we ready to transition? Sure, I'm, we probably ought to. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did that. Uh, a lot more to talk to you about. Thank you. Nice to yeah. be down here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry, we went over. Welcome, Hi, welcome back. Hello. 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 You and Marcus here, basically. Yep. All the guys are here. I was here. It was good. It was good. All right.
Okay. So in your budget packet on PDF page 27 is where you see the assessing line. Again, same thing. And note to uh, both Jess and I to make sure we pull in the full um, budgets from the town into your packet so you've got them. Um, is uh, the assessing do budget? What I did here? Yes. Okay. Because I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, FY24, we budgeted all of these uh, exchanges between town and city as transfers between town and city, as we had done previously when we were combined. Um, so you'll see that the transfer between town and city line is now zeroed out, and I've moved that up to the professional services line, so it more accurate, accurately reflects the relationship between town and city. Um, the other thing that we have added into the city's budget for assessing that the town does not cover is $500 for our online property record cards. Okay. It's a subscri annual subscription that we pay. Okay. Uh, I can speak to that piece about Shannon real quickly and then uh, if it came up, then I'll turn it over to Karen for, for the rest of the budget. So basically, um, Shannon's our GIS coordinator. She falls under the IT department um, and budget review this year for the town. We realized that Shannon spends 10% of her time on assessing. Um, we wanted to capture that. I think it comes out to uh, so we put 10% um, of Shannon's salary benefits into the assessing line between the town city breakdown. That comes out to about 4.3%, I think, or 4 or 5% of her salary um, that'll be paid by the, the city. Hopefully that makes sense, but I can try to answer questions about it if there are any. I, I hear you on it. I, given how we do or how we have these arrangements through agreements, I just think this needs to be part of a broader conversation between this entity um, and not just a here's a cost that we're going to now ask you to pay for. That, that's all. And I, I would say it's something that we missed in the past and should have been probably yeah. paid for last year, but well, obviously if you want to discuss it more, we'll bring it with me. I'll, I'll say from my end that serve that component of the assessing world is is a logical cost to mm -hmm. me in the sense that uh, we have parcel maps that need to be updated um, and having an in-house person do that work is uh, really beneficial as opposed to us figuring out on the city side mm -hmm. how we're getting our parcel maps updated mm -hmm. um, and it does seem a, a clear connection to the assessing side of things. Yeah, I wasn't intending for us to have the conversation now. I'm, yeah. I'm saying that I think that this, our board, should have that kind of a conversation at some point in time, relatively soon, given we're having the conversation now um, in a more informed way than just Andrew bringing this up in a meeting. I would agree. And I think it makes sense. Um, I'm not crazy about not having the conversation prior. And so, yeah, I might just agree with Andrew. Um, but Thanks for that uh, update. Um, how's it going in assessing? It's going well. Your appraisal's going. Um, we've been to about 450 plus properties. They started out in the rural areas and they want to come back in because of the weather. Mm -hmm. uh, getting in probably to half of the properties, have a handful of people that aren't happy. Um, but, you know, just explaining the process to them. So it's 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 going. It's going and um the cave collectors are out there every day and they let the police department know where they are. And I think we've only had a couple calls from the city, the, the uh, property owners of the city that saw the sample letter and then said, Oh, I want to make it well, we don't make appointments yet until you just actually receive the letter. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to put that example out there, a sample out there. Mm -hmm. So um it's moving along. It's moving along. Mm -hmm. Remind me when, when we think this will be done. June 2025. Okay. Because we have a statutory uh, over 5,000 parcels, um, or 5,000, excuse me, um, population who have to submit your grand list by June 24th to get here. So, FY20, will FY26 be impacted by this? Mm -hmm. That's enough turnaround. So, so how will we make that if it's, you said by June 2025, mm -hmm. I'm now curious if we'll have enough information 
this time next year to predict and build the budget, but I guess that'll all work out. Yeah. It's, it has in the past, I imagine. So <laughs> but you said your tax credit, so I yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it, yeah, so essentially we'll be still building our budget saying this is the amount we need to raise right. in property yeah. taxes. The tax rate calculation right. comes later anyway, so it, that will be affected. Who knows how? Um, but I'm just trying to think through, shouldn't have done it out loud. <laughs> no, if you have right. a question, others do too. It's confusing. <laughs> it's a confusing I've, only, I've been through this once in most years and years and years ago. And for me, it was fairly neutral, but yeah. as we've seen in other places, it's it's a stressor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the state's involved with the equalization study and mm -hmm. all yeah. of that. So we need to see a lanes and then we have to readjust. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it is a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have any other questions. Um, I think this is fairly straightforward. Um, but if you don't foresee any other challenges, I mean, I guess on the on the on the on these changes that have been made both in the gasoline and, and with this for the GIS, do you anticipate finding more of these? These are the ones we found this at this point. Um, at this point, I say no, but we're we're still trying to double check and work our way through. Okay. At, right. the, at the conclusion of this assessment process, the next one is. It's a trigger. It's not like a required every five years. We have to wait for the CLA to hit a certain month. No, not the CLA. They changed, they changed the legislature now. It's not the CLA they're basing it on. They're basing it on the COD, which is the coefficient of dispersion. Oh, the equity right. among all property. Okay. So okay. if you are 20 and above, that's the trigger. That's the trigger. That's yeah. they're gonna they're, they have to keep the CLA because that's how they adjust the tax rate, the education tax rate. Yeah. On the state of Vermont's tax does to equalize everybody to 100%. Do you think that changing to the COD will cause a more frequent need for I don't assessments? know. I mean, for our grand list, it, it seems pretty um, in line. Everybody said there's nothing that's outstanding, like commercial is way out here yeah. or condominiums are way out here. Yeah. They're pretty. That's what you do. You watch that to see if there's something off. Okay. And I know way back in the past before my time, the condominiums were kind of off because of the sales and the listed price. So they could actually go and redo all the condominiums okay. as a statistical. But mm -hmm. that, that all goes through the state and approval and all that. I'm grateful that you are an expert in that, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so that we don't have to do that. <laughs> but they are going also through new legislature where they are trying to pass every six years for reappraisals now. Oh, interesting. Okay. So people don't have it clear. So if it's six years, do we have to start something within the four to be able to get the vendor to finish mm -hmm. it by six? Nobody has the answers. That's not expensive. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that just leads to my next question. I know I'm pushing us into it, but in terms of our agreement with the town of Essex and Karen is doing our uh, assessing as well because we had banked that cost and that's all taken care of but will we be having a conversation in the relative near future about what is the process for us for our next assessment do we have to bring them in, back in house what is the what's that going to be like mm -hmm. yeah. any other questions for Karen Jim and Jess, anything else? No. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. Good to see you both. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Good holiday. Thank you too. Are you fat biking, Greg, this morning? Uh, I'm going to get my gears fixed in my way. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> I have either high or low. That's good. Single speed will do it. <laughs> we. Take the break. Yes. yes. Yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> not fun. Do we have? Do we have?
there's any other budget that you wanted to mention? Um, I'm just looking at it. Uh, our locker system is now finally all together. We have enough to serve what we need, but we are, uh, we haven't, so the plan was to open up our vestibule more. Um, and our assistant director, Hannah, who's not here right now, just came back from maternity leave and she is, the, she's our software tech troubleshooter person and the, the doors are, um, they're not the best in the I should say, at the very least. <laughs> so we want, and also just sort of a team effort of what would be the best. So our first step is going to open up the test bill earlier in the morning because uh, we've had more problems around the building at night. So we don't want to jump into opening up the test bill until we know that things are more calm <laughs> outside. So we have the lockers. Yes. And we're looking at the foreseeable future for a majority of that to be servicing clients in times the library is already open. Yes, it helps take off some <coughs> pinch from the front desk because people don't have to wait in line to get their books from behind the desk. Um, and then we also will be opening up so people like we've had them open when we've had staff training so people can get still pick up their holds. Um, but we haven't had them open yet when staff are not in the building. So we want to sort of tread carefully as we do that. Our initial plan was to just do 24 7. And now we're like, maybe we do it just later night, earlier morning, just to figure out where the balance is um, and keeping um, that safety band that was Yeah, no, that's a good thought. I mean, so I guess I'm wondering, you know, between the, the time at the front desk waiting in line to free up the front desk people versus picking. Mm -hmm. The book and prepping it and notification and that back end work is that a wash or is there time savings there between there's a lot of time savings there because we are um we just do we regardless we do the holds pulling um and this is we just be able now we can just print slips and then the our system talks to the lockers so then whoever it's it does it requires far less time at the desk it makes things much more efficient for both than they like Patron side and the staff side, and people really love the freedom to go in. <laughs> oh, yeah, we also have illness. Like, people come walk, like, we wouldn't allow somebody to come in there with their dog at the library, but like, people walking their dogs can now just pop into the vestibule and get their stuff, or if they're sick, we don't really want to have the close interaction. So, there have been some great safety things and also flexibility for the people who are using the old. Okay. And I have a number of questions. Um, some are kind of general, but I'm wondering, you guys have a bunch of statistics that we see in those reports that come out like monthly or quarterly or wherever we get them. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't recall ever seeing any statistics on the amount of folks who are coming into the library and maybe specific times, like do you have 10 people that are coming into the library at 8 a.m.? There's five people generally on, you know, at 5 p.m. or whatever. And I'm wondering if you keep those kinds of statistics. We do. Um, we have like a, a lot of stats that we report to the state. So um, we're at this point kind of back to pre-pandemic levels of visitors, um, not maybe completely just uh, initially. I think we're maybe in like 2018, we were like over 100,000 visits um, a year. So um, that's still slowly coming back. But we're also now with the homes, people are coming in. So we don't capture that data. <laughs> Um, but we are able to like if, um, this software that we use for our door counter, like we can tell them like if like for train hop, generally we've been the the source of how many people have attended because we capture that information. We can say like how many people were here okay. um, for like a span of hours. Is that information that you already give to the trustees anyways, yes. or is that something that you could give to us as well? Yeah, we could. Uh, yeah, we might have to. Yeah, I have to just talk to the person who can compiles that. Information. Yeah, I just don't want you to create new data. If it's something that's already created and yeah. distributed, just basically hit the button to send it to us as well. But I definitely don't want you to do extra work. Um, I'm curious, this is just a general question, if we've had any internal discussions about the leasing versus the purchase of the copiers, because I know it's come up on a couple of different line items besides Brunel um, yeah. and where that discussion went. 
So we have um, our copier lease citywide is coming up in December. Uh, so we've been looking at the uh, copier leasing and we um, asked the full, uh, the complete lease package to have an option of the public copier at the library. The public copier at the library is a kind of a different yeah. animal. Um, and uh, so we've looked at it optionally that way. And these folks are looking at it individually and we'll be able to figure out what, what the right way to go is. But it's I think it's very likely that the public copier machine will be separate mm -hmm. um, than the full uh, package of, of copiers. But we have looked at it financially both both ways to try to figure out what's the what's the right way to go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to own a copier prior to the last round of leasing that happened. So it was removed. And I think at that time, the public copier was, it was a free service through Kelly office that no longer exists. And we I can't find another option <laughs> like yeah. that, but unfortunately. And then they took, um, the town took our other one as like an exchange pay. I, I somehow make the balance. Uh, uh, yeah. As, so even with the own copier, we're still paying for support for it. Um, so the leasing is a little bit more expensive um, from my experience, but it, it's also, we have an aging copier that's also gonna be expensive enough to look at um, every five years or so. Okay. Um, and then I probably should know the answer to this, but I'm wondering why there's a separate line item for the employee volunteer recognition when we already have one in the admin. And if there is a necessity to keep those separate for the reason I probably should know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones. So yeah, I can tell you, at least from our own history with this, our, um, we used to have a volunteer recognition party and it was completely funded by donations oh. back to the foundation. And we wanted to have it as part of like the volunteers have really added a lot of they saved a municipality a ton of money, and we wanted some of that um, expense reflected in the budget. And then that changed with, I think, just categories to become more of an employee and volunteer um, line item. But I, now it's solely coming out of it's not donation; it's revenue. It's coming out of the budget, like it's, it's yeah, because our donations dried up through COVID. We haven't okay. really had any, um, but that I mean. People donate to the foundation, but this was more just like we have an appreciation jar and we put that money into yeah. having a party for them annually. I I don't I think uh, you know doing volunteer and employee recognition is a great thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just questioning why we have to have a separate line item when we as well do it for for all the entire city and yeah. it should be done for everybody. Um, so, and there hasn't been, I don't believe there's been any money spent on it this year, but um, I'll let you guys kind of noodle that one, but I'm just, that's just one of those things that I was kind of curious as to why we had we to look at it. We of funding, I, we shifted it to a New Year's card to our volunteers. We usually do some sort of volunteer recognition mm -hmm. now during like volunteer month in April. Um, so we've had, I think, a longer tradition of any sort of recognition and um, and we do, I think, bring in, like, I don't know if it even covers it completely. I don't think, like, I can't remember, like, the different things that we've done to recognize our volunteers, because we tend to have a, a larger pool than every other department. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it did have the best big party. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, we usually have, like, a small yeah. gift that we give them, like, last year, just, like, a sample of the paper, so. <laughs> <laughs> Employee volunteer recognition mm -hmm. because primarily it's not exclusively volunteer that it's spent on. Yeah, yeah, that the employee part yeah. is added. The line is a little deceiving for Grenell because the chart of accounts it's employee volunteer recognition no matter what department it's in, but yeah. they're covering the volunteers. volunteers. Yeah, and ours doesn't. The, the admin doesn't cover volunteers. It's strictly employees. Employee. So it's like the opposite. Right. Okay. <laughs> Uncle. Cool. I have a couple questions completely unrelated. <laughs> so um I used to be the chair of the foundation. Mm -hmm. And then that way back. 
<laughs> and <laughs> at the time there was a friends of the brown owl mm -hmm. and my understanding is they have merged and that's you just have the foundation yes is that correct mm -hmm. okay and the foundation is primarily their responsibility is to raise funds um, through the book sale um and to steward for lack of a better word an endowment that helps support the library for large purchases like capital things that are not in the budget and that kind of thing my question is can there be a I don't know what, what what is the condition of the foundation right now in terms of its ability to support the library for things that can't be in the budget um the foundation has been struggling <laughs> um, the friends used to just do the book sale and then the foundation had separate um they, uh, they there were some fundraising efforts but for the most part since the, the foundation was created i think when we the renovation happened around 2000 um to yes. help collect money for donations for that um and since the merger the friends have sort of taken over the board of the foundation mm -hmm. so their income is mostly the book sale and that goes towards like for adult they, we, they sell they they give us a certain amount of money to cover bestsellers so we can get those right into the collection and put some <laughs> the time if they focus on additional programming um it's been really hard to get volunteers it's been a little disorganized um so people who have wanted to volunteer tend to not stick around yeah. um and so we're trying to figure out a way forward with that that's a little bit more organized in general but it is not a great fundraising um arm of <laughs> anything right now right okay. um yeah because yeah. it's just it things have changed we don't have people like I think there used to be much more of a pool of people like stay-at-home moms that were eager to be out just be out of the house and yeah. do something and now people like we have a lot more working people so um having the volunteers we've had situations where volunteers are just like it just doesn't work for me because it doesn't seem like there's a great direction but it's also not our group to be running so well that was my next question yeah. so is <laughs> there there, the interface of the foundation is strictly with you as the director, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then we all like we've kind of backed away from book donations because that was uh, work. It was a lot of extra work for our staff, and the donations we weren't getting were something we really were looking. They weren't quality for the collection, so they were more just book sale bound. Um, okay. So. And then your board of trustees is your policy board. Yes. They are not a fundraising board. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to <laughs> get caught up to speed on that. Yeah. My second completely unrelated question mm -hmm. is, can you be a little bit more, can you describe for us what the situation is that staff are experiencing with what you alluded to as the needs of the people coming in the door? What are the kinds of things you're doing with, doing with them? What are they needing? And how, <clears throat> how has it impacted your staff's ability to get their work done? Um, they're kind of looking, some people are looking for social service direction. Some people just don't even know what they're looking for. Like we just have a lot of people that show up um, and just in, in under duress of some sort, like not violent duress, just sort of like, I, I, I they, they say I have to do something on a computer. Like, and so, uh, okay. Um, okay. so those are that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> And they do, it just requires more oversight of who's in the library because we've had a lot more, um, I wouldn't say altercations, but well, yeah, we've had yeah. altercations. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and so it's just a different crowd. Like we have our regular telecommuters and they are benign. They hang out in the corners and they're really quiet. And then there's four. Um, we have people like who are unhoused that are just using the library and sometimes they kind of irritate each other <laughs> um, and we are you might have more the the front desk is just a different feel right now and we want to make sure that the people who are there just to get their books aren't going to be caught up in us trying to figure out how to help them what resources they might need um where the food shelves are or where they might be able to get clothes um and some yeah. of the situations require monitoring over a period of several hours yeah. um so um you know you might notice that somebody is 
having a bit of difficulty, but has it to the line of where they need to be talked to yet? Okay, now it's the line they need to be talked to, but it's not, we haven't gone to the line yet, we need to ask them to leave. And so um, it's hard to tell sometimes whether a person is going to settle down or whether they're going to end up, say, punching somebody else in the computer room, which has happened. Um, and or there might be, you know, we're all aware of approximately how long people are in the bathroom. You know, oh dear, this person's been in the bathroom for about 20 minutes. Is it time to make sure that they're still alive? Um, so there's that kind of thing. A lot of people come in, they need something, they don't know where to get that help, and we're the first ones we ask. I mean, we're the first ones they ask. Um, and sometimes we're able to help them directly, and sometimes it's a matter of pointing them to the right resources. Yeah, we've had people looking for legal resources. Um, it's really been remarkable how much people will go, like if they're new, if they're just passing through, they're gonna go to the public library to get help and get some sort of orientation to what services they can access. Um, so we really are like ultimately really trying to make it welcoming for everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status and their permanent residence. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> make sure that they a lot of things to understand the behavior guidelines that we set. Um, and so we work to just educate and then enforce. <laughs> and then if you don't, um, if they can't comply to that, like, okay, if you can't do this, you're going to have to leave, or like, you just really uh, broke a law. <laughs> well, right. So it's different levels. Um, and this is over the course of the entire day. It's not during certain periods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, we never know when people are going to show up. It could be like right before we close. It could be first thing in the morning. Um, there, there's been really kind of alarming but I mean, they've been fine. But like when you have people coming in, like there was in May, we had this um, first Wednesday last year that the people, they, they, they left all of their stuff in the vestibule. And I was like, why is there clothing here? That's not the place to have like, they're like, oh, it's covered in cement. And like, and they had blood on them and they needed a, a phone. And, um, and it was all fine. Like they didn't cause a problem. I did, they did tie up the phone lines, which is like a whole nother thing. I'd love to figure out a way to have like a free public phone because that's a huge need for a lot of the people um, because they don't have, I think if we can call out the outreach people that could potentially um, provide a phone, but that's not an immediate answer to somebody in crisis. Okay. So um, yeah, some libraries in other states have like free cable phones and little kind of almost phone booths in their libraries or I mean, we have nowhere we have no full time pay phones to speak of in this community so um, I talked to Burlington Telecom about it and they're like oh yeah that, that's something to think about but they don't have the means right now to do anything about it thank you <clears throat> um so I have some of the same things but I have some other things as well but let me start with what you just spoke about so that we're clear because I will first say that as I think about an ideal hub and spoke kind of model to help those who are in need or in distress, I don't think the library should be the central point of that particular model. Um, totally understand why they would seek that refuge and, and, and such, but I wonder if there's a better way to direct them to an appropriate person with that could then really help get them to the services they need and assist them to get the whatever is going on. Um, and I don't know if that's an interaction with the Howard Center or someone else, but yeah, we um, call on them regularly. Um, there is Howard Center and there's also the CBOEO CORA program. Um, and I think when we have regulars, our experience has been that we we've had people that don't want help from outreach, like won't give them name or anything. But when they're coming into the library regularly, um, we they create there's more trust being built. So like we've been able to connect with these people more um, if they do come in regularly. If it's just a one shot thing, um, yeah, we do. We I mean outreach is definitely a resource. But there's also with a lot of these people who are in 
and in these really bad situations, the systems have failed them already. <laughs> so there's apprehension. Um, there was effort this summer to you no know, trespass somebody that wasn't causing us any problems at the library. He didn't want to speak to the outreach people. He did accept a tent. Um, and he just, he was traumatized. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> yeah, it was awful to see how the community treated him. Um, and my staff got really upset because we were just like, he's allowed to be here and you shouldn't be asking questions just because he looks different, like getting more kindly than that. But it was, um, it's, there, we don't have the system, like our state is really suffering on how to handle this. So when you look at Burlington, like they're having people shooting up at the Fletcher Free Library. They don't have, like even with all of the services there, they're becoming a safe injection site. Like it is really like the way that social, our social network is just kind of really failing a lot of people right now. So our primary, um, initiative is just to make people feel welcome and maybe that like that's a step like the person who was so not warmly welcome by this community ended up getting a speed under him and taking the train form to Connecticut like after two weeks and that was the major <clears> success <throat> and I wouldn't say that would happen all the time but that he was able to just have a like I think the thing with the homeless people is that libraries provide sort of uh, provide a sense of like a calming place where they can just like be like we're creating a safe environment we're not going to tolerate them being harassed um and and that can help with their next steps um so yeah i wish we had more and like outreach they are available it's not all the time their primary um focus is working with the police so if we call them they'll be like yeah we could come but we might it might be a couple of hours or um, or days like for the core <clears throat> program or yeah. um, so yeah. I don't I don't deny any of those things. I just obviously yeah, I think library, it's a, it's just a, needs a, to be yeah, needs it's to be something fixed. for libraries everywhere, like any urban communities dealing with it. And I do have ideas of how to make it better. Yeah. How many, in, how many <laughs> incidents are we talking about though? Because I I also get uh, uh, what I've heard seems like while these incidents are occurring, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like it's happening often. So I just want clarity around how often this happens because of the fact that I, what I'm hearing is the fact that the library is struggling to meet this demand. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it also doesn't sound like it's happening all the time. So I, I just- Yeah, it's not all the time to the point of us needing to call the police or outreach, but it is, I would say daily work helping serve people that really are in dire need of some sort of help that is beyond I mean, just accessing resources. That's what libraries do, but it's not our, like our people coming to get the latest James Patterson read. Yeah. <laughs> um, for one thing I do want to say too, and, and Regina, I'll just make this general statement because again, as I look at how you define success in your metrics, and I saw this on multiple, so this is not just this one, but to me, it's not really answered here um, as to what those specific metrics are. The overall theme and strategy, I think is fine, but what I would really like to see is some very specific metrics that then say you've succeeded in achieving this. Um, so I'm not sure what that would exactly be, what tools could be used to make that happen, but it's something I would like to see more throughout all the uh, discussions today. Um, to go back to something that Amber brought up, I do want to have a little bit more clarity around um, when people are using library because of the fact that what I see, you know, just as an observer of the library, if I try to figure out when, I don't know when the library is open. I know how to get that information, but those library hours are not consistent because of the fact that I know that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, is different. And I'm not sure that it needs to be. And so I wonder if our hours at the library are fulfilling the, the community needs. So I have that question on, around it. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, ask specifically was um, in this particular entryway change, 
again, I want to understand how the need for this particular change is this really going to provide more access and opportunity or is there a physical need to the facility that is being repaired with this with this changeover yes and that's um okay the, one of the biggest problems we've had and it hasn't changed is the winter storms that create either a lot of melt coming off of our building or just rain and it runs off the building and then freezes right in front of our current main door um which has been an issue um that we're the when we're redoing a roof that's what we're trying to um and that was one of the things i was like can, is there a way we can do this because this is like staff are going out every hour to put salt down and then it just gets washed away by the water running off the building um and the second component that harlan brought into it is that we it's not an ada compliant door at this point, um, and if we could redesign that area to be ADA compliant, right now our only ADA compliant door is the back door, which is only accessible if somebody's dropped off in a car. So anybody coming from the bus stop, it's not, um, where they're basically taking their life in their hands because that incline is really too steep. Last two things I, I just want to ask about is, again, I do want to go back to the copier question, because for me, it seems like, again, depending on use, and I'm not, necessarily clear on the amount of use, but um, I can understand using, using a service for a copier that might be in the public use because of the ways it might be used. So therefore, it would be easier for maintenance to have an outside company dealing with that. But internally, I wonder if I couldn't just, if we couldn't just buy a $100 printer from Staples. That would fulfill the, the needs internally. I could be completely internally wrong. Internally for the library? Yeah. We do massive amounts of paper, everything for okay. scheduling, brochures. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, we need a real copy. Okay, understood. Um, the other thing I'll add in there is understanding the cell phone stipend for, for librarians. I'm not sure what the specific need is here for um, paying for a stipend for for librarians we are um people are not at the library all the time and then we do have people who are supervising so people who are supervisors have cell phones because it is the greatest when we we don't get a response if, if we are going to try to um schedule like if somebody's calling in sick which is happening more frequently um, any any changes in staffing, the faster that we can respond to it to try to fill the shift. Um, it, 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 if we're waiting until that morning, it is not uh, very unlikely. And we may need, we, we need to have at least three people in the building for safety, preferably four. So when there is an issue, we're not dealing with our desk, two desks being run by one person who often is a sub while the staff is. Um, trying to manage a situation. So what's the policy ask on staff then for for having this this cell phone? To be able to are they, uh, are they available 24-7? Are they available during work hours? What is um they are mostly available 24-7. Um, yeah, in response to your hour question, there is state statutes of having to be open after a certain hour and certain night, like just to maintain our standards. Um, and we did re reorient the hours looking at the, um, our, we used to close at five o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays and we opened until nine o'clock. And when we were looking at the door data, there really wasn't a need to keep our library open for like a couple of people between eight and nine for the nights a week. Um, so we did shift those hours to, and it has been serving people who work better, um, but there are people who are, we kick out at eight o'clock. Um, so I think we're doing better serving the community, being open till 6.30, those two other nights for people who are, who are working. Okay, thank you. Wendy, isn't it also the case that the Essex Free is open Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday evenings, and the Brownell is Tuesday, Thursday? Yes, and that was, yeah, that was historically how those hours were set up, but we were open till nine and they were open till eight. Andrew, Andrew. So this this um, will probably be the slightly tougher part. Um, so the overall budget, 
you mentioned visitation is now approaching pre pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. So 2019, FY 2019, 2020, at this point. Um, in the past, since 18, the budgets seem to have gone up somewhere around 3% every year. 23 was almost 12, 24 was 10.6, and this one is 8.7, 8.66. What's the difference? What, what are we seeing? Because the next budget, if it comes in on the average of the last three years increase, will approach 1.1 million or greater at this point. And, you know, it's gone up 49% since 19. I'm just asking from a sustainability point of view only. You know, we're looking at a 7% increase across the board for the city. Um, so we're going to be asking everybody where it can be cut. Um, so I'm just wondering really two questions that is there something in here that we can do about right now to bring that budget down? But more long term, how do we get back to the more um, general increases that we're used to seeing and not? Because I would say that the last three years are unsustainable. We can't, we, we won't be able to go any further than that. I, I just don't see it. If we're, my personal yeah. opinion, uh, I, I don't know how we do that. So I, I guess I'm curious. How, how we get there. Um, yeah, staffing has always been the biggest part of our budget and we had several retirements which really cut our budget down because of people leaving who had been there for a very long time but also left with a lot of institutional knowledge. So, um, and we've seen a lot of turnover. Uh, we don't have the same, like our part-timers used to stick around forever. And so I, don't know what it's going to be like, but our staff are training a ton now where they haven't before. And that's definitely caused us to be much more spread thin. Um, and the digital uh, information that we do provide has been something we've, I, I did not want to add until I was finding services that weren't going to just be surprise bills because a lot of the digital services that libraries are offering are per use and libraries can't afford it. Like the digital realm that people are now expecting um, isn't something that's been very well reflected in budgets. Um, and I didn't want to jump into any of the new digital services without feeling like it might be a good fit. So like our streaming service is just, you can stream as much as you want. And if you want to watch that whole series, you can, um, without it being like a three to $4 charge per episode, which is what a lot of the services, um, are, uh, so those have all been added. We don't have any large anticipation for adding more services like that, but it is something that libraries are expected to provide. And it was not something I wanted to jump into without really finding a, um, a way to do that that was more sustainable than what this, most of the services are that are provided to libraries. And we also are looking at increased digital use. Um, and that's something it's hard to anticipate what the costs are, but we try to keep them as low as possible in a consortium that saves like we we do a lot to share resources across the state with other libraries to try to really minimize the impact on our own budget. But it's been a pretty volatile few years. Um, and I think the combination of the type of people we're seeing at Brownell and also having staff that are not experienced is really drawn. Um, created a different environment for sure. And I don't know what it's going to be in the future. Because if we can't, if we continue to just have people leaving, that's not been great for morale. It's been really hard to train and then just see them go off to Fletcher Free Library. Um, and that's what's been happening. And you have something to say there? You look like you had something to say. Um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking that um, a couple of things. One is, my understanding is that the historically the staffing uh, uh, that, that there's been an issue with um, has been for, for several years. But the other is that you know a lot of um, we were serving is also people who maybe are not digitally all that comfortable, um, and there's so many things that people need now to do online. Um, it's not just sort of um, 
population that um, has been mentioned here of people needing social services, but also a lot of people who want to uh, file their taxes and now, you know, um, they're not being mailed to people anymore. There, there are, there's a lot of things that people need to accomplish in their lives. Um, their grandchildren want to uh, send them, you know, photos or something. That there's just a lot of um, um, things that people need help with technologically. Um, more so than um, even just before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So are you saying then that this change in need of your patrons is causing you to have need more staff? And that's why the staff in the staff numbers, the, the, the cost of staff is the most expensive piece of the budget. And so these increases we've been seeing, you're saying are due to the changes in the needs of the patrons. And so you need more staff to handle that. Yeah, I think. That's something that came out just talking even to the salary study person. We are very, very, what our staff does is actually really incredible for how much they balance um, between being multitaskers, experts in a lot of different things, as well as um, managing a busy desk. So it's not been easy for sure. We are not living with a cush staffing level whatsoever. And the um, turnover that we've had in staff because they can find jobs that pay better has been a big issue um really hard hit morale wise and also just trying to get people so they can do their work that we have expected from them and it's changed andrew um how much is biblio plus how much is biblio plus i remember all of those and I guess the intention of this, I, I hear it, a lot of this conversation has been around the needs of um, from the social service labs, mm -hmm. how the, the needs are significant and how the library needs to provide that. And I'm struggling with, yes, and we're providing BBC. It's like <laughs> 1200 a year is what it is. So it's a fraction of what if we did Hoopla, um, where libraries are probably paying 1200 a month for that service because of what people are checking out. And then they also are tapping people and ours doesn't tap anybody at anything. So the needs of our community are we need to provide basic social service information mm -hmm. and we need to provide our community with free streaming. It's, it seems like a very broad spectrum. It's like what libraries are doing. It's yes. not... But um, just because everybody does it, it's does everybody, but we've been Jericho Town Library offers it, so it's not something like if just you don't, yeah, I'm not trying know. to get out you, but well, yeah. um, you believe me, we're still on because we're on schedule, so I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry, just really have you for so, two minutes, so <laughs> apologize. But I think part of the point is we're, we're gonna we're at the point now where we have to make decisions, mm -hmm. and if our pressures are going to social services, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding the, mm -hmm. the line, my line, mm -hmm. then Same we're line. gonna have to cut elsewhere. Yeah, and I could say and, that you're going to be reducing services and that's for your regular citizens the future. that live here. Um, and these are now becoming standard services amongst libraries, and I've done it as, as most economically as possible. That totally respect that mm -hmm. and understand that and see that. So that's not none of this is a question and the decisions that you know and how you're approaching this, just so we're just so we're clear. Um, it's more a an existential question of this isn't sustainable. And so if these pressures aren't going away and there's no other entity coming to our rescue, um, I'm just conveying that I don't think that this pattern is sustainable. And so if cuts need to be made in, in places, then that may be or is likely the reality from my point of view, and I'm only one. So I'm just, I, I don't mean to be the complete downer today, but I don't know how we continue. Well, and also we um, see people new to this community all the time that are expecting these services and it library does draw people to want to move to this community so that would totally be respect that. Um, I'm a long time <clears throat> believer user my family has benefited greatly um but it's just what public just, libraries yeah, sure. are offering things now and um and it would it's not something that's like we're not at this like pushing at the cutting edge like i've been super conservative to try to adopt services to find a balance so we're not disappointing somebody who doesn't need social services completely respect that. i and think our community though is facing pressures that other libraries may not be like jericho willis and some others just guessing this is may spit falling i don't know for sure no it's, that that they may not i don't know i have only part way through that report 
um, which was excellent and extensive. Yeah, um, I, I, um, we're ahead. not unique in offering a lot of social services. That's creating a lot of pressure, and the state of Vermont is not serving this the people struggling very well Absolutely. at all. So I think there also needs to be more work on that level um, because yeah, communities can't shoulder this. I was just talking to the Fletcher Free Director who's now talking to our federal Congress because she doesn't believe that this is something that can be resolved at the local level. I, I just want to observe that acknowledging everything you said about the significant increases over the last several years, I agree completely. We need to be very cautious and conservative going forward, even more than we already are. And I think the population of people that the library is serving in that has serious need is very small, but it's taking up Absolutely. an enormous amount of resources. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is room here for the city and for the county and the state, as Wendy was saying, to step up services locally here in Essex Junction. That might offload some of that responsibility out of the library and into social services. And so I would, this is not a, a temporary fix that I'm suggesting here, but I think something we absolutely have to do is talk as a community and as a council about establishing a stronger human services net, safety net here in Essex Junction. COTS should be here. CBOEO should be here. And then the staff of the library can say, you can just step right over to 15 Main Street and find the services you need. And so I think that's a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. But that said, we still need to, what Raj was saying, we still need to be super conservative, especially since we have a large edu education tax increase coming down the road as well. So I just want to acknowledge that I think we recognize the Absolutely. additional responsibility that you are all dealing with for a very small population of people. And that the general patrons, the citizens of Essex Junction and the members of the other surrounding communities that use the Brown Mill, they're not asking for those services. And at the same time, we're detracting from what they expect because you're spending all this time with people who need services. So it's not a problem that we can fix through this budget, but we can work forward on trying to come up with some more solutions. So I guess I'm just asking for patience and understand, like, I think we understand where you guys are at. Yeah. But we need you to also understand where we're, where we're at, and it's not going to take one budget cycle to fix this. Right. Definitely hear you. Anything else from Wendy, Virginia, Jess? <laughs> Sorry. Kept you longer than we expected. Make a good morning. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. everything. So we are transitioning now to buildings. So that's why we've got a culmination of different people coming together here in the in the in the room. But um, so there was already a question about the library building. Any mm -hmm. other library building questions? Um there was, there was a mention of a $300,000 bill for it. Is that in the budget? Or three, uh, 300000 The The room what? That yeah. is in the building maintenance fund. Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. It is. No, I mean, I don't think there's any other questions. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I think I should be more clear. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So we're moving to page 30 in the packet. This is the building budget for two Lincoln. Oh, All good, just go on. Box guys, gotta do some minutes there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, so the buildings budgets um, overall, these are really trying to follow actual actual data that we've been seeing. Um, the uh, two Lincoln budget um, was big change last year because we sort of had one human in here for a couple of years there. And now that's we're way more populated in here. Um, so that's kind of overall. Anything else? Can you, either of you want to point out about? 
On two white guys, it's just um, because of the renovation and, and obviously become, becoming a city and um, the additional people using it and the way that the building is used, it's just very hard to, I, I think we've done a good job with the data that we've had um, to try to put together a respectable budget to take care of the building moving forward, but there's, we're still not exactly sure when we're starting construction and that will affect some of the services that we put into the building during those times. So. Um, Feel like if the if the construction gets delayed or moved up or or this budget will will get us through that process. Okay. Any questions on that one? Can you just remind us of the anticipated timeline as it exists now for this building? <laughs> I was going to say we just recently had a meeting um, and. We have put our foot down on the gas pedal so that we can get that answer. Unfortunately, we're relying on a lot of information that needs to come in. We are pushing for a start of April, April or May. Um, and until we get all of our ducks in a row and know exactly what the project looks like and what it's going to cost us, I think in the budget, you've already seen that the first review came over what we have allotted for it. Um, we just went back into a meeting. Uh, we are cutting things that we feel like we can live with and still produce a very functional um, administrative building for the city to do what they need to do. So we believe, we need to confirm, but we believe that we found a considerable amount of that money that we were over. And we still need to do a little bit of fine tooth comb, but we did kind of reach out to the entire team and say, we need some answers. Um, we still want to start this in April. Um, and if we have to bleed into a little bit of May, but obviously we have some people that need to know when the building is going to close. And that's what we told them. We yep. said, look, I can't say, hey, guess what? We found out you're out next week and figure out how to, we can't do that. So we, we put our foot on the gas pedal and we are pushing the team right now pretty hard um, to get us the answers that we need so that we can provide you with the answers you need. But could we confidently say, because we do have people relying on us giving them some timelines, and even if we can't put a specific date to it, can we confidently say that the work will not start in quarter one? Sorry, of the calendar year, Q3 of, of fiscal year. So is that something that we can say? Because again, as it's been communicated to, I think, probably almost all of us, if not all of us, at some point or another, they're feeling out of the loop. Can we give them at least the update that I mean, with the we're looking to get that out of the meeting? There is no way we can start this project before you. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. I believe that's what was said to us last yeah. night. Mm -hmm. There yeah. is there is no way we can see us out there in the process yeah. before you. Yeah. So I think that there's communication there's... is already in the works. Yeah. Yes. That, yes, we can communicate. I yeah, just am hesitating because I think I said April at the earliest already, but okay. I will double check that because, yeah, you did. Yes, you did. No, I did. Yeah. Okay. At the earliest, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, at the earliest. <laughs> and, and if I had to guess, it's going to be late April almost. At the earliest. At the earliest. <laughs> <laughs> just to emphasize, <laughs> that is not a definite awesome. answer right now, but I, I really I feel confident from the meeting that we had the other day with our team um, that we are going to get some responses and some answers, and hopefully in January we will have a lot more information um, to speak more intelligently about the plan moving forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we know if Essex Chips has found a place to go? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, which one's next? Can I just ask a quick question? I mean, to Lincoln, he said, I expect we need to hoe out the basement. <laughs> what the heck? Like, literally, is it, a, is it another floor down there? Um, so, downstairs in the basement, there is a collection of a lot of materials and items that have been left over. They're probably paint from 1879 down in there, stored down in there. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. All the words have told that before. Okay, <laughs> 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 
I've been down there. I've breathed it. I breathed it. <laughs> okay, so so there's there's historic documents down there. Do we need to like deal with that? There's no historic documents. Okay, it's more, it's more leftover um, products from just the uh, the natural maintenance and and the operation throughout. Oh. Um, I feel like there are some. I think I saw a box of button blanks. Um, that probably came from something that we did years ago that okay. is sitting on a shelf down there. So it's just a matter of having you know, people with their personal knowledge <laughs> of the building and going to figure out what to go. Okay. I was just like, I didn't <laughs> think you had a dirt basement. Like, what does that mean? No, not, <laughs> okay. not, not a dirt basement. It's just a lot of town debris that. Okay. Well, yes. look with a bean bag chair and old Atari. And then we do have a bunch of soda cans. Um, tenants using some storage space down there. Uh, Little League is doing some storage down there. They've already moved their stuff out of there um, yeah. <laughs> in anticipation of the renovation to make room for all of that work to happen. Two Lincoln self storage. New revenue. Okay, so. Uh, Brownell Buildings Library didn't have any questions on on that. Um, anything you want to point out on that one, Harlan? You've got three minutes, just so you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sitting there watching it like oh, it's going to work out. You take some of my time. I I was going to say, there's nothing in particular that I want to point out if there are any questions about it um, on the building side of things. Yeah, like the, a, the roof issue is in the maintenance budget. Yeah, right. building maintenance budget. And the building maintenance budget, yeah, the roof, yes. yeah right. which is the last page of what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. So broad, so are you asking broadly if any of the buildings, or can we just jump to that building maintenance fund? Um, we were going to go through the building. If, I mean, I, I just have a question about the fire. The fire department just says, you know, I need to look at electrical in the future. I kind of remember dealing with some electrical in the fire department two or three budget cycles ago. Do we need to do all that? Is there still more electrical that needs to be done? Two or three budget cycles ago, I wouldn't be able to speak to, um, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but as you are aware. <laughs> um, <laughs> The building's position yeah. is new, yeah. and it started when we were trying to figure out the, and it started with another entity, and then I've taken it on. So there's not a lot of historical knowledge in this head as to what was planned for and what was done previously, other than whatever records I've been able to find through. Um, what I did notice in the process of, and I'm trying to remember what project it was that I was working on. Um, there are some issues with the electrical panels that I would like to have corrected moving forward. And I almost think that it's a panel that is um, the company that made it is no longer in business, but I would have to confirm that. Okay. I don't believe it's extensive electrical, like we're not ripping wires out and completely re redoing wires. It's more about uh, making sure that the panel is accurate in its description um, and that it's up to code. Okay. Or any other building. All building I just have something on the building maintenance fund again as we're looking to add ways to possibly cut. In your honest opinion, as someone who is a buildings person, mm -hmm. um, does the entrance really need to be changed to accommodate for the fact that there's stuff falling off the roof? Or can something be put on the roof to divert where the stuff is falling to? Right. At least in an inner room. So then maybe in five, 10 years, there's another conversation about how to make that building more broadly ADA compliant. What needs to be done right now is the roof needs to be replaced. It needs to have, it's, it's like expectancy is completely gone. Um, we are, well, it's not completely gone. We've got about a year and a half left on it um, before we've got some real issues. And, and I believe you were aware that uh, the materials on some of that roof uh, needs to be specially handled to be removed. That is a definite. There's no question that's going to be done. Yeah. Um, is that the whole roof, Harlan, or just the, just the front? So it is the um, 
the 1970 edition and the 2000 edition, both of those. Uh, the 1970 edition was done with a group that has a 50 to a 60 year life expectancy. Um, and the 19 or the 2000 edition um, is a standard 20 year yeah. shingle that's on that. And we, we, interestingly enough, they're all coming due at the same time within about a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, well, so those particular items need to be taken care of. Um, Wendy has, has brought up a concern um, with the way that that front area is being managed and the way to continue moving that forward and, and basically kicking the can down the road. Because the answer is, it does need to be done. The, the new roof, the new entrance, um, and the ADA issues that we were up against on that building do need to be done. Um, to kick the can down the road, it is going to require um, more labor and attention to detail to address the concerns that we are, or or one of the concerns that we are trying to address that uh, Wendy is um, has noted, which is in the winter time it can be very difficult in that area to maintain that walkway in and out of the building in um, its safest conditions. So, when the answer is, we could kick the can down the road if we needed to. To just replace the roof and not do the not do the entrance relocation. There's there's a piece of the roof um, that we are in the process of investigating that we may uh, bring back with some of today's newer technology. Um, it's a piece that uh, failed, which is to catch water. It failed years ago and created more damage inside of the library um, because of the way that it was designed. With today's technology, there are some things that we could add to that, which would be part of the roof. Um, as you're tearing it all apart, that would be the time to do it. It would not be something that you would want to come back to do later on as part of the project. So I would be curious from a budget perspective what it would do to the budget to only replace the roof and not redo the entrance, which just as the aside, somebody in a wheelchair um, needing to go through the back, they don't only have to go up the uh, the driveway that's by uh, Maplehurst, they can absolutely go the other way, which is by the steep. And in terms of whether or not that's safe or not, we don't really control the height of that driveway. So, yes, it's unfortunate that half of that driveway is not, or is overly steep, but it's not on both sides. What is the separate cost of the entrance repair? Like, uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Like, what will we be deducting from this cost if we didn't do the entrance? Um, <laughs> as you know, the bids that came in were wildly different. Mm -hmm. um, I would comfortably want to keep two thirds of that budget. Um, and even then, I would be a little leery only because I don't know what the market's doing. Uh, two thirds of the 300 for the entrance, not the roof. For, for, so it's the 300 is the roof and the entrance. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's a complete package at the moment, and that's the dollar value that we have attached to it. Um, in the process of trying to bring it into being ADA compliant, uh, there is a substantial redesign that would have to happen to the front landscaping area, right? Okay. Um, which could potentially make us short on the three hundred thousand dollars as well. But I, we're trying to put it together as a one package. Which at that point, I think we would be able to estimate what each piece of that package costs. Um, but the roof alone, because of the amount of square footage that we're covering, um, and from the inside, I've seen a little bit of damage to some of the plywood areas that are probably going to need to be addressed. And then to try to help with um, addressing Wendy's concern of winter travel through in and out of that area, uh, I think a combination of bringing that gutter system back in, if it's viable, there's still some research that needs to be done on that. Uh, if that's a viable option, I think that will help us, but there's also going to be more man hours and more paying attention on public works part um, or the library part, which they've been doing. They've yep. been going out and they've been consulting their own and they're, they're saying that it's washing away in certain situations. So it could be kicked down the road. It's obviously it's um it's one or the it, it depends on what you guys want to go with. And what type of roof are we putting on this facility? Because a portion of it is historical, so it has I, 
We're not touching that roof, which is the very front part of the building. Okay. Yeah. Because in thinking about this too, I mean, in doing a project like this, are we replacing it with another 20, 50 year, or we're, we're doing about a hundred year steel roof? Yeah, it's so mostly, mostly your, um, your asphalt shingles that you're putting on are um, 25 to 30 year warranties, manufacturing warranties, what they, or that's the expected life of them. It's not actually a manufacturing warranty that, that length of time. That's what we'll be putting on. Um, something that I would like to do in the future that I'm doing over at Maple Street Park is not to replace that massive amount of roof in one budget cycle. Uh, what we've done over at Maple Street Park, all of the buildings have come due over there. And I started there, I started three years before their life expectancy was out. And we started replacing it in sections. And over this year, this budget cycle, my next budget cycle, we will get all those done. I spread it out over five years to try to keep those costs. Why not replace it with a, a material that will last significantly longer? Like I said, the steel roof is 100 years. Steel roof, because of the way that it's pitched and the way that people go in and out of the building, there's no real way to protect how fast, and because they're massive roofs, how fast snow slide and ice slide would come off in that. Um, you would need something that would maintain it. So if you went to steel, there are pieces, what do they call them, staples? Yeah, you can put on a, on a steel roof that will help maintain that there. Yeah, um, I have one in my house, so which familiar. which adds adds to the cost. So um, like the copper roof on this what's one here, you know, it's from wheel cutting type of cross and they had to put those hangers up there. Yeah, they, did they put staples in or break away pieces? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I can say it still shoots and, right off yeah, there. Yeah, it shoots <laughs> right off. Yes, you're right up. Yeah. No, and I, I, I totally have to scan. I have a metal roof of my own home and I have I have those, but I, I also know that there's a couple of different styles like the kind that I have above my entryway at my door is a bar in order to again keep the slides from happening off over the door. Mm -hmm. And it does a very good job of that. Whereas I also have some that are just basically pegs like this. They look like little T's in order to kind of hold it back a little. But yes, slides happen. That's on other portions of the roof that people aren't walking in there. Mm -hmm. So, but I, you know, so I'm thinking not just about, I don't know what the impact on cost would be, but I'm thinking about the long term of having a roof that we don't have to replace in 20, 30 years. If you went to a metal roof, you're going to get an additional 30, 20 to 30 years out, like out of that. For how much? Yeah. How much additional? Well, percentage wise. Yes. 30 to 50 percent. I was going to say you're probably at least at least in that ball range, okay. um, thirty or fifty percent more. And uh, so the savings, it sounds like just to sum up, the savings on not doing the entryway is not super significant. That it would benefit. I mean, because the other thing I'm thinking is if that is the back entrance ADA compliant. Back entrance ADA so compliant. So putting a sidewalk around so they're not in the road around that corner down the garden. It feels like fifty feet um, in my head to get people. Because the other thing that's not I'm great, trying to figure out which way you're coming from. Are you coming from the back parking lot to come around the front, or are you coming from the bus cycle, the bus station? That was the example given earlier. So somebody gets off the bus with a needing accessibility uh, uh, assistance, and they're they're wheeling a, a wheelchair up to bring around the back, so we don't have to ADA comply at the front. Um, there's no real space between okay. the fire department and the um, yeah, that curtain's tiny, isn't it? Yeah, that that. So there's no space to leave the road and add a okay. sidewalk right. at the pitch that you would have to do. So the money that you're going to spend to do that, the other. it's better to okay. invest it into the other. All right. Amber, do you have something? So you. I was just going to say, does it make cost-wise sense to do the two versus because, like with contractors, when we talk about like doing the sidewalks and and also doing the road, like there's a cost savings of them already there's, being there. It, absolutely, there's, so. there's a cost savings to do it all as one project. They call it mobilizing and demobilizing. Yeah. Um. So they got to come in. They've got to do the setup. They've got to. Um. And to be perfectly honest with you, the way that the new entrance roof that is designed, um, we're going to put a brand new roof on there, and then three years later, we're going to cut into that brand new roof to attach this new roof that's going to go onto it. So yeah, there are there are definitely some benefits to doing it all at the same time. Yeah. And, so, the, and the piece that you're kicking down the road, nobody ever goes down, and we ever 
goes down 3% on their costs, they go up 3%. So you're adding additional monies to those same projects that you're going to take down the road a ways. Yeah. Um, and I just want to point out, so this is the building maintenance fund. What you're seeing there in FY24 is there, basically. Um, what we what impact this would have on the general fund is if you looked at FY25 and you don't want to put 50000 from the general fund into this building maintenance fund in FY25. And that would essentially, we could in theory keep the 300000 for the roof entrance project, but uh, it's the carpets that would be. So the carpets would get done next year, pushed right. out to a future year. Yeah. What kind of condition are those in? I mean, do they have to be, or is this just a, a, a strong desire? They're dated for sure. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are issues with them, like. Yeah. 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 So Last good. time they were done, Penny was the director. I remember. That was a while ago. Yep. When he's been with us for how long? 10 years? I'm not even sure to be honest. It happened when we were on the trustees. So yeah. it was within the last 12. Yeah. And there is, you know, the traffic. It was only as, it was only, so the carpet that you probably remember is the most recent one that they've done, which is in that upper level, Yeah. which is carpet tile. Yes. Um, the carpets that they're, that they're suggesting here are the rooms that didn't get done then. Uh, so it was a okay. few years back, even further than that, that those carpets were. Okay. It's very yeah. possible that. I don't know this for sure, but that carpet that's in the uh, 2000 edition is mm. a carpet from 2000. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm good. Nothing else. No other buildings? Fun question? I mean, uh, budget questions? <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Harlan. Thanks, Marla. Thanks, 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 Can I just make a general request? I think I might have said this to you directly, Regina. I would love to see something that brings all the funds together, like the transfers that we do. Mm -hmm. I know that we have a transfer yes. coming up, but like I would like to see it on a regular basis, like that we have rolling stock transfers, we have capital fund, we have economic development, we have a building maintenance fund. Like what are all the funds that we are setting money aside to every year? Can we see those all in one place? Mm. Yeah. That would be a really helpful um, aggregate. It's sort of in that transfer sheet right now with the exception of the two transfers to rolling stock that come from the public works and fire budgets directly. I don't understand the value of having them in those department budgets. I think it makes sense to move those transfers to the transfer sheet so you can see everything okay. in one place. I, I was just following what historically had been done, but I can make that change. I just think it'd be it helpful gives... to see it all in one place. Yes. That, thank you. Yep. I would really like yes. to see that. Okay. How you doing, Amber? Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> so many thoughts going through my mind. I saw Sam. We're not actually that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry. All right. Let's get back on track here. Ready? Right. Ready? Right. 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 This is where we're going to be angry. Yeah. Oh, boy, That's great. what I've been eating all morning right. long. <laughs> It's not okay. a building, but the full work building was that I didn't hear that one. That's why you're sitting there now. It's your turn. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> when are we going to step on? Uh, it was study, right? Uh, study from the last year. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta get on. Um, okay, so um the cost increases uh in ricky's budget really there are some significant ones they are called out on your front sheet um but this this one's a real struggle because these are costs are really uh going up also just so you're aware we've been trying to replace two vehicles and it, you're not like we can't even order them yep. um we've been trying to replace a dump truck and a regular pickup truck two pickup oh, trucks sorry, one of them. yeah yeah. So the maintenance budgets for the vehicles are. Yeah, it's wicked. Wicked bad. Yeah, it's technical term. It is. <laughs> wicked. Wicked expensive, wicked bad. <laughs> wicked hard to get parts, wicked hard to get them in. Yeah. Then they keep them forever. Yeah. Um, so also the cost of paving 
is going up. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that was the of the three kind of big lines that were going up um, in Ricky's budget. We thought we could at least sort mm -hmm. of bring the pavement one back down. Um, yeah, realistically, that was about the only one that really takes some money out of because the other ones, it's they are what they are. You've got to get the vehicles fixed. Mm -hmm. We got to solve the roads. So usually, the solvent and uh, the pavement mm -hmm. are my big numbers in that budget. But now. The vehicle maintenance is starting to creep up, I'm not creep up there, jump up there with the, the vehicles now. Yeah. And then we're doing some rolling stocks. We redid our rolling stock numbers this year, and it's unbelievable the amount that they've gone. I remember buying, we purchased a uh, dump truck and plow and we get everything for 130, 140. Now they're going like 250. It's just, it's what, 10, 12 years, and it's like $100,000 difference. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy money. Yeah. Question. Can you remind me what is in the rental of land or buildings? What we're renting? Um, some of that is the railroad right of ways, the leases that we have. <clears throat> There's some that falls under public works and some falls under water sanitation funds. Special services? And works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that there's an increase there too because the capital committee has been meeting regularly for the first time in yeah, several years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the the uh, summer construction services. I you did note here the twenty thousand was paid from lot funds, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm curious. I mean, is this suggesting that we might do that again? I'm just wondering why we wouldn't just put the three twenty in this budget. And then if we wish as a council to um, you know use lot funds for these particular line items, then we would do that at this point. The students would suggest that we're already going to do that. So we put 320 in originally. Yeah. And as a group, we decided to reduce it to three before it came to you because of that lot transfer that happened. Isn't that from the sidewalk on West Street? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. 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 So it gives a little more yeah. money to do that sidewalk on West. Right, right. Our guy's father the other day it was nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's all that. Oh, it's a slip. I mean, it's a slip. A little piece of sidewalk when it's done. Yeah. So we're yeah. just trying to explain here in this note oh, that the actual mm -hmm. budget in FY24 is not really true because we had pulled for some extra lot right. funds to make that FY24 paving contract whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you um, saying would you put summer? Wouldn't you just would you just put the three hundred thousand summer construction under the lot? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just trying to understand exactly. Like, is this truly reflecting all oh. the costs? Because it sounded like it's three twenty. I'm sorry, I, yeah. I misread it. Suddenly, it's truly three twenty. But in the past, we've done this with twenty thousand coming out of the lot. So I just gotcha. uh, that that helps me understand it a little bit better. Um. I think we're gonna we're gonna talk later about a not today about a lot policy for capital and a side one policy as part of the lot. And those are yeah two areas where we've talked about just keeping those to specifics. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And I think uh Ricky, I don't I'm about to say something, I have no idea if it's correct. Um, <laughs> so this lat FY24, the paving we just did, we included a sidewalk. Typically, this line would only be roads and Correct. not sidewalk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, the way things worked out this year, it was for the paved sidewalks, we did pave it. And then with the amount of complaints we had on it, we did it on itself back and forth and ended up packing it on there. Then the prices where they came in, the new nice folks gave us a little bit extra money to get it done. I mean, it's something little, but it, maybe it's the same question. But the sidewalk and curb maintenance at six, I mean, it's small, but that's more it's... for our, our work that we do. Okay, so not so pulling it out of the loft, the new no, policy. No, this is for us. If someone's okay. doing a new driveway or something, okay. And a lot of times we'll go in and fix the sidewalk so they don't have a brand new pavement, not so great. Yeah, brand new pavement. Okay. So they have a nice them to each other. That's where a lot of that money is going to. Okay. And that's work that's done in house. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The other thing, going back to something I said earlier, Ken, uh, on your defining success and measuring success, I'm wondering if we can come up with some real, again, real specifics, real measurements in some way to, again, define, even if that's, again, identifying and making it clear for residents, 
This is how many side, this is the miles of sidewalk we have. This is the only sidewalk we've got. Whatever those factors are, I, I just again, to reiterate for the public and for our understanding about the amount of work that's going in from our public works department in order to support the city. This is something, I don't know if we've all talked about before. I know I've talked to Regina about, um, but yeah, just, you know, looking forward after the strategic planning process, really being able to identify those markers at this time of year, people can look, maybe there's a static dashboard, right up there, power beyond, but maybe there's, you know, something twice a year we can do with how we're doing, how you know, how is this impacting your quality of life? What are, what are those measures? And, and I think every department will have different ones, potentially, right? Yeah. Um, and then when we go back to this time in future years, we can look at some of those and say, you know, this succeeded here. We're still facing challenges here. We need to focus money here. And people really understand um, where their money's going, I think. Um, yeah, I think over the next number of years, yeah. if we can get something like that going. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I totally agree, Marcus. I think this was a good first step this year just to get the department heads like writing this down, like what happened in looking back, what are your goals going forward? And then the um, metrics, I think, will be we can, that's the hardest part, right? Like, how do you define that and figure that out? And so, I think we can improve that again with the new system once we just like you said get annual work plans in place and and do that much better going forward. You ever get your hand on your head? This isn't really a Ricky question, but I'm wondering if we really need 10,000 entry advisory every single year. Oh, no. I know. I know. Careful. Yeah, yeah. Nick is going to be unhappy yeah, to show that. Yeah. No. Um, I'm going to just preface it by I have that for a lot of these other these things that if you consistently just put stuff in as opposed to not weighing the need of whether we really need it or not. So, um, so we use yeah. a little bit at some point too. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be honest. Be honest. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, 2023 it looks like you know it was almost all spent, and as of today. According to the November numbers that we have, there's no money spent yeah. in that. And that money traditionally seems to be spent in the spring. Like that it's makes spent sense. at the end of the fiscal mm -hmm. yeah. year. Yeah. Um, yeah, the plan, the planning. And yeah. we need to get that to do with uh, with Burlington. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's gonna save some money there. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying don't put not I don't put anything in there. I'm just wondering if we could have it or something, like, you know, just to just to save a okay. little bit of I mean, do we need to do we need to put in 45 trees every year or can we put in 15 or 20 and be okay with it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out. Or do we take or do we take tree and black, like walk, for instance, well, or whatever else? And we just instead of having those have specifics, we have a this is the bone we should do here, but yeah. we have a grant matching fund that could go to wherever the grants that they, you know, because I know in bike walk we didn't really do anything unless we got a grant match, right? So if we wanted an R graphic reflect we can we sometimes would get them installed right but often it would be can you find a grant and we'll match it really leveraging that yeah. five or ten grand so I just wonder you know not maybe not for this year but it's something to think about like do we instead of giving each of these committees do we I don't know with the tree committee though of course with the ash trees yeah, yeah. yeah. they got a big plan. So yeah, yeah. That's gonna be uh I gotta wait with a you know, when we try to help them out as much as possible, once we can cut down ourselves, we will cut down it's and ground the stumps. Yeah, and then they can replace those the trees and with being with our own then uh, reach out our branch out mm, I think that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Our two branch managers. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I looked at like walk and the, <laughs> to the money there too as well and said, is there any ability, I mean, to try to scale this back a little bit when you haven't spent any of it. So I think I come at this from, again, a different angle, which is like, if you give me $10,000, I am sure as heck going to spend $10,000. If you give me five, then I'm going to spend five. But like, if you're not identifying to me, you need ten thousand dollars, then I don't know why we're just giving you ten thousand dollars. So I mean, we all spend within our means, right? And then and then some. And we had so again, some of that, and we had to trigger removal for stuff. Yeah. That you know, in the, the streetscape side of it, maybe we'll take some. We we'll use some of that money. Yeah. So I think it's more of a question, and totally understand. I think it's more a question for them than it is for for us as to whether there is any. Be real 
in answering the question. Honest answer. Yeah. I think they can warrant the fee. Yeah. There is also um, the Tree City USA designation as a Tree City. Yeah. Part of that does relate to the budget. I don't know. I don't recall if 10000 was the minimum in order to be considered a Tree City or not. Um, but I know that there is a requirement that. For, but for the bike designation, the pedestrian and bike version, let me just bike designation, there was. There was a delineation in the awards you received for whether there was an actual commitment from this from the municipality in financial terms. Um, yeah. The other, I guess, the other thing I'm wondering too is, um, and this just came up when we were talking about, we were talking about what should be the trees and not. Um, and I saw the streetlight supplies. Um, would that include maintenance and replacement and things like that? So if there's like rusted out streetlight bases or or other things, is that in that line or is that different? Yeah, I believe it is. Uh, yeah. Like we just on the second page. <laughs> You could just stay. Okay, then. Do the work right up there. I okay, appreciate that. <laughs> right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. I do. Yep. That's the brown one. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put that in the budget. Good. Good. Yes, I have it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, brown has a lot of the brown electric to the fixing of the gas lamps. And every like the old bulbs that are in there, every time one of those goes out, we get a retrofit, retrofit to the LEDs. Hmm. So I guess the question is we have we appear um just in my strolling around town to to start to need to address some maintenance on some of these. Either the paint 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 okay, here. All right. You didn't notice that? Oh. I oh. thought I saw these positive. Oh. I thought it doesn't, but I must have been looking. Oh, oh. 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 I, we you just painted the ones where I had to pay attention to traffic. We had two guys, and I remember that because we got that. Once they get the lines painted, yeah, look what you started. About. Once they got the lines painted, and it's been a while since we've been able to successfully get all the, the white markings down. Yeah. And I'm driving up Pearl Street, I'm going like, sure, the black guys, they look terrible. I said, those are painted. We'll be driving down here, and we had them all painted up. Going through the bases and the five corners and up row and all the all the gas lamps and had them touched up. So yeah, I'm a little disappointed you didn't recognize that with your eagle eye being we just bring water. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit hurt, but you know what? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm getting a lot bigger skin than I get older. They, me, yeah, they were freshly painted in uh, 2023. Well, let me go. say, if I'm you're going to try to bail them out? I'm gonna, no. no. <laughs> I'm going to throw my own grenade and see, yeah. see how I'm going to sure. go. Sure. That, that, I, I, I guess that's skin right I, get it. I, did, I did have this experience again driving the winter hours. It could start a little bit earlier, but on west, where those lights are dimmer than they used to be, I think, from years past. They all switch so every light and, LED. and they're so and they're high. So what I notice for people who are walking is the for as many lamps as there are going down west, there's a lot of dark spaces. It it's not so there, so I get to the point where my experience either walking or driving down there is that there's not enough light. If the intention is to light those sidewalks and keep them lit for people who are walking on those sidewalks, there's not enough light. Okay, but well, we can add more. Like yeah, GMP. But I also wonder if they just need to be lower than I can check with Understood. Three Mountain Power. Yeah, we rent those. The city rents those from Three Mountain Power. So we can we get if you, you want more, we can add more. Well, we, we, have, have, we have to have the board's approval first. We've done this in the past. Totally understand that. But the other question is obviously it also if we also pay for that. And so I wonder. If there is a specific need, what is the specific need of lighting the West Street walkway in comparison to any other street? Which one are you talking? So there's the sidewalks lit. I just don't remember. Yeah, the yeah, sidewalk. Yeah, there's street lamps along along West on the so on the power walls, power walls. on the power walls. and so there's a portion of me again because of the fact that they're so dark there. I wonder if we even need them. We can save that that money. Then, if, but if we do feel that we need them as a community, <laughs> should they be fixed? That is not a budget discussion, but that's what I want to know. Well, if there's particular spots that are that are dark, and someone requests it, then we 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 look at that request, check with GMP, and then we get the approval from you. Street lights look amazing. 
But you don't know, rise. You're not going when it does that. People say that. Well, I didn't fix that yet. Yeah, we fixed it the other day. Oh, and then on the future. So you know. <laughs> and again, I'm used to it. Thicker skin. We're good. Yeah, that's good. Right, right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Chelsea. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, Ricky. All right, dude. All right. All warmed up for you. No, thanks. You can hang out too, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You did you scrum water, too. Yes. Yeah. I'll check out. Yeah. 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 All right. So this budget is um has a giant yellow section. <laughs> Very colorful. <laughs> So um, this is confusing. It was confusing to sort of figure out how best to um, to put this in here. Um, and uh, in a different way, we did the rental registry because we're much further along on the rental registry. So we sort of just included it into the community development fund. This is a totally different thing. We're talking about its potential stormwater utility. Um, and there are additional costs if we do the stormwater utility, there's also a revenue stream that will come in for that. But stormwater is, uh, our management of stormwater is dictated mostly by a uh, state of Vermont permits that we are responsible for. And so we have a true costs, whether we move to <laughs> utility or not. Um, some of Chelsea's time is in this budget. Uh, it was last year as well. Um, and then if we are able to uh, get to a stormwater utility, the idea is that we would bring on a full-time person. So essentially in Chelsea's old life, when Jim was here, she did stormwater work. She's still doing it now while she's being the new Jim's job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a big lift and a lot we've got to do here. So those are sort of just the over, overarching statements I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, anything more specific either of you want to add? Let's just start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How yeah. far along are we in the, I know we had, a, we hired the, um, or we got, we gotten some work done from the consultant on the stormwater utility and it's right. No, no. Am I we just, that up that's right going to be on your uh, agenda next week. Okay. At the city council meeting. Um, we have, uh, it's, it's a long story, but <laughs> uh, we have a council meeting next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and cool. the timeline originally with them is we were hoping to get it by July, get the utility up and running, but um, my colleagues in other communities said we're crazy to do that fast. Uh -huh. So we're going to go as fast as we can, but make sure we get public engagement and everything uh, so we have support and it's successful. So. Can I can I ask for like a quick reasoning as to why we need it, but we want or need the city building? So uh, big picture, we are required to uh, manage the stormwater that comes off of our roads and our properties. Um, that is at a cost to us in terms of um, infrastructure and um, uh, best management practices in order to deal with that. Um, many of our other communities um, have set up a utility because just like any other utility, our, we're bringing you water, we're taking your waste away. That is a utility that we're providing and it costs us money. Um, there is um, it, there's different ways to do a utility because if you are a bigger property owner and you have a lot of impervious surface on your property, um, that is a bigger 
the stormwater management effort than less. So it's, it should be a different fee for residential versus some other property owners. And so there's sort of, there's a lot to think about in the utility in order to make sure it's a fair and equitable system. Um, because there's no, there's not a meter like we have for water where we're charging somebody a specific amount of water they're using. The other thing is there's a timeline on it. So um, we're required, to, now of course I'm not remember the exact dates. I think it's 2030 around there. We have to reduce, maybe it's 2035, but it's about 10 years or so out. We have to reduce the amount of stormwater or phosphorus in our stormwater to Lake Champlain by 25%. And we currently have no way to fund capital for stormwater that previously sat in the town budget and was paid through that system. Um, so in separation, we have no source now. Um, so can I ask a question of how this would impact the average resident? So we are currently paying our water bill. Mm -hmm. And then the current expense of this wastewater facility and stormwater facility is coming out of our general fund budget or our, from our budget and our property taxes. So adding a utility adds, does it remove the cost from the? Well, wastewater, it, there's no stormwater that comes to the wastewater. It's a work separate. There's um, some, okay, so residents are not already not paying nice. for that, except through their property taxes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Got it. So this would be a separate charge to every household Mm -hmm. for the utility yep. mm -hmm. but it would not be a reduction in anything that they were paying for what well, the way they're paying now because right because we're not well, paying for it now. well right this well, but, we are in the general fund right, right but right, there, right. there's no we have no money to do the uh, stormwater infrastructure projects that we need got it okay forward so this won't change the current what we're paying for the services in the budget not the yellow part this won't necessarily change if we add a utility, there will be an extra charge on taxpayers just for the utility. Correct. I just want to understand. That. But it should so, offset what's in this general fund. That's my question. Tax rate. It should like, offset it a little. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not necessarily just a, an add on. It is going to offset some of the costs that we already are currently paying. Right. Okay. Because some of the costs that you see in the white column yep. will shift to the utility mm -hmm. out of the general fund. That's what I wanted to okay. understand. Okay. Potentially potentially uh, be paid by people that don't currently pay it. So yes. if you're a tenant with the water bill, yeah, right. I'm yeah. assuming it's going on the water bill. Uh, It'll be a separate, separate bill, but same system. Probably, yeah. yeah. So, so we yeah. go to different uh, different set of payers. Yeah. yeah. And will it, does the global pay for that property, they do their own stormwater, or are they going to be impacted by this as well? We have not gotten that far, okay. but mm -hmm. there's going to be commercial rates. Okay. And um, so, I'm so sure if they have their own permit. They got a lot of parking. I don't lots. think. Mm -hmm. I think they must have their own permit because that's not included in any of our modeling or anything. So they wouldn't be. They technically, potentially, wouldn't be included in this. I need to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. But to go to go back to the original question, though, the two hundred and whatever it is, it's in the white here. Or uh, coming out of the general fund, that all should be moved into the utility. Yes. So that in terms of Elaine's original question, yes, there should be a, a reduction in how much we would pay in yep. property taxes once we get the utility going. It'll right. just be moved over to a different bill. Right. Yes. Thank you. That's yes. that's what I want to be able to explain to my neighbors. Yes. Say, yeah. wait, why are we doing this? What does this mean to me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But the at what and FY20, so we never did this before. FY24 is the first time we had a stormwater budget in play on the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm city side mm -hmm. um so overall i would say we're uh, the stormwater and what we have to do for it is completely underfunded in fy24 totally like the expense side is so uh ultimately the costs of this program are will increase whether we have the utility or not. Yes. Right, right. So maybe somebody's tax bill will go down five dollars, but this utility fee is going to be probably more than five dollars. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And it wouldn't be until after the utility is created, which is not going to be this year. Yes. Right. So really, we're talking we, about. Well, well I know. I um, it, our, it, that's what fiscal year that we're talking. Not this four. The goal is that it will be outstanding at some point in FY twenty five, and I think that's very doable. This is the, we were hoping to get it for the start, and I don't think that's going to be the case. Okay. Thank you for walking us through that. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, it's very confusing. 
Yes, apologies <laughs> to not be able to lay this out more clearly. Yeah, so no. what we're looking at in the way here is what we need for this next fiscal year, and that's kind of mm -hmm. that's a happy place ish compared to what we did this current fiscal year, which was sorry, like nothing. Um, so yeah. this this should is this budget then based on the assumption that partway through the year, or do you know what I'm asking? Um, so if we do if we approve this as presented, yeah. and in January of 26 the stormwater utility comes into play. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be at least savings. Savings yep. on the okay. Mm -hmm. All right. On the general fund. Side. Right. On the general. And then the new bill on the other side. Right. Yep. I don't know why I had to do that. Oh, sorry. No. Sorry. So the sooner yeah. that happens, then the less of the tax increase would happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But right. not likely. It doesn't sound like we do need to include this. Right. Yeah. Just because we because you can't be sure when the utility will start. Correct. And Jess, were you just saying this bottom line on the mm -hmm. FY25 is correct or it's we're yeah, so different? The bottom line here in the white is what is included in the general fund total right now, thus calculating the tax rate. Um, what's over here in the yellow is just an aside. It's just a note. Um, and essentially this, if we did what's in the yellow, it's going to be $123,000 more than what we're doing proposing right now, mm -hmm. um, but it would be offset by revenue. We just don't know what that revenue is yet. And most of those costs are, okay, I get it. Yeah. Yep. Informing the utility is a vote. Right. No, no, we don't no. have to have a vote. No. We don't have to vote to form a utility. No, yeah, we checked on that. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask about the uh, contract enhancements for billing? The building process. I'm curious about uh, what were those enhancements that are yeah. done that's um, causing I should, your We should have skipped the memo today. Right. <laughs> uh, you're getting the memo for next week's packet, but uh, um, they. I'll just I'll just say right now. Rap Telus was the only uh, bid received or proposal received, um, but they are their focus and their firm is creating stormwater utilities and water driven utilities in general. Um, and so they originally submitted a um, contract or a proposal that came in like $100 under our original budget. It was, our original budget was 17,000 and that was the funds from the PB, PCB settlement that were, was earmarked um, for the utility. And um, then as part of that proposal, they had a bunch of like future or possible scope enhancements based on what I like only what I laid out um, and so really what most of that cost is going to be is improving the um, GIS layer which is the mapping layer that a lot of utilities are built on as impervious surface um, and so they looked at what's already out there for a six junction and for example like the church down the street the previous layer showed like the lawn too which then if you're if you're creating a utility based on that it's not fair to for it to not be very accurate so they're going to um, do a lot of data correction in order to press be um, on the best possible um, rate to be fair so that's most of that and then the other is they're going to create a rate calculator so that in the future like i can work with jess and we can adjust if we need to adjust the utility rate we don't need to go out for consult necessarily we can just use this calculator that they formed for us in the process so this is a one-time then yes okay. yep. yeah. but that's you'll see that's in the white budget too because we need it anyways to get this going yeah. any other questions on this one okay um, we are behind schedule. No. <laughs> and we could do a working lunch, yeah. and well, we will have to do working lunch. We've got our executive session starting at twelve ten. Um, so we'll get your food. Um, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ricky. Thank so thank you. I, I, I don't, do not worry I'll about. Break seven rules. I don't worry about. Break seven rules. I don't worry about. Say, <laughs> I know. Yeah, not to you. 
All right, and we are on to Jess, science. Um, hmm. um, probably the finance about it itself, I think. Okay. All right. So um, you've got your summary in the narrative document as well that talks about the notable changes. Um, the um, big point to make in here is um, so, and correct me as I get this wrong, Jess. Um, your FY24 budget <coughs> had a full time administrative person in it. Um, this was in wastewater and they did some public works stuff. We had that person also take on the utility billing process. Um, that person left um, and we refigured out the best way to kind of handle this. Um, it seemed like that wasn't a great solution for a number of different reasons. So um, we went part-time position, focused on utility billing under the finance department and both admin pieces for wastewater and public works are just like very minor hours. Some both people who used to do some of that work for both of those departments have kind of just come in and stepped up temporarily to just do some of that admin side of the work. Um, the thinking now is that billing coordinator person, there's a, a lot going on even today. And we're talking about potentially stormwater utility and we're talking about um, other fee structure that has to fi be figured out on the rent for registry side of things. Um, so the what you've got in front of you now is the full-time position in FY in the finance department budget, but your FY24 budget had this full-time position in there. In a different department. In which, a different department. Yep. Which department? Um, it was split between water, wastewater, right. sanitation, and streets. Mm -hmm. So there's no change in dollars, essentially. This is that's right. That's um, the words I'm looking for. <laughs> it, it wouldn't so, be, uh, some of those budgets do are billed separately in a water bill right, and right. provide admin back to general. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a mess <laughs> trying to explain it. So um, because finance also, finance as a whole, the department is part of that admin allocation mm -hmm. that the, the enterprise funds pay back to the general fund. <clears throat> so rather than it's still an increase of one FTE globally for the city. Um, there are things moving around so that there's a little bit of an increased cost to finance. Um, and through that also to the enterprise funds because that person will also be allocated out to the enterprises. So is that why there's only a 26% change? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no. Okay. The 20, so that 26% change is does reflect the one FTE. Mm -hmm. Um because that change, the dollar amount change doesn't sound like a salary and fringe for one FTE. It is salary, not it's just salary. Okay. Yep. So, and fringe is changing because group insurance, uh, like you'll see group insurance is only going up 10, just under 10%. Yeah, yeah. Right, um, that's because there are changes in what staff are electing for benefits next year. So there was a health plan that went from a family to a Is there, I think you just mentioned that that 
full-time position might be doing the stormwater billing as well. So is there a potential of shifting some of that? Yes. Back to our conversation we had to get lunch. Okay. Yep. But we have to budget this and then hope for it's kind of like with lot. We don't we're not budgeting. We didn't budget anything for lot because we had no idea what the, it was in year one. Right. And then moving forward we are okay. Yep. Yep. Anyone? Uh, what's the? Uh, I know you like colors. So, <laughs> is there a particular reason why you like the yellow color on here? Or is that just a rogue color? Uh, it's just a rogue color that <laughs> catches my attention the quickest as I'm flipping through all these spreadsheets <laughs> to remind me that I need to look at something. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so, like yeah. the yellow, if you see yellow in any of these spreadsheets, it's because there are numbers that I still need to get a final amount for. Um, these are just estimates at this point so like the one you're looking at in the finance budget um is for all of our subscriptions for the employees that we use to run the, the department yeah how many committee members did we have on the capital committee before we had five we now have seven and those additional two raised the payments thirty four hundred dollars because for five people we Paid out seven hundred fifty dollars, and now we're paying forty two hundred out for seven. Uh, we're having okay. more meetings. We're having more meetings. Uh, what happens when you have reasonably, you know, intentioned people apply things? Right. And you get you, Is that how the hell it's revolved? Think it makes sense to yeah. yeah. Yes. So speaking a different language. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Inside joke. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we are on the January agenda for the capital committee is discussion about reducing down to quarterly meetings um, because we've done a lot of catch up work and there's really Amber and I don't really see a need for us to meet monthly. Um, so we're we're going to talk with the uh, committee about changing to quarterly with additions as needed, like if we have a project that comes before us, um, so we can reduce that number. Potentially, <laughs> and we did. The only thing we, I think Jess and I, have talked about, but Amber, maybe not for you, is if the so that sidewalk policy is needs some work, mm -hmm. and so it yeah. may be a good place for the capital review committee to take the first look at that policy. I think. Well, having not sat on the um, the council slash trustees at the time that that was adopted. I think the first step is going to be the city council needs to look at it and yeah. see like, are we talking about just minor tweaks or are we talking about like some serious major overhaul on that? And then yes, but I still yeah. think that quarterly. It quarterly are going to be fine. I mean, I just cannot, I had to, I had to come up with goals for the reporter and I was like, I just can't even think of anything. We have no projects on the horizon. Um, so I don't want to meet to just meet. There's no reason to do that. Um, so I'm okay with I well, you know, I mean, I love to see people, but <laughs> is there a role that you think the capital committee can play in terms of um, the future with public works and the fire department and space needs? Mm -hmm. so, no. Okay. <laughs> Flat out no. Um, and that is only based on what you guys are gonna see, which is the revised policy that doesn't have them dealing with buildings. They've never dealt with buildings right. and since I have been on the capital committee. And so I don't think that's a position for them to be in. I mean, should they be aware of it going on? Sure, like everybody else in the city, but no. Okay. But do they have something to offer? That's a poll that's so that's I think we're getting into the discussion for next week's meeting. Oh, that okay. because that's on that is part of the, the agenda. Um, and so we can certainly discuss that. But from my position on this particular line item, I'd say we we assume a quarterly meeting because I don't think there's going to be any pushback there yeah. and adjust accordingly. Cool. We arrange the numbers and uh, conversation. <laughs> Again, I have a goal of getting out of your parade. So. Oh, it was two. <laughs> I made it more reasonable, right? <laughs> Um, okay. Anything else on, on this one? Okay. Oh, just a quick question. This chart that was in our binders yeah. about the different municipalities, yeah. um, what was the, what prompted 
this data to be collected for going to the taking this half time position to the full time position in the just the a finance department. Yeah, yeah. see what these departments are looking like in other municipalities. Great. That uh, was interesting. Thank you. And those are the same communities that were pulled for the salary survey, too. So it's yeah. like, you know what would be really interesting. I'm sorry that I'm interrupting. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm interrupting. <laughs> I was done. <laughs> <laughs> just wait to interrupt you. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Andrew. Um, what would be really interesting is uh, if this same kind of thing were done for all of our departments. I think that would be very helpful moving forward in some of these conversations about, as in the memo, the quote, right sizing our government. Yeah. We're having some comparative uh, information would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. That seemed like pretty straightforward. Yeah. 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 I mean, we could just not pay any of it. Do, yeah. do the Trump thing, don't pay it. Yeah. That's fine. That works. I mean, I, it, just on that note, I did ask Jeff when we were starting to sort of like pull all this stuff together and really seeing how low that unassigned fund balance is. Just ask generally, where are we in terms of a rule of thumb on debt? Are we okay? Are we at the rent capacity? And um, we are okay on oh, debt. Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, which I think is good to know because I think we do have some likely big bond projects right. and, <laughs> in the somewhat near term future. So um, we're nowhere near other communities as well as with just generally accepted principle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there a do you have a calculation of what our capacity is or is it just like what we feel we can bear? Yeah, so I, no, there is a calculation and I can do that. I've got the draft audit back now, mm -hmm. so I can do all of those calculations and get you a memo with kind of a summary of all those different indicators. I think that'd be really helpful for us going forward. Yeah. I yeah. think at a number of levels, because if we're going to start talking about any sort of economic knowledge and stuff, right? Yeah, 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 yeah just stuff. But, you know, but, we know, we know. But I think it, no, but I mean, earlier, you know, we, we talked this morning about the fire station. Right. We, yeah. know, we know we have an immediate need, you know, our charge immediate need for public works facilities. I mean, we do. One bond? I mean, we will not have that conversation. I know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just try to keep on track. Yeah. <laughs> She's not even hungry. <laughs> so the trans the transfers, um I can I can do what Elaine was asking before and move all of the true transfers that we have. I'll move them into this one sheet so that you can see everything in one place. Um, so outside of what's listed here, we have the rolling stock transfer from um, streets and from fire. So I'll put those in here. You know what, before we leave that topic, yep. the other thing I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on is like all, all of our funds, like the penny, mm -hmm. the lot, yep. like all of the pools of money we have laying around. I'd love to see all of that. Yep. Place. Okay. Okay. So the laying around. around. Later. I do report on those in the monthly financials. Yes. Um, but mm -hmm. if it would be helpful, I can do like a quick one page summary that has everything on one page. Yes. Does that work? Okay. And I think that's also something residents would yep. appreciate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can, it, can that can those documents live on our SharePoint folder so we can just refer to them when needed? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. um yeah. yeah. You can just let us know. We can talk about that later. Camera will be happy to write up to six five uh lesson. Um, great place. Um, yeah, there are there's two things on your folder if you're not aware that you can access. It's the agenda planning spreadsheet and it's the code enforcement spreadsheet. Oh. We can do a zoom in and walk through those if you want. <laughs> yeah. I remember the code one.
Yeah, this job is a lot more involved than it used to be. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm just saying. I think we're getting off. Okay, can I be the Debbie Downer in the room that says no. that I don't like? Like you're asking. I don't. I I saved. I think I saved this like two thousand dollars out of the budget by two items, and now I want to put the one thirty one back in. I don't like the not taking the the putting the full amount for capital transfer. Gotcha. Right. I, yeah. I think. <clears throat> I think we're going to be stuck in this position where we understand that we just have a significant amount of projects. And while it's nice to have the lot fund, I'm concerned if we don't continue along the track that we're on, that we're going to find ourselves in a bond vote or something a lot quicker than we thought we were going to. Yep. So as much as I hate to say that, I think we got to stay the course on, on what we've been doing and use the lot fund. It's not saying that we won't use it for capital because that's the intention, mm -hmm. but in addition to the money that we're already putting into. So that brings us back up to. Sorry. Yeah, but I think that it relates to that question yeah. about right sizing our government and asking right. ourselves what yeah. is it that we are here for right. and what is it we need versus want. Then we might need to have some bigger conversations about yeah. um, the way we've historically done things versus whether we should continue some or all of them going forward. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, I know we talked in the capital committee meeting about, like, is there this, doing this spreadsheet or something that shows, like, if we if we continue along this course, mm -hmm. where, at what point are we going to basically run out of the, run out of money to yeah. the point where we have to go back out for bond on some of these other things, like, again, understanding that we have all these other buildings, things that are happening. So mm -hmm. I hate, I hate to be that one, but I do, I do feel like pretty strongly about putting that back in. Especially because if we don't have the money to do it now, and we wait until the thing breaks, yeah. replacing that thing once it breaks is going to cost extraordinarily yeah. more. Yeah, I mean we've we've basically planned out at least according to this until thirty, and then everything just sort of don't look that far. Yeah, I don't disagree. I'd put it back in. See what no, affects it. Anything yeah. else we can do? To yeah, yeah. Mitigate it. If anything, um, at least for at least for placeholder um I, I don't know how realistic that will be this year yeah uh, uh do you want to increase it back to the 531 585 is what you're saying where did that come from um so the the transfer to the capital fund was like a 10 or 15 percent increase each year so I guess my question is do you want to keep it at what the current year's transfer is or do you want to still assume that 10 or 15 percent increase annually also <laughs> Um, yeah, my position would be to increase to do the increase, but again, it's inflation, et cetera, that, that goes into that discussion. Yeah. So, yeah. but and originally when we did the um, the local option tax, part of it was with a recognition that um, to help catch up with that underfunding historically that our community has done for infrastructure, but that those numbers there, the five thirty one, was the base of what right. we just needed to do to try and start catching up, yeah. not even okay. actually catch up. Mm -hmm. so, and that number's way off now because yep. of the yeah increases over the yeah. last few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to see a policy about the lot soon. This okay. next week. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, well, I mean, you know, problems. like. For me, there's a lot fund. There, the lot fund is going to be discussed later. Yeah, and, itself. and we have some time to kind of once we hear from the rest of the folks today to kind of see how this impacts and start plugging into the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. right, so. Yeah, so that will bring us, if I'm not incorrect, up over eight percent, yeah, close to nine percent mm -hmm. without even accounting for the two grand refund. <laughs> I've got some other ideas for later. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Just the ID. All right. Huh? Stop it. Yeah. 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 Just still three minutes until we're done. Okay. So this. This budget sucks. It is the high. Uh, your FY24 budget was put together before we knew what this was going to be. And this is what it is. 
<clears throat> okay. I mean, it's it's a it's a contract, right? Yeah. So there's really no. How long is the contract? Yeah. You don't have to go off the top of your head. It's yeah. a year, obviously. It's, it's probably a minimum three. I think it's two or three. Yeah. To start, and then it's like one year options. To we can RP again yeah. later if you understand what this is for. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the intent of this also was that outside consultants, instead of reinventing the wheel, take advantage of the content yeah. expertise of having <laughs> yeah. outside consultants do this at some point in time, even just revisiting the conversation about is it ultimately saving us money or do we have a better product by doing this as compared to internal? Yeah. That should absolutely be a part of the conversation when that time comes up. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. helpful background because I wasn't quite sure that whole. That bulk piece. Yeah. Um, and frankly, if we were going to, when in separating from the town, the ability to hire somebody on day one versus contract on day one, it's not easier to contract yeah. on day one. Okay. This is really okay. a two person for an organization this size and our and our needs and the modern aspect of what we're dealing with. It's a minimum two person job. Mm -hmm. And this is saving us a significant amount of money from um, it's still a savings over employing two people certified and, and able to do this. Right. Yeah. I popped double, at least 50%. So I think we're in yeah. a good space. It's just different. Than yeah. Expected. Yeah. I mean, is everybody generally happy with the with the? I mean, obviously we're we're talking about one contract really here, and then, so everyone seems to be happy with that contract, and despite the the cost. Yeah, for the most part, I think I think it's working well. There's still two um, big components that um, we haven't addressed, and I'm not sure we'll address one, but the. The first big one is we still got a lot of Google usage out mm -hmm. and about sort of mm -hmm. all over. Yeah. Um, and open approach is pretty strong in their opinion on how unsecure mm -hmm. of a situation that is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's still out there and that might be pain when we get to that, um, but that's not gonna be open approaches fault necessarily. Uh, it's just gonna be, Hard. Yeah. Um, and then the other big piece is this is still the library is, is an island. Yeah. Um, the fire department is brought in, which is big. They are super appreciative of that. They've got their officers have email addresses now. Like that's um, really helpful. Um, and the library, I think, is an okay situation at the moment. They just do so much other interesting things in that building collectively. Yeah. Um, and they can do it on their own. They've got the expertise to do it on their own. Um, they would just die if they couldn't use Google. Um, and they're using they're using Google Business Suite or something like that for their domain and everything else. Um, yeah, we don't have those things. Yeah. I, I feel personally really strongly that we need to be under one umbrella yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And any other departments that are using Google need to stop by a date certain. Yeah. Like I, I know of a few that I interact with, and it's like, no. Yeah. And it also exposes the employee uh, to their personal. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is not a great situation for yeah. employees generally. Like, yeah. I, just the level of professionalism I think we need to have just needs to be. And if it means more cost, then that's just the way it is. Yeah. And this is the cost that we incur. So, uh, or are there people in those other departments who are who have a job devoted to IT that then would not be needed anymore? I don't know, like you're talking over at the library? I'm talking about any department that's currently not within, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we have any folks doing IT, that kind of IT work. I was just thinking, you know, if there's a, a job listing on a Google on a on a Google Drive as opposed to Office 365, for instance, or there's a rec instance or something, <laughs> these legacy holdovers that, and a lot of stuff, it's going to be really difficult for departments to follow because maybe they haven't interacted with that document or that place in a year or two. So I get it, that's different, but I think we need to. And I'd love to kind of figure out over the next. I don't have enough time for this budget year, but. Is having Brownell on a separate, um, in a separate situation, saving us any money or costing us money? You know, is the pain of transition next year, not this year? Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. Is it is it worth it or is it? Yeah, I mean, I I would think right now it's it's there's some cost savings. I think because I think that individual who does a lot of that work does a lot more than just that. I right. think. 
And so I, um, and every time we add one more person into this contract, <laughs> it's yeah. off, like, um, but that's just an assumption. We certainly can, can look at that. But I guess that brings us back to like the real cost, right? So if we get to the point where we've now added everybody in the way that we would really like the place to run, and it gets to the point where we could do it cheaper by having our own employees, you know, or it frees that yeah. person up in this particular situation. And this hypothetical, as a person at a department doing this that desperately needs coverage in other areas that we've just heard about, and they're not doing some of the, because they're still gonna have to do some of their library. They have right. their own responsibilities, needs, okay. um, okay. rules, practices. Can I just make a yeah. recommendation based on what you just said? I don't think we have an accurate picture of the IT services that have to happen that are public facing at the library right. and the differences between them and what the city needs to do. Mm -hmm. And that was always a source of tension between the Brownell mm -hmm. and the Essex Free and the town government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really think it might be a smart idea for all of us to be at the table with the library and perhaps someone from the DOL who explains that this is what a library does, this is what a city does, and this is why the library needs to do these things mm -hmm. so that the library does not continually feel like we are trying to take things right. away. I guess the only thing I'm saying is I would like an IT expert yes. in that field to come in and say that why they can't do those those things yeah. and still be under the same vendor. Absolutely. Because coming from a healthcare field, I, I completely get the privacy and the firewall and all of that other stuff yeah. that is basically the same as a library with different statutes. Because please be advised yeah. that yeah. any questioning of the expertise of the library staff on their own IT will be met with a great deal of consternation. Oh yeah, and it's not a matter, it's not an intention of, of removing work from anybody. What I'm talking about is Maybe those people are still doing that same work, but we have to find ways to stay. No, you're right. I mean, if I add up all the subscription services in this budget right now, it's shocking to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're adding more. Yeah. Just with the rental registry blows my mind. Mm -hmm. We are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, it feels like maybe a hundred, on subscriptions alone. Yeah. Yeah. And I if we're not gonna get a handle on these, and, and yeah, we might upset some people, but I don't intend for anybody to do different things. I'd like to just figure out a way to get to spending less money on. And, and I'm sorry if that hurts people's feelings, but um, that's not the intention. Um, some of those subscriptions, though, I would argue are certainly worth it. And I know, yep. I know you would agree with me, especially in terms of things like um, the time sheets, where there was a period of town that, right. or a period of time where I know the town was doing the time sheet by hand, right. which just was not yeah, yeah. And so yeah. being able to do the, those types of activities through a, a computer system, hands down, is a whole success. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and the tough thing for me on that whole thing is it seems like that's just the wave of the future. Like there's probably, you know, we may wear only 5% into that, what that is. And it's, it is, it's brutal because all those folks have figured out how to make oh, sure. it an annual, you know, mm -hmm. very large <laughs> mm -hmm. fee. And it's like, ugh, it's, it's rough. Yep, um, absolutely. Just wait until we get into AI. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Oh boy, said it. Yeah. Um, Ross brought this up the other day, but is there any for um any built in? It might not even be this costing center, but tech changes to this building due to the renovation. Mm -hmm. So um uh um yeah, the meeting, one of the meetings that Harlan was talking about today when we were talking about the two Lincoln renovation is um, we had a great meeting to kind of cut down some of the costs within this, the original um, budget for the renovations on this building. And we also at the same time had a list of the things that we haven't yet even like gotten to in the terms of the level of detail. Um, having a, uh, the ADE consultants kind of come in and take a look um, is still on the list to figure out what, what that looks like. But essentially what we'd be aiming for is that in each meeting room, whether that's even a small, like one individual space meeting room or the larger meeting rooms, you kind of come in and it's bug and play right. as opposed to um, everything else. And then town meeting, to, this is all town meeting, TVs, equipment, you know? Um, right. And so how that works for them and how we do that is still kind of all on the, on the table. Okay. Um, but right now, roughly, just so you can keep it in your mind, well, there's too many numbers to keep in your mind, but if you will, 
care to hold these numbers in your mind. Uh, we have $2.5 million of ARPA money available for the building renovation. The first cost estimate came back as $3 million, um, and that doesn't have some of these other parts and pieces in it yet. What are the 20 devices that need to be replaced? Um, they are just laptops, um, devices that staff are using them to work. Uh, one of the significant changes from the how the town was managing our technology versus how Open Approach manage, manages is that um, our understanding from Open Approach, at least, is that the town was budgeting for um, like the basic laptops. Open Approach beefs those up a little bit so that where the on the town side, we were getting three years out of a device, we're now getting five years out of a device. Um, so while the upfront cost is a little bit more, over time, we're actually saving some money. They come in, sorry, go ahead. Do, do they take kind of a rolling stock approach as well? Yes. Yep. Are and it's all coming? based on placed and service date. Yeah. Yep. Um, but we own them. They're not leasing them. Correct. As part of the contract. And are these warranted for that full time? Yes. Okay. Did you take mine out of there? Because mine was. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. I got a new computer. I had a schedule. I see. Mine that. died. <laughs> and we know when not to bother to fix yes. the council laptops, just replace them because it is much more effective and efficient and cost effective. The creative monitor. Hopefully, whoever gets mine will be able to we'll get into each instead of the difference, not even at this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, any other questions on this? I feel like I had one point. Oh, um, so this budget doesn't include um, a project that we had talked about with Scott at some point is um, getting the whole organization to SharePoint fully. So right now we are still working with a just regular network files, like everything's just sitting on a server as opposed to everything sitting up on SharePoint and accessing and sharing documents in that whole different environment. Um, so this does not include that. Um, if uh, when I realized it wasn't in there, I was like, there's too much stuff in here anyway. Maybe we're holding off on that. Um, but just want to give you a heads up that that's uh, we still will, will not be in that system in FY25. And we can still use OneDrive. So yeah. like Regina and I use OneDrive a lot to just kind of internally their documents. Mm -hmm. Um so I mean you know OneDrive is personal, right? So but you are so I guess the workflow there is this is exactly what I did right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would be to make sure that when they're final though, they go on the network drive. So that if you leave, yes. Um yep. you already know that. But yep. I just the train the training around this yes is like <laughs> Yeah. And the problem, the, the benefit of going to SharePoint versus the mm -hmm. the downside it of lives, being tied into a subscription for the rest of your life. Like, you know, that's all lives. sort of fun. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but, yeah. but that's just how we've been making it work for now. Yeah. No, yeah. Until, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we will continue. So Mark has had a, a question that he uh, wanted to have all of the committee members have a SX Junction email address. Mm -hmm. um, again, just because of cost, we haven't put that on there, but that does mean like just yesterday or whenever we had the steering committee meeting Monday um, for the strategic planning process, shared documents can't happen through the SharePoint system. We need to use Google more than likely so everybody can access those those documents. So that's, you know, we're still. Is that, is that is that open approach that is, that is saying that that's the way it should be? I say this as a person who works with this every day. I, you know, I work with um, SharePoint and I use this every day and I have no problem sharing documents simultaneously with other, you know, collaboratively. So I don't know why we should. I wish. There are security settings around your organization and whether you're willing to allow guest access into Office 365. And 
they can do some, especially with SharePoint. Um, they would identify it as a technical <laughs> security risk, but our folks, outside folks on our committees could get guest accounts in our tenant, which means that their personal email address could be cleared through Office 365 for the purpose. Something they can do, they may advise against it. Um, I say that because I'm in an environment with the main campus tenant, med school tenant, university, uh, union health tenant. But trying to get like another institution into book or documents like Harvard is a big conversation, uh, yes. even though they're also obvious. So it's it is possible. Yeah, it's not a great long term solution, but it, I mean, it does, you know, so if you have like yes, steering committee members. Would they have gotten the office 360? I mean, that's that's a policy decision later. Like right. they can do this. But for long term, like appointments, you know, for a three year committee appointment, I would think that's where the line is going. You know, like yeah. we have volunteers in and working on a survey list for a period of time for a public works exploration committee for three months. You know, maybe they're in as a guest, but if they're on treaty committee, they get a they get an account later. Well, that's probably the same it sounds like but yeah yeah so we'll we'll sort that out and i do know like at least at ccrpc when we transferred to the full sharepoint use of cloud we had then they had a whole external drive for us and that's how we shared things with people out all the time but we don't we're missing that component like we're not there in any way really yet fully so but yeah we'll um we'll get there but um anything else on this Okay. Um, are we ahead? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, I apologies because I was just looking this up to answer the question because it looks like on in this section you do have a, a line item in there for twenty five hundred dollars for a system like this for meetings. Yes, it's in the legislative budget. Do you happen to know if this particular technology has the ability to uh, stream this so that? you could have this meet this hybrid meeting but have it accessible on youtube or on another through another service i think you need question. another piece of equipment to route that out to stream it i don't think that does that you could have a zoom room situation more of a zoom subscription or the appliance connected to that call mm -hmm. it an appliance because it doesn't have to be a full computer you also have a team's compliance attached to that, which doesn't have to be a computer. And that could be somebody, the committee chair comes in, turns that on, hits the button on the thing. It's tied to the link that's published. Public could watch, it'll record. Um, you could do that. It could be more of a subscription. I have no idea how much. Um, but that's, again, that's you know, live versus, but somebody would have to have their, their laptop open in a Zoom meeting. Or teams meeting connected to that, so somebody has to be involved. Um, but you don't need to have somebody over there. No, but if it's a volunteer committee like Bike Walk, whose computer are they using? I'm not going to, you know, if I'm a volunteer, they may balk at that and say, "I will use my computer for that." So that's going to be then we they don't have a login to our computer that we leave behind. So we've got an unsecured laptop with a common password. You know, it's like these little things come up, right? So that's going to be, that's something that in the renovation AV can help with or quote or any other audiovisual company can come up with a solution for, but ultimately somebody will probably need an account somewhere, something. Um, so we'll have to pay for it. Maybe that's just committee chairs to start um, as an example. And, you know, those committee chairs having an account could log into any city laptop. So if the laptop would be secure, the desktop would be secure in here, they would have their own account into it, be able to start the meeting and stream it. And then that's security. That's safe. You can help there. So that ain't up all that extra time never. Good job, guys. Still good. Well, no, it's Chris isn't even here yet. Are we okay? Uh, sure, or I was going to text them because I'm so lazy. Let's see if we get there faster. <laughs> no. Can I ask a general question while we're waiting for that? Um, has there been, I know we just um, 
made the change to try to consolidate and get everybody on the Verizon because we had the city, we had the town still stuff on the town uh, Verizon contract. A, have we seen any cost savings in doing that? And B, have we looked into the difference between the stipends and actually just buying city phones for people that and we're paying for those versus a stipend? So um, Joanne and I had been working through the consolidating all of our Verizon accounts. Um, no cost savings yet, but we think there will be some because we've identified a couple phones that don't know what they are. They don't know what they are and they're not being used anymore. Um, so there will be a couple that come off. Unfortunately, I think those are in the enterprise fund. So it <laughs> doesn't affect the general fund. Um, and the stipend versus the cell phone, the stipend that we offer is whatever we would pay for a cell phone. So it, the cost is exactly the same. Okay. I, I would like to, just like I questioned earlier in the conversation around Brownell, I would like us to have a clear understanding of like what what is the reason or responsibility that requires them to have this this thing? Yeah, I don't so we because I I just you know I will say this blanketly. I don't know why the librarians need yeah. to have that. I get Wendy as a department head may, but I don't understand why anyone else on staff would be required to have a stipend you know, if it's just so that we help encourage you to keep your phone on so that if we need more assistance we can call you in i i question that that's yeah, yeah. so the the we went through this last year and mm -hmm. i did make the call that this for this reason it meets our policy because we do actually have policy all written up as to why you would qualify for this so the um three folks that ha i think it's three folks that have it um, have the stipend is because they are the ones who are um, scheduling people. They're not, um, uh, they're, shoot, dang it, I just missed my train of thought. <laughs> um, uh, sorry. Um, it's, so they've got, um, such an interesting array of how they get all their hours covered between full-time people, part-time people, subs, shelvers, of a whole variety of different things. And a lot of the night before they are hearing, I'm out, I'm not coming, I'm not doing this, I can't do that. And so in order for them to quickly be able to figure out who else they're calling and trying to get to the table that they can open at 9 a.m. the next morning is really a, the main reason why this situation is in place. So it's not for every full-time librarian there, it's for a small number of people who yes. do sketch. Right? Yes. And they're getting a full so, monthly subscription payment Yes. for for their own phone, mm -hmm. of which they're probably using at 10% of the time. Yeah. 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 That seems... I mean, I use my personal phone for my job every day, eight hours a day, and I get $25 a month. Yeah. Stipend. I use mine and I don't get anything. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that if we have a policy, yeah. it doesn't seem to be across the board. Yeah. Sorry to open that. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, the reason I was asking yeah. is just as a former city of Burlington employee, I knew that they got a significant discount. And even like things like when I went to buy a phone, like it was free to me. Now, obviously, they have thousands of employees versus us, but that's the only reason I was thinking. I also think there's a potential public records or um, issue here. Right. So we do, we pay, mm -hmm. so you know, we pay um, $55 a month for a cell, a traditional standard cell phone line. Yeah. Um, and we do get free upgrades every two years, I think it is, on any line that belongs to the city. And it's not the newest version of the, you know, Samsung or iPhone. It might be like a version or two behind, but there is, and those are free. I guess, yeah, I guess it's just how much we're, and I don't know that the policy can be done. You know, we, we have a lot of policies to look at, which is yes. another effort. And, and, yeah. yep. and it's just one of those things as we go forward, it's, it's going to become harder to explain mm -hmm. that. Because mm -hmm. I think that's, but yeah. Shut yeah. to Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. We made you run upstairs. Let's get here. Ready for you. Great. <laughs> 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 um, 
this okay. six minutes once I'm done. <laughs> All right. So this is page 45 in your PDF packet. Um in the narrative, the things that we are um oh wait, sorry. I have to put this in incorrectly in the narrative. Oh, I just went past it. Okay, sorry, here we are. Um Notable changes uh, that we called out for the community development budget um, are really the rental registry enforcement officer component. So you see this budget really going up fairly significantly percentage wise, but you see the revenue um, associated with that up, up above. Um, the other note that we've got here is we are um, contemplating a vehicle because this particular role um, is really moving all around the city. They shouldn't be showing up with a non-red license plate. Um, and so there may be um, some shifting that we can do in here. And I kind of forget where we landed on this between some, um, speaking of stipends, some staff get a stipend right now because we have no municipal vehicle that they're using. And so they're um, out and about in their own vehicles. Um, so that is that. Um, Chris, anything you want to add or talk about, or we can go straight to questions if you do not. Um, there's so yeah. So there's a there, there's a lot of uh, potential new revenue here, but the revenue is. Uh, you know, uh, from the rental registry program, mm -hmm. but that is, of course, subject to uh, the price being set uh, mm -hmm. for that in, in, in what I thought would be you know, a reasonable price uh, you know, compared to uh, the other municipalities. Um, and you folks will be seeing that. Right. In, in the, the next yeah. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. There's one of the CCRPC, uh, the UPWT, the UPWT projects over here uh, <laughs> that I'm planning for is uh, is to revisit uh, Route 15 um, uh, between Susie Wilson and West Street Extension and to figure out if there is uh, a more affordable way to have an interim solution over there, uh, which if you're, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I smile and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Very excited. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know what that, what the results of that would look like, but I think it would open the doors to, you know, to a more feasible and earlier implementation of something that works. Good. Good. What's your P, WP stand for? Unified yeah. Planning Work Program. Okay. Wow. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it is under it. the Metropolitan Planning Organizations section for our Federal Highway Administration. And these are the terms one has to use. <laughs> one thing just with the rental registry broadly, um, I'd love to see the rental registry just be an enterprise budget in and of itself. And so mm -hmm. pulling all that out of community development so that that way you can function as an enterprise fund um, would be responsible for generating 100% of the, the cost as well as then anything over that can then be brought back into the municipality in some other way mm -hmm. just to separate that from community development. So one potential difficulty with that is that where all of the about half the person would likely be the other enforcement that we're, we're saying right now that's the uh, revenues would also pay for that portion. That's fine. We can allocate totally. like we totally. do with fines. That's easy. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Uh, the other thing, um, I think this used to live in community development. Uh, years ago, we used to do um, different activities, some community events. Uh, I think of like the uh, what was Robin's original idea out and about? Out and about. Um, boot and a boot. Boot and a boot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would well, love to see things like that come back. Granted, we're in a difficult budget time frame, but like that was a great event. Brought the community out a couple times a year. Um, and I just broadly, I 
I'm anticipating one of the things coming from strategic planning is just more community oriented work and more community oriented opportunities. And so having funding to help support some of that, as well as reaching out to our local communities like uh, the banks and other institutions in the past who provided donations for these events um, that we could then leverage to do things for our community to bring them out of their home and do things. Yes, and um, I would say I would sort of add to that um, economic development more broadly. I would say those two pieces um, that are kind of in this budget, but also in the economic development budget. Um, you know, Chris's operation has thus far been really setting up a lot of stuff that hasn't really existed so far, and we're hoping that we'll have a better sense of what, once these other pieces are set up, we can kind of figure out what capacity is going on in the community development um, team with the addition of the city planner also, which is a new position this year. Um, and once we uh, can get this rental registry and code enforcement stuff up and running, um, where hoping that we'll be able to kind of sort through and figure figure out what that looks like um, going forward and certainly influenced by the strategic plan and seeing what that's asking us to prioritize. My, my impetus really for bringing that up during the community development conversation when it's in the economic development budget is because in my mind, I don't see those economic development drivers, but rather as community development drivers. Yeah. Community. yeah. So that's, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Two. No, Do we? Are we still thinking? I'm just still kicking my mind around the subscription for the rental registry store part. Is it still looking? Still looking like that's going to be the figure. Actually, no. Fine. Um, <laughs> don't say it's not here. But what, uh, uh, we have. We will. You you will see it in the next uh, okay. uh, in the next packet, but. Uh, because we are likely going to have to exempt the nonprofits uh, uh, housing providers here from paying uh, for rental registry, uh, that would to make up for the shortfall uh, and to and to generate the enough money to cover the capital, the, the upfront capital costs of, of the car because we were so stretched for the, uh, the rolling stock fund. Um, I was uh, thinking of having to increase the uh, the rental registry fee, but I, to make that reasonable increase, uh, you know, one way to, to do that was to use cheaper software, and I think it's going to work to use the, the cheaper option to have again. You still got You must think you are. You're suggesting it, but we can talk about this more next meeting whenever it comes up. Obviously, yeah. we're going to talk about this. And so it is true. We are thinking we can do the cheaper software, but it really won't have any right. change on the general fund because it's just tied to the revenue. It will reduce both. Because we're trying to keep that price point not crazy high. And again, this will be a conversation for you guys. You might not think that price point is too crazy high. So they have to reduce. They're reducing revenue because we have to exempt the nonprofit housing providers. So to make up for that lost revenue, they're going to go with cheaper software. How many are we talking about? So it's Is going to be a net. How many? Yeah, I mean, how many? How much in fees are we? I can only think of one. Probably my my fault. I can only think of one nonprofit in the city that would be exempt. With the woods, it would be with and woods and potentially some or all units from monarch apartments. Oh, okay, all right. But also, that's just part of it. It's the car as well. The, yeah. the fact that we have to cover the, the full upfront costs. Hmm. Monarch is a place where a lot of violations happen. Correct. Yeah. So I understand um, the is, is the whole conversation on exempting nonprofits from the rental registry happening next week? Yeah. Yes. Never mind. Yeah. So everyone can <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So right now, this is a. a it's going to come out of the wash, but this number's a uh, placeholder, it sounds like, for the software. Okay. That's what I'm going to ask about. Fees. Fees. Yay. Nailed it. You know me so well. So well. Um, so if I'm reading this correct, you're, you're 
estimating about an eight thousand dollar increase, which in just the license and zoning fees on the revenue portion. That's right. And that could that could be from or what is that? I guess is the question. Is that an increase in applications or is that an increase in fees? It's a previous increase in fees that is now having an event that's now starting up because that, that kicked in part way through this yep. part of this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, and I know this is like asking way more again, but I have this. I was looking at South Burlington's fees, and I don't know if you've seen those or not, but I almost kind of wonder if we're leaving money on the table. We probably are, anyways, but the way South Burlington is doing their fees is they're allocating, uh, like their applications are based on like square footage and stuff, um, with a set figure based on square footage. And then um, there is a, a different fee if it's, you know, five units, 10 units, whatever it happens to be. One of the other things that I noticed about their fees, and this is a conversation for Susan, but they're including a digitization fee. So the municipality is not eating that digitization fee. That's a word. Um, but the applicant is eating that cost. And so that's kind of an interesting concept that I didn't think about because we are, and I'm not sure that Susan's records fee that's in here is one of the same. I think they all get charged. Recording yeah. fees get charged yeah. already. Yeah. yeah. So I'm assuming though that this is like if I apply for a permit, the city is still digitizing that request for my permit, not I mean, a actually, separate, it, it is separately being recorded in the land records. Yeah. So all development development is being now trend in the land records versus in the past where you have to go in and be like, can I see your books? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know if we are doing, but like your NOV, like using your NOV as an example, you're putting that NOV, hypothetically speaking, in the land records. Mm -hmm. And then that's a cost mm -hmm. towards our subscription mm -hmm. that we're, we're eating. So how is, I mean, it's a bad example, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's looking at not necessarily increasing the fees, but looking at how we're, how we're charging fees, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And again, yeah. I, I understand that this is like, you know, throwing one other thing onto a plate that's already full. And I'm, and I have not said this to anybody else in the room, but, um, I, and I and maybe maybe they when you look at it, their fees are coming out the same as ours, but just kind of doing a back of the envelope, it did not look like it to me. It looked like they definitely had a different approach, which gets more at the concept of of like how we're doing with um the sewer allocations and yeah. stuff, like same kind of thought mm -hmm. process. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I appreciate the fact that we've added some in there and some fees in there, but this is just a reoccurring thing for me. Mm -hmm. So this has nothing to do with you. I say this every year. That's why they knew what I was going to say. <laughs> so and I don't know if the city village traditionally has looked at fees. So my experience with fees, especially in this area, is that um, there's a pretty decent exercise that gets done every year or two during budget time to see what is the cost of actually uh, handling a permit yeah. and putting it all the way through the entire process. Um, I don't know if that's been done here. So, to my so knowledge, that has been so, yeah. so the background that I'm aware of is that we, we um, it was probably a couple of years ago now at this point that we authorized the change in fee. Yes. And that was when we did that in alignment with the town yes. doing a change right. on their fees. So yes. things like we're charging $25 for a certificate of compliance and they were charging 50 exam random yes. example. Um, why are we not aligned with the town? Yes. Again, when we were when we were headed towards merger, mm -hmm. but those fees were those fees were aligned. Um, and then but there was a based on there the was actual cost of allegedly yeah. they were. I mean, okay. I can't speak to whether they were or not. Um, the problem was that there was a lag in implementation. Yes. And prior yeah. to that, yeah. we yeah. made an effort to eliminate as many fees as possible, like sewer hookups, yeah. because we wanted <laughs> to make that a economic development benefit mm -hmm. for developers. Yeah. And right. we had a knockdown, drag out discussion about whether to increase those. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. like, 
people aren't going to want to build here if we don't be charged for that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've made some intentional decisions about those fees that we could doing the study you suggest is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in seeing how we can. Yeah. Well, so one thing that's relevant to this uh, that's outside of the interior development budget is uh, the uh, the sewer uh, in uh, the sewer allocation fee that was uh, added uh, last year. But um, Chelsea is uh, in, looking to do the sewer, uh, make a sewer ordinance, which would more more discussion. And I would say, like from our short few months of having implemented those fees. You know, it mostly works well and it certainly brings in revenue, but we also see uh, instances where, like, for example, a, like a, a small business uh, is size of lease or is about to move into to a spot and then and then they get slapped with a multi thousand dollar yeah. fee and then they're, they're like, well, we didn't plan for this. We, we, we can't we mm -hmm. can't establish it, but we have to serve on it. Um, so, yeah, so certainly works uh, discussion. And I'm glad that there's a place for that. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's just the reality of doing business, unfortunately. I mean, I think you go to, like, even just looking at something as basic as a sign, applying for a sign in South Burlington was more than to apply for one here. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I mean, I get it. It's money. It's also when you're going to open a storefront, you've got to, you've got to think about all these things, like how much is it going to cost me a month for water, sewer, telephone, whatever, all those things. Can I afford to do those? What is the upfront cost associated with renovating this fit up of the storage of, of the space and getting a sign and doing all that stuff. And um, I mean, my, my concern is that we focus again, everyone in this room has already heard this, but we focus so much on the expense piece of this and we don't talk about the revenue piece of this. And I like us to get to that point of like, not just keep talking about what can we reduce, but what can we, what can we, you know, some of the conversations later about, do we start to, to Andrew's point about the um, community events? I'd like to see us start getting more donations from folks and stop taking it out of the general fund on things like our, or the um, 4th of July fireworks and stuff. I mean, that's just my opinion, but we're asking a lot of, of our community and, <laughs> you know, so I'd like to see us go back to those things. <laughs> to that end, one of the things I've started doing is I started taking a look at the various communities of a quasi similar size in Vermont. Yeah. Um, so we get 91.8% of our budget from uh, our general fund uh, revenues from the property taxes. Town of Essex is 70%, Hinesburg is 81, Colchester is 84, Milton 77, St. Alfred City 46. Um, overwhelmingly, communities are between the uh, are in the 70 percent or so where the revenue comes from. Um, their general fund revenue comes from property taxes. And I've started to go down the, but which department, which communities then account for things like wastewater yeah. through their general fund? I haven't mm -hmm. fully fleshed that out, but I'm curious to see what other uh, communities are doing. So I started doing that. But interesting. Yeah. 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 Right where are they getting the other revenue from that? Ran out of time to answer that question. Great for bringing it up. Thanks. Right. Well, I mean, but you know, I was thinking, I was trying to compare some departments to other departments and other communities, something along those lines a little bit. But then realizing that some of the communities I was using just have these massive windfalls and local option. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So yeah. We just don't have that base. Nice it's going to yeah. be helpful. Yeah. yeah. On the fee thing, on the fee, and this is not quite similar, but and maybe this is, a t is definitely, in my mind, a topic for another time. But as I was struggling and talking to some folks about the park out here and whether we do it or not, and the value of a community putting forth common areas and beautifying common areas for common use. And as we start to see who's using the space, even in its unfinished form, a nice day is busy, like on a weekend, and it's phenomenal. Predominantly, people who have just gotten to this community and maybe live in the buildings that have just gone up. So my point is, are, are we, is that going to be our responsibility as a community to just provide those amenities continually and provide those beautifications? Or do we have an input from the development at the time that it's built to help fund those common amenities that aren't provided? You know, we already have a structure of parks and everything here, but we're, we're also talking about spending anywhere from 500 to a million and a half and, con and already conceived of this just this area over here, Main Street and that triangle. 
So is there a way to leverage some of the incoming development? I wouldn't even know what the terms are. Um, my head is impacted, but I'll be just clear. Um, without driving it away, without making it overly expensive, without contributing to higher rents or prohibit, you know, like, is there a place in there to, you know, maybe that's in lieu of a sixth story, you know, maybe there are trade-offs for these to be had when we're working with these developers to say, yeah, you know, we'd rather have six more bedrooms in that building and give you another story. In place of that, help us with this common amenity that your residents will use inevitably. You know, like that's a really sloppy way of explaining what I'm thinking. So I apologize, but but we can also but probably I, do more private public partnerships. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. if you want your name on it, why don't you pay for some of it? Yeah. You know? exactly. I mean, source stuff. But I mean, I'm just. I'm just well, saying there's there's opportunities, whether it's maintaining a ball field, whether it's maintaining a park, whether it's creating a new green space. I don't think we take advantage or necessarily seek out as many potential private public partnership opportunities to make that happen. No, and as a new city, um, as we gear up and as perhaps as I don't know where that would go in the city structure, but maybe as things are needs to be set up every five minutes or can be development. Maybe there's there's gonna be more energy over the next bunch of years to start looking at some of that. Understanding that there's not that capacity right now necessarily, you know, but um just in the brainstorming around how do we get more revenue in to help pay for some of this. And I, I don't I don't want to make it so expensive. I'm talking about making it so expensive so stuff won't get built mm -hmm. and people go build somewhere else. I'm just trying to figure out how to reduce the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say too some of that in terms of like um like a streetscape improvement or a very urban kind of park like that um, is sometimes dealt uh, managed through a TIF district. Mm -hmm. And so you, um, the community itself is sort of laying out that money at the front end to do those projects. And then the debt is paid off by the property revenue that you gain from the increased value you're getting within that boundary. Um, it's probably something we should look at at some point, but it's interesting because we don't, it, we're such a it's small area and the real increase would be hard to figure out if it's worth it. I don't know that, that we our, qualify. well, yeah, I don't think we qualify because of median income of our yeah. community. And also, I forgot they put that. yeah, you have to have, a so, yeah, to yeah. yeah, yeah. South Burlington's a little different. Well, they have theirs, they have theirs before, before that. Right. Was right. Yeah. Same with Milton. Right. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, okay, where are we? I have one question unrelated to impact fees and such like that. Yeah. I saw in here that you've reduced the budget for town meeting TV costs that were added in FY24. So does that mean that the planning commission meetings will no longer be recorded? That, so our suggestion in looking at this whole piece is um, in FY24, we did add that cost, that town planning commission meetings would be covered by town meeting TV as well. Our suggestion here is that we don't do that because it's very expensive and there have not been very many people who um, view it yeah. that way. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just would want to recommend just past experiences of angry residents coming to the planning commission when the digging starts mm -hmm. because they didn't know about anything. Um, you're doing a monthly program on CCTV about yeah. Essex Junction. Maybe every other month make planning commission topics to give some additional way for the public to hear about what's happening on the planning commission because- Well, I think the, the more the important TRB at this point, TRB, TRB is taking- okay. Okay. Right. Oh, 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 right. Okay. So right. you are doing DRB. Yeah. You're not planning doing... is planning. Yes. Got it. We're okay. still recording Zoom meetings, so though. Yes. We, yes. Can, yes. Opt, yeah. we yeah. could opt for the less expensive, please host the recording we made. Yeah. And index it. Yeah. As a middle ground for some of these. Right. So we'll record yeah. it. We'll provide it to you. Please close caption and index it. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. 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 So is that what this would be? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, you know, okay. If we get into a system where we can do some of that ourselves, then. Yeah. I think we have to have that larger conversation back to what we were just talking about with like all these meetings should be available and how we're going to do that. It's not necessarily, but do we want to pay town meeting TV to do every single one of them? Not really. Well, and I, I have that question. It's related to this, but I saw it came up in legislative, you know, the legislative line and such as well as that 
And look, when you put in the note in there about how much it's going to cost, because I know I specifically asked that all the meetings get this level of access. Um, I am not for $25,000, I, I will back off <laughs> on my request. <laughs> but it also brings up the question for me to pull again. If the technology is available for us to do it, it kind of there's a portion of me that goes, what would what would it really be like if we were to walk away? Yeah. And if we're unwilling to walk away, have we done at least a competitive check to see whether or not another service like Media Factory, who does this yeah. for other municipalities in the area as well, could do this at a more competitive rate? Not saying that they are not, I'm not promoting one option over another. I'm just saying maybe it's time for a little I don't think we'll see a difference. Media I, factory. I don't think CCTV is essentially the same thing. I mean they're media not the, they're not the same thing, thing but yeah. they're they're essentially the same. It, thing. You're you're yeah. not yeah. gonna see much of a difference. So then then I come back to the question of whether or not we want again, if we have the technology and there is an ease of use that we can we can do this, do we eliminate it or maybe we do that? that option where it's like, we're going to do all the work of reporting this, but we're going to just ask them to see the index and post it. I think what we've got with the middle ground of, we've identified some boards that require the in-person yeah. um, due to the criticality of it. And I mean, what's the what's the five point page? It's 15 now, but what I would challenge, what I would challenge and say, do we really need that for even our city council meetings? Well, if one or two knowledgeable people see this every day at work, knowledgeable people aren't around that night, let's get recorded, right? I mean, and then you've got a bigger problem than, you know, at least in terms of an expectation. I don't, is there a legal requirement that we record these? If they're on, if they're broadcast, we have to record them. It's a good question. Um, the the but I mean, the yeah, standard is great, great. I, I mean, with the equipment and the training necessary for $26,000 to do the meetings that are proposed to stay, I, I don't see that as a big deal, but I think there's other avenues and other opportunities. Just one person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it certainly seems like even if we step up to the owl, you know, and can figure out some sort of method by which we stream our meetings live um, internally. Um, it certainly seems like the quality is better through town meeting TV, um, so long as people are speaking into the microphone, which I keep forgetting to remind everybody to do that. Um, then, I mean, it certainly is better, and it seems like. Um, the city council and the DRB are the top two that people are going to be interested in understanding what's happening and what's going on. But I think there's a lot in this whole topic that we can kind of figure out and think about um, with the renovation of this building and if there's some other things we can do. Um, okay. Anything else for Chris? So outside of this, there's also, um, I, mean, I guess I can, all, I don't know if this is any time, but like any questions about the Amtrak or the farm uh, related to budget, I guess I can also go ahead to make it. Oh boy. We started our day talking about that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah I mean, so you were going to start the right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so I think those are our questions to figure out. Right. I don't know if you came to any more resolution about, about the park, but I would say we have started work, um, like engineering yeah. right, and design work, and we'll pay for that already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How far along do you estimate that we are in the cost range? I I think we're in. I think we're under 10. Well, okay, there's one was already spent before I came in, and then in addition to that, I think it's less than 10,000. I mean, I think for me, you know, there, I, I don't disagree with anything we talked about this morning, but the more I think about it, which is a much. We spent 24, um, 24,934 was spent prior to the grant approval. So add, add 10,000 to that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I'm, I'm more interested in seeing like, what is this time frame going to be? How does it play out over? And I guess I have to look back at, at the, I didn't 
Regina pointed out that it's in here, and I, I have to go back and look at it again, the capital in the chart to see how it how it plays out and how it depletes the fund. Um, I, I like the idea of going back to the state and saying, can we move it? Um, this seems to be relevant, this train front and track project, and it's coming in more than we expected. We're grateful, but can we can we shift it? And if they say no, then I think that just comes back to us and says, let me decide, you know, with the lens of what Amber brought up, like take them off. Do we just match it? Um, does it have to be a dollar for dollar match? So if we have the two hundred whatever thousand dollar grant, we offer is it dollar for dollar match or is it a twenty? Yeah. We just so we can do something with their grant, not spend as much. We could do fifty. If it's twenty percent, we could do forty. Keep their two hundred plus grant. Yeah, that uh, yeah we'll we have to find out the um so the Amtrak amount of money is just like it's just. A, a set amount of money for this project that's sitting there. It doesn't have a deadline. Um, it's very conceptual. Uh, and we are, uh, I think, have a lot of flexibility in terms of what we can do there. The Main Street Park, we very clearly gave them a design that we're intending to build. And that's what they reviewed through their process. And that's what they approved us for. Um, so, and it's a very set deadline. We have to do it by 2024. So that's really, I think our initial line of questioning is there in terms of like what, um, what else can, is there flexibility? Would they be okay with us pushing it back a year? Are they okay with us um, taking this grant out and putting in a new application for Amtrak? Like those are all things we have to sort out. What do you think about sorting that out? Like what's, what is your opinion on doing that work? You know, in terms of when you weigh the benefit of doing that, or what would your guidance to us be in terms of prioritizing and going through that process? I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know what any of those answers are. And, you know, like in my mind, the way I think about it is in terms of what we're talking about from the Economic Development Fund, uh, press and connector commitment is obvious. Like, there's no option. We're doing that. Um, the Main Street Park is the second one that I see as a commitment only because it's a more specific grant and deadline. And then the Amtrak is still so fluid is not the right word, but fluid um, and no deadline that I think about that one as the third priority. But I certainly understand in terms of what you guys are saying, why the Amtrak project would be a bigger priority over the Main Street Park. Like, I think that makes logical sense. Um, so I think we can ask the questions and, and see what happens. And the other thing that I've kind of had just sort of playing out in my mind right now is that I think regardless of what we hear from the Main Street Park grant people, um, the Amtrak match is still limited if we can't get the Economic Development Fund passed in April. I think I can't work out all those numbers in my mind right now. Well, no, we're actually not that bad. So if we have 450,000 and we put the 250 back from Main Street Park, we're pretty close. close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if we don't get the Economic Development Fund passed. I have so. Yeah, I I would point out with the with Amtrak though the the cash flow needs for that are later because it it's twenty percent at whatever like you get it's an eighty percent reimbursement of whatever whatever you're doing at the moment so actually most of the costs are going to kick in when construction begins um I I I think at this point there's it's possible to move like uh, to, to do some more design work um within the existing budget supporting the committee to that Ass project as a whole assuming the economic development fund tax passes well and if it if it doesn't there's still some there there's still money in there to do something like it'll be yeah it, yeah. it wouldn't be able to use the whole mm -hmm. Yeah. Because even if you put the 109 which we have in 25 over here yeah we yeah. still yeah, I mean, based on yeah. how this 
general fund budget is presented. You know, I'm, I'm not confident that we're over normal for the folks after last year when we're past the money. Yeah. I think yeah. If, it, if it passes, it would squeak. You know? So, yeah. 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 And maybe when we talk about that, we need to talk about a slightly different amount. I mean, maybe there's a respect for that viewpoint if it's a half yeah. or something. You know, something is something different is proposed, which would be a way of, of respecting the fact that we still have uses for it. Probably not the park immediately, and that um, it's worthwhile that the the also the general fund asks for this. And just put that out there. There is also I think we could. Just considering that we are looking at that as a part, there is also a we do currently have in our budget one percent for EJRP capital, which is also parks. So depending on how we want to define parks and mm -hmm. utilize the overall general fund and monies that we have, could potentially be another source there too, at whatever detriment of EJRP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I think you got a break. Thanks, Margaret. Kenny, all the work is private. Guys. Are you going next to Andrew? Well, that's 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 dangerous. <laughs> but you got to work. Hello. Okay. So PDF packet page number fifty. Um. So this is a. Opposite. So in your narrative, you have three separate pages because we have three sort of mm -hmm. operations under the <laughs> budget. So you've got um, the look ahead, uh, look behind, look ahead, and metrics for all uh, three of us within this budget. And then the changes in the um, budget noted on each of these. Um, so I'll just say, um, uh, I'll read from the budget itself in terms of what kind of changes are going on in here. So CATMA membership, for folks that don't know, um, CATMA is, stands for something I can't remember right now. I can figure it out, but it's not necessary. Um, they really um, are the agency that helps figure out how to incentivize folks to get out of their uh, car as a single driver for commuting. So tries to incentivize people to take the bus uh, walk, bike, um, and there's a membership fee associated with that. And then there are also um, benefits that come from it, but also additional costs. So if we wanted to, as a city, um, help incentivize some folks to get out of their cars and help pay for bus passes um, and help um, with a bike head um, incentive program, that's what you've got in here. It's a um, understanding a very small percentage of people that are actually going to use those programs. So it's $4,500. We've never done it before. It can go away. It would be great to be able to do it, but that's, that's what's there. And um, realize that there are many staff in the city that um, really don't have a bus available to them and biking is probably kind of not a reality based on how far they're coming. So um, I am big proponent of this program. I think it would be awesome for us to be able to do this, but I know we're trying to grapple with 7% increase here. Um, so copier postage machine leases, this postage machine is way too small. A lot of what um, has been done has been over at the town with the biggest, bigger postage machine. We've got to upgrade that. Um, we've talked about copier leases a few times, but our current lease for citywide is coming up in December. So we're looking at that. Um, we have, um, 
increased training for all staff. So this is some um, stuff that's, that came out of my evaluation in terms of trying to really do some more to help um, the staff as a whole really feel more collected and come together and also be trained on a variety of things. That's what's in there. Um, advertising for um, uh, position vacancies. This used to be kind of more spread out throughout the various departments. Colleen runs all of that, so we've just kind of collected it here in this budget. Um, also, we are still right-sizing what the heck our postage costs are by department. This was all over at the town. We don't really know what those costs, real costs are and have been. In this fiscal year, the postage budget and the admin budget will be over because uh, that's where a lot of it is going because we don't know where, where to go. So we're figuring that out. Um, then generally speaking, so we've talked quite a bit about engagement, trying to um, engage with the community more broadly in a lot of different ways and get information out there. Um, and that all costs money. Um, so we've got increase, increases in here to try to accommodate for some of that. Uh, I could have also made that comment, I think, in the community development budget because there are some increases in there for that as well. Do either of you have anything you'd like to add before? <laughs> Not, no, no. <laughs> Can I ask for an additional piece of information that I don't know is out there, whether we have it yet? Um, in terms of the renegotiation of the agreement contract, where is that? And does that impact this upcoming budget? I'm guessing it does. Which agreement? The association. The association. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking town. <laughs> and you know, the town. Um, the, we are in negotiations right now. The current con association contract um, is goes through this fiscal year. So we are in agree uh, negotiations right now for the July 1 um, new contract, which aligns with this vision. <laughs> I have some questions. Or, oh, well, I have a, a question around HR specifically. Bring it on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to crack your knuckles. <laughs> Who's going to an HR professional to go into the principal well? Um, no, specifically around, again, metrics and goals. So trying to under, understand the ones that you've listed here. Um, again, I do hires will get to me for at least three years. That's great. Um, the one here that, that I'm a little confused about is ensuring worker safety and maintaining low workers' compensation rate. Mm -hmm. um, how does how do you in your role currently impact this? Because this feels more like something that maybe Ricky is dealing with. I assume that public, more public works than generally speaking. I you would be surprised. Um, so I am part of the safety committee. I basically facilitate it. So and then any near misses or accidents come through, filter through me. So I'm seeing it from a citywide perspective. Um, it is pretty evenly distributed amongst departments in terms of. Um, accidents which tend to be the admin and the library are the least impacted by accidents just by the nature of their work um but i think it's evenly split between erp public works and wastewater in terms of their injuries so part of the role of the safety committee is the first thing you ask after you know, making sure everybody's okay. And when we discuss the incident, it's like, how can that be prevented? And so then there's follow-up around those types of action items needed. Um, and that is part of my responsibility to make sure that happens, whether it's through um, the passive grant um, each year, whether, so like the library had cameras where there's, you know, safety encompassing a lot of things, but and then the, 
playground, uh, the, rep, the EGRP had some playground issues that need to be addressed to help keep everybody safe, residents and staff. The other thing I'll, I'll simply say is, around, especially around something like that, um, if you could, in, in, if you could spell out the specific metric that you're going to use, like what are we going to be looking at next year? Because next year, what I expect to do is to pull this book out and go, okay, this was their goals in determining success. And I would assume that one of the things I might end up looking at next year or that I'll be provided next year is this is how many workmen's comps claims were, were put forth this, you know, last year and these are the ones this year. So we saw that that rate. Yeah. Um, is that what you intend? And if nothing else, I would love to see that kind of stuff sure. spelled out better. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I can make that happen. Okay. Is that what you do? Well, that I, metric, I mean, I think the, right the metric, metric, the thinking about how many claims they are, because the more claims there are, the more our rate goes up. And we have like an awesome rating. And I just really want to keep that way, not only for a financial yeah. perspective, but also I just don't want people to be hurt on the job. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just I really care I more. Fully see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want, just want to make sure that I'm, I'm you know, again, I can be. Be with you in the fact that I can see and identify the fact that you're doing what we yeah. hope to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything after you? This is the afternoon, too, I think. <laughs> right, I'll ask one more question. <laughs> Ashley, as far as your metrics are concerned, yep. do you have a clear baseline on all these? I do. Okay. Fantastic. I'm good. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Sure. And it was like, congrats. Like, I don't know if correct, what the right word is. <laughs> this is your last. Yeah, oh, I think I just wish the best for you. It's a pleasure working with you. Um, but we'll see you around get your stuff for a little bit. I think the congratulations are the right. Thing. <laughs> I didn't want to seem like a total jerk. So. <laughs> I want to acknowledge you, about, you know, I appreciate like the past, you know, almost two years of working together. So thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Right. <laughs> What? Are you ready for the garden? Are you ready for the garden? Yeah. Seven. Bye, everyone. Nice to see you. Bye. Okay. Um. Oh, yeah. Right. Let's play the button. Okay. Just. Uh, page 51. Um, so I have this in here, right? Yep. Um, so, uh, we have in here a placeholder, $50,000 for strategic plan implementation. That's really like assuming there might be a project or two that maybe we want to pick up and move on, but it's really, it's a placeholder. There's, um, so there's nothing, this is just, there's no plan for this. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, but that's only that for some reason somebody <laughs> came up with a brilliant idea that we felt we had to immediately move. Otherwise, <laughs> I see the strategic plan being again our guiding principle for future budgets. I don't see it necessarily being specifically applied to this budget. Therefore, I personally think we should move this out of here. All of it? Well, I just wonder if out of the planning process, maybe a committee or two becomes, we promulgate a committee and it needs a budget or something, like maybe not 50, but I don't see, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I just, I don't think we're gonna have this big $50,000 project coming out of the strategic planning process, but I think there will be action that will require some financial support. Well, even earlier we were talking about like, Part of this being maybe community involvement, community event, or something like that, that's tied directly into strategic planning. Uh, again, I don't think it's going to be 50,000 out of one hell of a party, but yeah. I mean, I'm zero. Hoping, yes. And 
in having been in those conversations, and again, our guiding principle, that we knew getting into this that one of the things that we hoped to get out of it was the next phase, which is going to be community engagement. Yeah. So there is a portion of that, but I also see, and to your point, and I understand where you're coming from from a committee standpoint, but I really think that that work should probably be passed on not to a new committee, but onto our existing committees, on the planning, the planning commission, and so forth, so that they can do the work that's necessary, rather than creating yeah. another committee. But I can see it again based on what Amber just said. If you were to leave a little money in here, it would be specifically for the engagement effort that gets us from the end of this process into the next. And that would just bolster the communications budget by having a little bit of money here. And but, I'd be fine with that being $10,000. Yeah, that's not a good take. Yeah. Yeah, this seems so um, in light of everything. There you go. Yeah. Um, but I, I just leave it for. Even as one of those things on a list of places to uh, yeah, find some place from uh, of, of an unknown amount so far. Um, and we're going to talk about that's later. I'm going to talk about that just about much later. So um, those I, I'm sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Those committees are only going to talk about committees. Um, if there were to be a new one, that's part of that board member payment, right? Yes, I was going to say the exact thing. Right. Yeah. That's a good mind melt there. <laughs> Oh, right. Yes. Like, just I just, the I I yeah. 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 Like, yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's I, I'm thinking cool. about the conversation that we had last week with ACCD. Yeah. Like, right. so we're starting to have some conversations about an economic development commission, mm -hmm. a downtown committee, you know, like what are all the things that we need for the downtown mm -hmm. and what might that coalesce into? And that I wouldn't put that on the planning commission, and I wouldn't put that on the DRB. So, and I think it's an absolute need. Do I think it's worth fifty thousand dollars? Absolutely. And is it worth coming from the general fund, or would the public just assume that comes from the penny? That might have to come from the penny. Right. I mean, because my assumption would be, as a resident, yeah, we're going to do economic <laughs> development for the tech fee specifically. That fund. That's like, a that's, very that's, very so, good point. Robbie. So when we talk about the one percent, that one, that penny, excuse me, we might have to slough off. I don't even know. We're yeah. Not there yet. Well, let's let's see. when we yeah, get there, right. let's yeah, talk. No, yeah. I mean, just, that's a great point. Now that you've pointed that out to me, that I'm I don't see why we would need the fifty. Yes, I, I would like. I wish we could use it, but I just think that's a place. Which I have no idea what cost we have out of the process, though. So I, I'm yeah. yeah I'm just yeah. suggesting we. That's just something that. We, yeah. And again, these board member payments are for community advisory board and three additional committees that are not. Name. Yeah, and we. So that's not okay. this. This includes three additional committees above and beyond what we have. Yes. Yep. So, Elaine's just mentioned two potential. I would say the housing was a previous conversation with the council had. So there's three that's, right there. That's already. And there. That's already, already. already. But that's already. But I'm saying it's already kind of in there, so we've already got that covered. Yeah, housing is in community development already. So the um, okay. the many that we've heard of over the time is recreation, energy, economic development, um, which would be in theory could be would potentially be different than an actual downtown committee in terms of that being sort of a separate function. Um, we will have our governance committee. So that's specifically listed yeah. that we've got to do based on the three years from when the charter was approved. Um, yeah. Tabs are, tabs tabs are already in there already. Yep. Um, you had strategic planning, so there was the, the, the carry forward, right? Or no. We talked about- Oh, just determined through strategic yes. planning. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't read. One thing we might talk about later when we talk about the lot, we've talked about this before, any sort of participatory budgeting. Well, we've talked about that in a number of different ways, a number of different sources, whether it's an amount out of the general fund or it's a tiny percentage of the lot. Um, it's come up in ARPA conversations, that's not happening. Um, so that's another potential group of people that that gets implemented that would need. And around that stipend policy, Naturally, it's being screened. So, I would love to figure out a way to ask or survey our committee members 
around the topic of the stipends because mm -hmm. I've, I've heard some people be uncomfortable yeah. um, in a number of different ways from accepting it. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it, here's here's where Raj this Raj. It feels like we're budgeting for it. We should just pay it. But before we do that, I'd like to find out if people are accepting it, why? If they're not accepting it, why? Like, how is that going? How is it working? Um, is there, because if we're budgeting for this, then we're, we're taking in taxes for it. Yes, it's then going into the, another use of the fund balance. But if our intention is to really reimburse people for the time they're doing, let's just pay them. Um, since we're budgeting, that's just my thought on it right now. But before that, we get to that, I'd like to know what the very, like not barriers, but I'd like to know what people are thinking about it. Um, it's been offered to you. If you haven't decided to take it, would you like to elaborate on that? Um, and then we can decide. We can't just pay day. it out though without getting a W-9 or right. whatever it is. So like they have, there has to be a process. Oh, sure. And we'll get that anyway if they ask for it. But um, but if it's just something that, oh, by the way, you're on this committee, you, you get a $50 meeting. People will provoke, I mean, I don't know, would they? But they just say, oh, you. And I'm not I, saying it's the right thing yeah, to do. Yeah, That's why I want to ask and, yeah. and see. Um, it's just sort of that next step, it feels like to me. Um, if we're not, then let's take the three year average and cut it. Yeah. Because, and then we can just go over a little budget if one person decides to take it out there. Yeah. I mean, it feels like an either or because it feels, you know, we probably have $20,000 in here that yeah. we're, not, we're not using. And it, that's all. I mean, if we're really nitpicking, um, I want to top Amber's 2,000 something. <laughs> there you go. I like it. When we originally thought of this, we, we thought of it as an opt-out kind of thing, where yes. it wasn't yeah. something right. that everybody yeah. was given. Is that not the way? That's, I don't think that's the way it's being presented when we present it as here's the thing if you want to accept it. So it's me, and I can say there's one person who recently um had been receiving the stipend and then just emailed and was like, take me out. That I don't this isn't right. I shouldn't be getting this. Um, yeah, I I think the way that we present it is a little awkward, it, and it does make some people feel like guilty for taking it, Yeah. so they don't take it. I really don't want people to feel that way. I yeah. have a hard time yeah. thinking that people can't use it. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I'm right. sure there are some that are just doing fine. Right. But I'm sure there are others that, frankly, over eight meetings of the year yeah. couldn't benefit from $401 for taxes. Yeah. Well, I would rather err on the side of assuming that folks are going to take it and then if they don't want it, they opt out rather than yes. putting people in the position of saying, I really need that stipend. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think if we give them the paperwork, that's actually like, yeah. here's your so stipend. Yeah. If you opt out, check here. Right. Otherwise, we're totally paid for it. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. it's just in house. It's different. Yeah. yeah. With, with, you know, a paragraph that's well thought out, well written about the why. Yeah. You know, we, we value your time and input. We see this as a, you know, so that they understand that it is okay to take it. Yep. You know, right. It's attended. Um, it sounds like there's a volunteer to write it. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit it for you. Do a job. Uh, <laughs> you don't pay me that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah. And she is the one that manages that stipend. Yeah. Like, yeah. she yeah. has to do it. I mean, I prefer <laughs> everybody. <laughs> I prefer a million dollars, but that's yeah, never going to happen either. So, <laughs> so going down to ten thousand for the uh, special revenue programs. Yep. Yeah, sounds good yeah. to me. I like it. Um. Okay. Um. And then we've got the other note that we're kind of calling out at the bottom of this is just that twenty five thousand for going yeah. to full town meeting TV. Um. Otherwise, I'm not sure there's you're on you're on the losing side of that one, I think. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah. Too much change here. Um, if nothing else, I will say this up since I put that request out. I just really want to make sure that our committees feel like they're being treated equally. And I don't currently feel like 
somebody who is on, and I'm not speaking for anyone in particular, this is my own gut feeling about it, but if I were on the bike walk committee, I would not feel as important as if I were on the planning commission. Yeah. And I don't think that is the case, I believe, but they're all extremely important and they all play a significant role in our future. And I just want to make sure that they do. And then in that, I want the community to be aware of the work that's going on. So hopefully it will encourage others to join these committees when we have open positions and know that they can participate in these conversations and make a difference in it. So. Hello. You're not yeah. dress up for yeah. us. I mean, I do. The budget day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Half worried everything. It's going to go to the tip of the tire. We make everybody come and wear the hat. That's all this cool. Even, uh, even Harlan did. Even Harlan <laughs> We can't show you the picture until we get a picture of you with the hat on. <laughs> right. Or you can cut your budget by 25%. <laughs> wow. The general is the longer we go, the worse it gets. Oh, yeah. I know. So. Um okay, yeah. So um uh Brad, as you may know if you've read the whole packet here, I don't know if you have, but we're faced with seven percent budget increase and trying to work through that. So uh, we've just been talking through the budget changes for everybody's budgets and then just been open conversation as per usual. Um, so yeah, on Brad's sheet in your narrative, you've got uh, his look back, his look forward, the metrics, and then the budget changes um, are from a couple of different budgets, admin, parks, and then the buildings are here. We talked about buildings before. There were no questions that came up on your buildings, but. So that's that. Anything to point out or add that um, I'd like to discuss? I think, yeah, I got it. Just two things. One is just to remember when you see these numbers and increases that um, that adult programs have been folded into administration. So it's a bit misleading if you're just like, what's happening with, with this budget when you when you so when you take that information out, personnel is up three percent. Non-personnel costs are down 17%. Um, so the, the driver here is just moving seniors from its own category into this. And I think Jess explained, or I don't know if we've had the conversation, but we don't separate out any other divisions within the general fund for EJRP. So it just made sense to put it in with administration. Um, so otherwise, you know, both, both the... As I said, personnel is up three percent, non personnel is down, <laughs> and then also factoring in in parks and facilities um, that that's a reflection, and I know this is highlighted in here of not only parks and facilities for the parks, but also buildings is now part of that conversation, um, and that's a little bit of the driver of why those part time salaries are up slightly. Um, that's all I have for opening comments. Yeah. Brad, can you talk to a little bit about the um darn the buildings and grounds? Um so last year budgeted like four by you know forty five hundred dollars. This year we're budgeting twelve. Um there's a note here that this is the two year average, but I'm I'm just kind of curious why we dropped it in 2023 and from 18 to four. You know, we dropped it significantly, but now we're saying, oh, we gotta bring it back up again. I don't know if you knew what the what happened there? Um, I would have to look into that detail. I think for consistency's sake, what we tried to do with all of these line items, you're looking at parks and facilities in the general fund, yes. is use a two-year average. Um, and so that's just kind of where we were coming from. I, I'd have to go back to see um, specifically why we were budgeting. Um, those lower amounts in 22 and 23, but still coming up with actuals that are closer to what we proposed in 25. 
I don't have that answer on the tip of my tongue, but I can find it out. Okay. In 2020, the actual was 14,000. Where, where is the, um, you're on year four of the playground lease? Yeah, so that's in capital um, and an oh, FY. Wait, wait. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. It's in capital. All right. How much is that a year? Uh, this is the last year. So basically, we paid it all and we're just paying ourselves back okay. into the capital fund. All right. So this is year five of five in FY25, um, and it's 47,000. So it's the last year that we have a big chunk of that capital being. Um, used for something. How much? Um, I don't have a good grasp on how much the buildings coordinator, how much time that's taken and expense that's taken um, this year, and how much is budgeted specifically for that next year. So I think that's what Brad was describing. That essentially this um, that position is fully in his budget um, and the part-time salaries, I'll, I'll say too that generally it's just, we're feeling like at this point in time, it's still working. That's why we still um, have this laid out the way that we do um, for FY25 as well. Um, it is working because we've got some really great part-time people that are able to step up and just take care of a lot of parts and pieces. So um, you see the increase there that kind of accommodate, continue to accommodate for that. Um, it's, it's a lot citywide, um, what he's doing between this renovation of this building and just sort of the maintenance of all, of all of the other buildings. So, um, I think it's going to be, con continue to be pretty difficult to see precisely what that is until we actually get to a point if we feel like we're pulling that out as a separate department. Yeah, I guess that's my question is do we, we we don't have a we're not keeping track of that time like we would for public works employee working for wastewater. No. Um, you know, and last year I think we had it in the budget materials last year it was like 30 some odd grand we were estimating was the additional cost to be providing buildings and, and those services through the parks and rec staff. We haven't we're just we're because we're so new to this, like we're not saying to the part-time folks like, hey, you guys came over to the library to work on, uh, you know, fixing something in the bathroom. We want you to use this pay code for that hour and then use your, your parks and rec pay code. Like those are things we could do. It It's just so interwoven in their day. It's not like, okay, on Thursdays we do building stuff and the other days we do park stuff. So it, it's, it's almost too integrated right now to have a clear separation. Um, so looking at the parks and facilities budget, then how much of the $25,000 increase is related to the buildings? I guess that's the hard part then, not knowing. So it goes up year over year, right? And and on the part-time salaries. Yeah, just you know, trying to get a handle on, you know, how much of this is due to, to actual recreation increase and yeah. how much is due to to buildings. And so explaining that is so not possible at this point. What I can tell you is the increase came from was twofold. We looked at we have those three. Um, we would call them like senior maintenance personnel. They were budgeted in previous budgets to work 20 hours a week for 30 weeks of the year. When we were building this budget in October, we did a look back and they actually averaged 25 hours a week between the three of them. So this budget reflects 25 hours a week for 30 weeks instead of 20. So you're thinking um, that extra 15 is, is sort of mostly allocated to buildings is what that's what yeah based on what we've used in the past and what we've budgeted for this is the reality of what we saw over the last year is that those folks were working more so it reflects that change um and then a pay increase um a, a normal pay increase for them um and then a pay increase to our seasonals but also a reduction in hours for them so that was kind of a wash Can I, uh, so I understand some of the logic about moving the adult um, programming position into this particular piece. I will just simply say, and I don't know if anyone else would agree on this, but the importance of our of our senior program and the importance of our early education program 
seems important enough that I almost want it called out on its own so that we can show the investment on that directly. Um, I'm not saying we have to, I'm just saying that's kind of how I, I'm feeling about it right now. Um, but I, but I'm not demanding that that be changed. I just want to acknowledge that. I do have two questions concerning um, specific callouts for this for senior programming. So one under professional services, ten thousand dollars for senior programming under professional services. What would that reflect? Sure. So two things got moved from the previous adult budget of FY twenty four. Um, there's ten thousand. Um, there's twenty thousand dollars total, ten thousand in three thirty, which is other professional services or professional services now, and ten thousand um, in supplies. And basically, it, it was a budget neutral decision. There was twenty thousand allocated in the FY twenty four budget for some increased cost and in transportation that was not ended up needed being needed. And so we moved those that. 20 into two chunks of 10 based on some of what we I think we've been hearing from you all about your support for senior services. Um, if there is no budget, then we all just need to be comfortable and aware that every program will need to pay for itself. And so that means if we're going to bring in somebody to do a cooking class, if we're going to bring in somebody to do bone builders, some of the, some of these things are free, but a music class, uh, if we're going to do an event, that they would all need to pay for themselves either through revenues or through sponsorship opportunities. So by providing the ten thousand in three thirty and the ten thousand in six ten, um, which is general supplies, it gives some flexibility, I think, for the program director to operate some of those things without being concerned of breaking even every time. Uh, if we wanted to start up the Wednesday lunches again, which kind of have gone to the wayside, um, you know, there used to be a $2 charge for those. Um, it may cost a little bit more to provide a soup and sandwich these days. So we could charge more um, or we could still charge the $2 and and supplement it with some money from general fund. The other question I have in regards to the adult programming position is this the full amount going from July 1 to the, you know, from the beginning of the fiscal year to the end? I ask because obviously, based on the re renovation costs and based on what I currently understand, when we would potentially hire this person, it sounds like if it's going to take six to eight months for the renovation to be done we're going to be well into the next budget before we're actually hiring a full-time adult programmer. So I wonder if we need to budget the full amount. I will say, and this is also in light of, I had a conversation with Virginia yesterday about um, the update for the seniors that just went out. Um, I honestly felt that we shorted our support for the seniors a little bit. One of the things that I specifically asked, and I don't know if Regina passed this on to you, but I wonder if we wouldn't at least hire someone part-time to be that person who would open and close the senior center versus relying on volunteers and then hoping they'll show up so that we can have more direct contact, more direct interaction versus <laughs> coming to the senior center and not being just having a volunteer that they're interacting with with an open and close, but there's no EJRP representative there. And I'm thinking of, for this short term, we can hire a part-time person. We have it within the current budget, but in in that I say that because if we make this adjustment because we only need a partial year for this full-time position, maybe we keep a small overage because we continue to have that part-time person in that role until we're ready to hire full-time for a lead role program. Sure, I have two thoughts on that, or you want to go? Um, I have two thoughts too, but you go first because it might be the same. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first is I think you're accurate, Marcus, that you know, I don't know as I want to budget 
after September 1, I'd really like to have somebody not co not starting on day one that this facility is usable, but start a little bit before then. But I don't currently anticipate that would be on July 1 or August 1. I would say, you know, maybe September 1. So if we wanted to multiply this times 10 twelfths and reduce that a little bit, if that would be helpful, I think that would be fine. But reducing that, I think, does not give us that leeway to have somebody part time in July and August. So it's a right. So it's a juxtaposition of, you know, if that money's not there, it's just not there, um, which I think you can cut, but just be prepared that there wouldn't be any part time support. Well, that's why I'm saying, like, if we, let's just say it was $10,000 that we were cut because of that short time, yeah, leave, just cut it by five. That way you still have the money for the full time position. For the time that you're you're going to have, mm -hmm. and but you have got some money there for that part time mm -hmm. position to continue. Because I personally think we should we should hire a part time person for the immediate future to carry us through. From you know coming up, it's probably going to be difficult for Jan second, but I would think Jan second through July first in the next budget. So so that's my question on the hours there. So I, I guess I'm. There's been a lot of back and forth in the senior center. How does the schedule you provided yesterday match what it was a couple months ago? Sure. In terms of and you all are driving the conversation. My preference would be to see if there are other budget stuff and and then return to this conversation about that memo that went out. I just don't want it to cloud any. Uh, <laughs> it's not so much cloudy. But I'm I'm happy to answer all the questions and and I just am conscientious. We have twelve more minutes, so oh, don't it, worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if that's where you want to go with the conversation, I'm happy to address it. Yeah, I'm just curious. Quickly, I'm just curious how it compares to what. what yeah. So about. so what was shared uh, with you all yesterday is an exact reflection of what's happening at the senior center this week. Uh, and and next week and was the week prior and the week prior. Um, so it literally is maintaining status quo and it's supporting those activities that are currently happening in that space, um, just the way they've been supported um, since at least October. The center on Mondays and Fridays has only been open if a volunteer opens the center. So not 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 a goal. She hasn't been there. Nicole has never staffed it. It was Blake Getchell, and she resigned at some point back in the fall. And when that happened, the town made these some of these decisions to no longer staff on Mondays and Fridays. They have volunteers who open, but typically they only open from 10 to 12 while they play Mahjong, and then they close up. So it's not, everything is exactly how. Right. So like if you guys said, that plan you put out, Brad, is garbage, we're going to stick with the town starting January 1. They would be exactly like what I proposed in that memo yesterday. Is there not? I thought that there was cribbage on Wednesday. And again, based on the conversation that was that was held, we said we were going to maintain their games. There's there's not <laughs> cribbage on Wednesday. Okay. I thought they were they were doing something from 10 to 2 on Wednesdays. No. So, and um some of that operational but we can, can certainly continue this conversation for what we do with the seniors in the rest of fy24 um the one other comment i want to just make on this concept of dropping the full-time position in fy24 is just a note that that will look like an increase uh, sorry dropping the full-time in fy25 will look like an increase in fy26 just that will always happen when we're um, not fully funding in the in FY24. But I think you are, make a great point that it is true we are unlikely to hire that full time person off the bat in FY25. Um, yeah, we probably had this discussion, but I'm old and I forget. Fourth uh, of July. Memorial Day Parade. Mm -hmm. The concept of using sponsorships, donations to fund as opposed to using general fund money. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? It's an area that we've we've been working on. The I'm not sure if we could ever get it to fully sponsored. Yeah. Um, that July 4th event at this point is pushing $30,000 given its location and all of the things that go into it. 
So um, it, it was last budget cycle that we finally put 10,000 into the general fund to support that yeah. uh, event. And uh, otherwise it was always just supported in the program fund. Um, the parade is a combination of that budgeted amount and sponsorship. And they get almost the same amount from sponsorship as what's allocated to 7,500. Um, so that's a pretty decent balance there. And if you recall, that used to be in the town general yep. fund and has transferred over to the city. Yep. Okay. I mean, we've talked about the fireworks and talked about charging admission for non-city residents. Hmm. I think that would just create a bottleneck that would I'm kind of curious. Do you know what Burlington does by any chance? I tried to look and their budget is so late. All over the place that I just couldn't figure out whether they were actually budgeting. That they probably spend more than thirty thousand dollars on theirs. I think but... the fireworks are alone are, are over thirty thousand. Yeah. Whereas ours are about fifteen right now. Okay. Um. So I think their fireworks alone breaks that budget. But you don't know if they budget themselves or if they're getting donations or anything like that. I don't. Do we pay for the last food? fireworks? Said something. You're just reminding me of this right now. Like two fireworks were the name of a company. Yes. Yeah. Oh, interesting. No, not the fireworks. The what are the things? The drones. drones. Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay. Do we pay for the CBE to be there? We do, and we just pay their direct costs. Um, <laughs> so you know, otherwise, the argument is those workers would be home. Um, there's trash that needs to be taken out. There's a lot of stuff that we need to take down. So okay. we just get billed for their direct costs. That's just a small curiosity question. How much is the um, annual maintenance of Memorial Park? Do you know? It's it's lumped in with. Um, yeah, I know that was mentioned in um, the parks piece. I I don't have an estimate that's on curious. that cost. I've I've asked for this a couple times in the past, and I just would love to find out an estimate for repairing Memorial Park. And replacing the concrete with marble. It was concrete to begin with because they couldn't, those lines club couldn't afford marble. And now it's all crumbled and the liner of the fountain is pulled out and it's kind of a mess. I seem to remember during separation negotiations, um, that's still being a shared expense with the town, like a willingness to share that. I'm not imagining it uh, I, because it honors. Mm -hmm. They're, they're a, right. a town-wide memorial, basically, town citywide now memorial. I, so, I just want to understand yeah. how much it might cost to fix that. No, I, I agree. And I'm not saying that we need to add find that out and then add it to the budget. I'm not a fan <laughs> of the that we can figure out a fundraiser to get that fixed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. With the maintenance of parks in general, um, we have that penny uh, on the tax rate for parks, if you will, which is a penny of taxes to parks. Um, if we were to think about parks broadly, and as we are facing that 7.1% tax increase, if we were to look at taking, say, uh, about half of what was currently used for EJRP capital to use for, say, Main Street Park or other park purposes, what would that do uh, broadly to your capital plan? For this year or moving into the future? Let's just do this year because that's more probably easier. Well, um, or do you want to think about it? Since that was mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, right now that I can, I can just run down because you don't really have an itemized list. Forty-seven thousand for the playground payback, which is the final year. Um, Ten thousand five hundred for a new truck. Um, Fourteen thousand for a new mower. Seventy-five hundred for a line painter. 15,000 is paying off an extra drainage bill to, from in between the buildings and then a new diving board and landscaping. So I guess, you know, take your pick of those eight or 10 items that I listed. Um, those non loan repayback or non lease payback things. Yeah. So that's uh, 47, 57, 63 of the 120. So that's, or the 112. So, um, <laughs> so then there's about 50 allocated for. Truck zero turn and line painter, uh, diving board landscaping. Cool. 
where you thought you were going to go is how you knew our capital plan is grossly under <laughs> for the number of and, and, you know, I, I do say in jest, but also not so you know and we've had a little bit of conversation about the condition of the cascade courts um that they are are beyond repair the maple street tennis courts are no prettier um maple street basketball court and skate park there are some some decent infrastructure you know this penny on the capital this penny for capital um, has obviously helped us to maintain a lot in the parks and make some nice investments too. Um, but just as you know, going through the general capital for the entire city, if you went through all of the park assets, we really aren't putting away an adequate amount every year to maintain the park assets into the future. And so we are going to add some choices at some time soon, some real choices of like, okay, we either we either need to rebuild those cascade courts or we just need to uh, like up the communities up in arms, just saying. Yeah. And <laughs> and so, you know, Ask me how I know. we can, you know, we've been able to chip away at some things and um and make a sacrifice for that playground over five years, but to replace the cascade courts at 325,000 like you know, absolutely at the exact I don't disagree with you. At yeah. the exact same time, also hearing from our other portions of the community of paying a million dollars for EGRP administration and parks, is that the, the right amount that we should be spending for our community? And I don't disagree that we did, that we need to have that uh, services, but mm -hmm. there's always the other side of the coin. Sure. And and just with that other side side of the coin, I, I just want to continue to reiterate there's a lot in here that has we've not asked for and it's kind of and we're happy to help and manage we're happy to take on buildings and manage those services but but there's that's there's dollars in here to do that we're happy to take on senior services and the Essex area senior center there's dollars in here associated with that i didn't ask for those you know the council management has all asked to continue supporting the Essex area senior center and everybody you know so a lot of the things you've seen in our budget over the last two years are not asks of me. And I, I remember telling Jess and Regina at some point, like, I don't want people raising their hands saying, well, we just gave AGRP another program director. That that was not from, you know, I'm not the one who's been asking for those things. I'm just happy to take them on. Um, but I do think there's a difference there. Yeah. Do you have, does your team have what you need in order to again thinking about the revenue side of things because there are these particular projects that, we, that have been mentioned here is there opportunity either with grant uh, with grant funding and private partnerships that that we could potentially do but don't have the man to try to seek out those opportunities i'm just wondering for it um, yeah, I mean, I think there's always room for more attention to to seeking grants, and that that's something that's hard for us to find time to do at the moment. Um, and sponsorship takes a lot of time. Um, I think we're we're pretty good overall in terms of staffing and where budget levels and those things are at. Um, I think the harder part is going to be these big lifts, these big Cascade tennis courts, Maple Street tennis courts. Uh, consideration of the gym facility as many communities around us are are building and constructing those. Um, those are going to be some some bigger questions for you all in the community. Do we ever see the budget for the enterprise fund for like all the camps and everything? Do we see that separately? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, you just shared a link to those, didn't you? It's in the Excel file. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. They are not, there's still some work to be done because I've got personnel costs to match up. Brad and I were trying to come up with a better system of like housing all of that data in one place. Mm -hmm. um, so enterprise funds, EGRP, along with water, wastewater, yeah. and sanitation will be presented later. Okay. All right. Brad, can you do this just for just sort of for folks who may watch this later? I don't think we have anybody on meeting right now. Can you explain how your budgets are particularly complex? Let's just call it that between the enterprise funds, program fund, all the other parks and administration. 
Can you sort of explain quickly how all of that comes together? What's what's included in the administration budget? What's included in what in the uh, parks and facilities? How does that differ from the programs that are in the enterprise fund, like the child care and everything else that's sort of self-sustaining? Sure. And how does that tie back into these? Yeah, just real quick. So the general fund, um, we have three major pots of money. One is administration, one is parks and facilities, the other is the capital plan. Um, for administration, we have six full-time employees in there who, um, you know, generally speaking, I, I think of it as providing the overhead of EJRP. So it's a person that answers the phones, it's the person that does the business stuff in the back office, it's myself, the assistant director, a program director, and the senior programs person. So those six people. Um, and uh, and then in parks and facilities, we have two full-time people um, and then the part-time folks that it takes to just maintain our parks and facilities throughout the city. Um, in the capital fund, uh, I'd have to go back on an exact year, but at some point there was a vote for uh, a penny for parks. And we've just honored that um, for many, many years, over a dozen years of just continuing to, to use that number as it's about $113,000 um, to support capital projects for parks and facilities. Outside of the general fund, we have an enterprise fund that we call the program fund. Uh, in the program fund, we have eight, uh, 17 full-time employees. So 17 um, in the program fund, eight in the general fund. Um, and the program fund is obviously self-sustaining. So all of the revenues that come in from all of our different programs, childcare, the pool, uh, preschool, um, all of those come in and all of our expenses then for those programs, as well as many of our community events comes out of there. Um, and that is a revolving fund. So if there's any residual money that that's left over at the end of the year, it can be reinvested in parks and facilities and programs. And do those enterprise funds contribute back to capital or percentages back to some of these other things we needed? Uh, what they really do is alleviate some burdens on general fund expenses or capital things. So what we've done, you know, I was talking earlier that non-personnel costs in the administration budget are down 17%. It's because we've been moving things over to program fund as often as we can. So we used to pay for, for example, for our rec track software um, where people can register and it houses all of our programs and all of that. We used to pay for that out of the general fund last year. This year it's moved into the program fund. And so what we've done over time is we just keep trying to move as much as we can. Um, we've gotten pretty darn close um, to getting as much out as possible. Um, you know, we're at $43,000 in the general fund of non-personnel costs, um, other than the new senior monies that we've allocated. So 63 total um, out of that 797 is non-personnel. It's really just about the personnel to support the level of programming that we have in this community. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. You talk a little bit about the REC Advisory Committee and the administration budget. What is the plan for implementing that? The plan so far has been to wait to see which committees actually come out of the strategic planning process in terms of what's a priority for this community and doing more. And, but is it dependent upon, like if the strategic planning results say people are, that's not part of the thing that people say they they want to see right away, but it is something that we're planning for. Should we be implementing it anyway if it doesn't become a high priority from the strategic planning process? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, um, you know, we have it's an interesting group of committees that we have thus far, um, and some of them are very specific. Some of them do very broad work, um, and I think that. What I'm hoping to see from the strategic planning committee is just a, a level of um, interest priority in, in terms of like sort of where these buckets are. And is there some thought or some thinking about what is our new committee structure going forward? Mm -hmm. um, um, so, but I think it, I think it's a good question. I think our budget is accounting for the potential of three new committees. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in FY24, we have that as well. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that if something becomes clear from the strategic planning process and we want to move forward on it, we, we can do that. And I think, uh, to your point, even outside of that process, um, if the council wants to set up any committee, it's completely within your purview to do it. 
Um, so if it's important to you that you do a rec advisory um, committee because the community has asked for that or for whatever reason, even if it's not a priority in the strategic planning process, it doesn't mean that yeah. you don't do it if that's something you want to do. Yeah, I just kind of had the impression that that was something that we felt needed to be implemented regardless of the strategic planning process and mm -hmm. that we were going to also wait and see what the community had to say, but that that particular committee was going to happen. That was my understanding. I may have that incorrect, um, but I I would be interested in seeing that move forward. And I was just wondering if how that how and when that was going to happen. Yeah. So after strategic planning, was, yeah, perfectly fine answer. And we've just been waiting, kind of in the wings, Elaine, for direction or response to, hey, can you come up with something, draft something, whatever it is, you know. Just in my tenure at EJRP, we've we've had an advisory committee for longer than we haven't, and so it's a welcomed and and a normal part of our of our daily operations and business. So it's just a matter of when you all provide the guidance to proceed, then we're ready to go. I mean, the funding's there. I, it's a lot. I know there's work. I, I don't want. <laughs> Like the funding's there, I would I would like to see that happen, but I don't want that just because Elaine said she wants to see it happen. I was expecting it. <laughs> I was expecting to see it and had been wondering where it was, and so um, yeah, I would I think that our community wants to see that. If it's something that's already you know in your mind that's going to come forward, great. That would be great. It'd be great to return to that model. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the interest of keeping things on track, is there any other, anything else from Brad? It's Brad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Brad. Thank you, 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 <laughs> I said Amber's going to make me apologize for four more minutes, and then we're going to be really late. Come on up, put on the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he wants to wear the hat. <laughs> Marcus brought that for everybody. All right. Okay. Page 55 in your uh, PDF packet. Um, so um, the notable changes in this um, budget are um, we reduced the revenue to be more in line with what we're actually seeing in this current fiscal year. So Susan can speak to that a little bit more if you'd like. Um, and so the election expenses are going to change from one year to the next, depending on how many elections we've got. So in FY25, we're going to have um, fewer elections than we'll have in FY24. So that, that has come down. Um, anything you want to add, point out? Uh, I don't think so. It, it, the, um, yeah, the 24 estimates were based on approximately 40% of what the town was doing. And it's things of, sometimes things change, like markets change and land record reportings change. I haven't seen a lot of recordings lately, so. Quiet. So uh, that, that affects that revenue quite a bit. Um, other than that, the one thing that did go down in expenses was the cost of our land record recording program because we've got a contract that it's a lot less than what I was paying over the town. So. Susan, is the $11 per page, is that what our take is out of instead of the 15? Right. Okay. Right, because the four dollars goes to records preservation. Okay. Um, so it's your question about digitization. Yeah. Like earlier. Yeah. Did into that? It does. And before I forget the other question, do you know if there's any been any discussion at the town clerk level about changing that fifteen dollars? Because it's been like that for years now, and I'm kind of curious if. Yeah, it changed. Changed like sometime in the last seven, seven years. Yeah, it years definitely seven, changed seven, when I was. Yeah. yeah. But um, but uh, I don't think anyone's. I haven't started heard of anything right now. We okay. get a lot of pushback when that happens mm -hmm. from the attorneys. You know how they are. Mm -hmm. They do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's this fine balance of of 
looking at, you know, like the use of the bulk with it's great to have the technology yeah. to be able to look online and, and do all of your searches online, but it does, it does decrease this other. And so there is talk amongst um, at the last county clerk's meeting, people were talking about um setting up to charge people to look online. Yep. And we don't have that with our system. Well, we don't even have our records online yet. Yeah. Pushing for them, but it hasn't happened yet. But uh, because for some purposes, it's, I mean, it's if they look online and then they pay for the copies that they need, that's good because that's revenue there. But they're all, sometimes they're doing the screenshots with the watermark on it yeah. and getting the information off of that for what they need. Yes. So that's. Um, yeah, losing money. Can't yeah, confirm or deny that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that Elaine was talking about, as I mentioned to Chris, that looking at the fee, stru fee structure for South Burlington, they charge a digitization fee in whatever fee they're charging. So I'm looking at their zoning. So when you go and pull a permit um, or like a certificate of compliance that's then getting recorded in the land records, they're charging 20 bucks plus a $10 digitization. Did, you know what I mean? <laughs> it is late. Wow. And, and I mean, I'm just making up numbers here, but there is some component where you're actually being able to recover, I would assume, the fees of having to pay for these subscription costs and stuff. Oh. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I know that there's a couple of blanks here on the the records preservation i'm assuming those are kind of a wash anyways because you're gonna yeah, the revenue component i'm not recognizing the revenue expense yeah because incurred yeah okay yeah so i'm just saying but as far as the like for pulling permits the applicant is charged the recording fee by the time they do the permit but we've never done anything beyond that yeah yeah it's something that i just mentioned to him to, to take a look at just to try to recover some of our some of our expenses, honestly. Um, and then the only other question that I had was, I was kind of curious about the resident-only parking permits. Do we charge for those? We don't. No. Who's getting them? There's an ordinance that, um, it's mostly the neighborhoods near the high school. And that started when the high school started charging the kids to park, or, I'm sorry, the students or parking permits at the high school. I don't know if they still do that. But, okay. um, when they started charging students to have permits to park in the high school parking lot, then <laughs> neighborhoods near the high school were getting people parking on their streets or leaving trash. They didn't like all this. So the trustees at the time instituted a ordinance for uh, resident on the park. So it's there, and it's also on old Colchester Road and like a soccer field. I think there's another spot too. Okay. We might be talking about other spots. Huh. Okay. All right. So that's that's how that was, and I used to I always used to do those permits in house and mail them out. And the last few years, it's been time crunching. Yeah. I finally figured out that I can hire somebody. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess if it's an ordinance, it doesn't make sense to backfill the charge for it, but. I guess that's a question we can talk about later. I'm good. I do have a question. Were you looking at one point in time into having the uh, passport capability here? Yeah, I still have that in the back of my head. That is a good income source. Um, I can't remember exactly what you get. You get a, almost $20 per uh, passport if you do the uh, processing in your office and more if you do the pictures, mm -hmm. you charge for pictures. So, um, yeah, yes. that should be something I can no. be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was shocked when I went and got by the post and asking them how much they yeah. made a year. It was shocking. Mm -hmm. um, a little odd. Well, um, they're one of the only games in town. Yeah. There is a restriction with um, having access to vital records. And so, one of there's only two of us in the clerk's office. So, one of us might have to give up. The access to the vital records in order to be able to process the passports. Interesting. Hmm. I don't have any other questions. Yeah. Anybody else is? I do have one question. Sure. So the fifteen thousand under um, election expenses does that include mailing out ballots? 
I'm going to assume that there's an assumption. Yeah. Yes. Um, school district pays for most of the mailing since they're valid. Okay. It does say postage. Well, I, I guess I'm starting to get confused because I was like, no valid cost. Some postage. Some postage. And I was like, yeah, try to yeah. understand exactly what's all incorporated in that. We tried, um, Marcus, we tried to list it by election because right. each election, the costs are different. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's confusing. It's a lot of no. words in one place. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm going to assume... Should we have a discuss, separate discussion? Not right now, but have a separate discussion about whether or whether or we should or should not mail ballots. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So you have to, if I understand correctly, you have to make that decision. We had to make officially make that decision last year. So each I think year, that's yeah. each year you have to make that decision. So you will have that conversation. Um, and before this budget is finalized, so that way we can adjust it. Okay. If a decision were to change. So the this includes the concept of mailing ballots, but it really is heavily cost shared with the school. So it's not a huge cost in your general fund budget because of that combination. Now, if we get ourselves into a situation in the future where the town moves to town meeting day, but the junction stays on April, yeah, that relationship will not exist. School. The school, school moves. Moves. Yeah. The school moves. Yeah. What did I say? You said town. town. We know what you meant. What yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe. I believe from what I've heard, the school does intend to have it on their ballot. Yeah. This next ballot for voter approval to move it to town meeting day. Obviously, we as a council have the authority to move it if they would pass that without getting. The additional voter approval. So. so at the moment, as a council, you don't have that authority. Um, at the moment, the legislative charter changes that we uh, were approved by the voters last year that would give the council authority to make that change on your own oh, is not finalized yet. Gotcha. Yeah. The boss is busy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, go off with busy. That's a great voice. Um, <laughs> well, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. End of the day, it's just getting right. punchy. Getting punchy at the end of the day. But anyway, just making that point clear. I think we're all hoping to stay on the same page here, but yeah. just want to make it clear what's actually going in the book. Yeah. Great. The school district is also pretty committed to continuing to mail ballots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By statute, they have to request to us. To, to right? you. Yeah. You have to give them, you have to give them permission. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, Okay. Okay. So now we are here at economic development. That's page fifty seven in your PDF packet. Um so uh, my note in the narrative is just generally speaking, we basically tried to cut this back, acknowledging the 7% um, proposal that you've got in front of you. Um, we have uh, a, lots of different things have kind of gone on in this budget over time. And like I said, we're still kind of in a transition process of figuring out exactly what, uh, what we're doing in here. Um, and so we kind of, at this point, cut a good amount of this back. We still have 15000 in there for a community event. Um, like you mentioned earlier, we also have heard quite a bit about the um, block party concept, that it seems like people it really liked the block party. Um, and uh, we have had matching grant funds also over the years here. We haven't used those over the last couple of years. Um, so looking to cut that back 
Last year, we kept it in there and had the note that we could sort of move that into the um, Amtrak pool of money if it's not used. Um, so that's what's going on in there. If we put the 10,000, the strategic, we reduce that to 10,000. Could we just, I mean, that, and we would talk about potentially using that for a community event instead of having the 15 and eliminating the 15. Um, Say that just again, throwing it out. Yeah. So the time we, we said we're going to get rid of the, the full 50 that we put in the strategic planning line item. Yep. So it's 10. Mm -hmm. If we use that 10, we talked about also potentially using that 10 for a community event related to the strategic planning. Do we need the 15? Is mm -hmm. my point. Can we just eliminate that 15 and use the 10? I mean, if we do something like a block party too, again, I think we do need to have this conversation about donations and sponsorships and all this other stuff too. Um, yeah, for the UIOB kind of thing, you know, events, whatever. Um, that would be my my position is to just remove the 15 without having an identified uh, event. That would pretty much mean that anything coming out of the strategic plan would then have to wait until FY26. We put 10 in. We did keep 10. But if we then take 15 out, it's a net of negative five. Huh? I know it's 3.30 <laughs> in the afternoon, but, <laughs> well, but we're keeping We started with 25 combined for. Right. That technically it looks like we started with 20, we started with seven, seven? 65. Yeah. Right. Right. 65, right. To begin with, yeah. we're, you're suggesting taking out just think it's him. But you have no you have no event. Like you have no event and, and to try to plan a block party between now and then is probably not gonna happen anyways. Like well this for FY25. I know. Right. Um we I mean it it seems real to me, but we also could not do these things, but it seems real to me in FY25 that we might have something that might cost something out of the strategic planning process. And I think we want a community event. I mean, community but, dinner alone next fiscal year, if we go back to a dinner and provide food, I mean, that's probably five. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that, that alone um, would eat half of what's left. Just in, by thinking this through, right? So I, I think if we want to do the, the block party, the out and about, those kinds of things, we need to keep the 15 that's in here. If we want to do something that from the strategic planning, we need to keep that 10,000 in there. I thought we talked about not doing out about. That's why we, we removed it. We didn't do it this year. I mean, it started as an economic development assist during COVID when yeah. businesses were pretty much gone. Right. And I I, I question with everything else going on. That that specific event, providing money back to businesses at this point. Um, I just use that as a type. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. Type yeah. of events. Yeah. That's what the fifteen thousand would be for in here. The, right. The community event would be that. Whatever event you want to call it. So let me flip it the other way. What did we spend fifteen thousand dollars on this year? Well, we spent fifty something on a strategic planning process. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we did. Right. What was the uh, What was the independence celebration? Anybody remember what that cost us? That was essentially a massive. Well, I've never seen no, that many people downtown. Actually, you just left. Yeah. yeah. That, that was a one off. Yeah, that was a real one off. Oh sure, <laughs> but I mean. So we haven't done a block party on railroad in like five or six months. years. Yeah. Yep. Well, and one of the reasons why was because the popularity had steadily decreased, the cost had steadily increased, and it was yep. turning out that it was not a lot of Essex Junction right. residents attending mm -hmm. this event. Yeah. And yeah. It, well, yeah. just like Pumpkin Palooza, I mean, you know, every it felt like when we were standing there for that hour and a half or two hours, every it was only every fourth person. It was a fifth person. It was a well. I would, say, I would say there's a big difference between block party and pumpkin palooza in terms of the demographic that comes. Yeah, I just feel like you know we're mm -hmm. we have a list of, of events now we're putting on. Can I ask them more? Serving serving a greater population in the city is just something that well, right? We're not going to fix today. I mean, I can talk about what it was like. Um. So the at the at the penny that funds this particular page is actually mixed into the general fund. So that, that penny doesn't support this page. This is this not is the, part of the general fund budget, correct? 
the penny is the economic development fund that's the, right now the crescent connector costs on us maple street park and got it no main street park sorry you got that. It was very confusing and the amtrak station okay yeah um we spent about seventy four hundred dollars on the city celebration because okay. we paid for that with our own money so i have that <laughs> i wonder if it's worth but I, i'm with amber on the, the 20 that's in here um or the 15 i don't know um i'm wondering if it's worth it to put a pause on this particular budget until we decide what our economic development activity is going to be yeah. in the community. And like, we have a conversation about, are we going to do a downtown committee? Are we going to do an EDC? Or like, I wonder if we could, it, would it hurt if we didn't spend this money this year, this upcoming budget year, if one year? And think about what economic development means. What's $30,000 is that? It's not going to create new business opportunities. It's, it's not. not going to. We're just talking it. about parties. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, and that was part of my intent about community events should be in community developments. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm, yeah. I feel like we're kind of all over the place. I have. I just noticed. I have a note to myself from when I read this binder. Is it need more structure around this budget? Who's responsible? It's a catch-all for ComDev. Yeah. Communications admin, admin and capital. So it's like it's kind of all over the place. So maybe you could put a pause on this entire line item and sure. not, not spend it, but plan for it going forward. I will. I, so I want to throw out one idea, and this came up in other previous discussions. If if we wanted to find a way to bring back, say, like the farmer's market. I see that as an economic development kind Absolutely. of activity. Absolutely. That to me is like the kind of thing that yes. I would use this one. I don't need, I don't think we need all this money for that. But that is something I'd rather do sooner rather than later. So there is a portion of me that goes, that would fit this. You want to bring the farmer's market back sooner rather than later? Yeah. Yeah. Any idea how much? I'm sorry. That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> So I just please. So and the answer yeah. is no, but that's why I'm bringing it up right. so that it can be discussed. I don't yeah, know I mean, this that... is the appropriate time for that, but it is the kind of thing that I'm thinking about right. when I look at this. That, that's why I want to say even more. We need to pause. Yeah, let's, let's, I think we've got so much on our yeah, plate already. That is start. such a huge undertaking, yeah. Marcus. And I say that because I was one of the founders of the last one. And, and it yeah. just was massive. This so, is uh, this is the first day we're talking about it. So let's yeah. add this to the list to remove. Yeah. Let's um, and let's come back later with, you know, talking about a timeline for strategic planning. I mean, if there's an initial read early enough in January um, from that process, we can get from Ashley and the committee yeah. that says, "Hey, look, it looks like this is going to be something that that we can do." Then maybe we can put a little bit back into that. Yeah. Um, but for the time being, I think. Leaving, so we're saying leave the 10 in the other and kill this. Yeah. 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 Is is or are there any uh things that this budget went to in 22 or 23 that's by getting rid of it, we're gonna regret later? It went to out and about block party. That's those are the two areas. And okay. then what was the one that we did with Trump that we found? Um yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the right yeah. thinking of. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's the one that we thought of this fall and just sort of looked at it and said, this didn't seem to make no sense right now. And let's figure out what else we should do. Um, I don't know what appropriations to other agencies have been in the past. I don't know what that is. Um, so we can we can just look at that. It may be that that's just moved to either county budget or health and human services. I think it is it's moved to other to the county budget, but I can pull the details. Right? Historically, I want to say this was sort of Robin's um, Robin's budget for things like CCRPC dues. Um, yeah, yeah. Him, yeah. But that's a cost. Yeah. I mean, if anything, I'd love to see this money turn <laughs> well. We, we didn't get to we didn't get to do anything about you know the kind of um, <clears throat> service organization funding that kind of yes. you know and I 
but I really feeling that this year, even because it occurs to me that even with the budget pressures, I hate doing this, I don't mean it on any of us, even with all the budget pressures the town felt, they still managed to pull off that event. Um, I don't know how they did it, I don't know if they funded it, I don't know the details to it. I don't think that means we have to do it, but I'd rather almost see if we can. Well, this isn't here for see see the program when we're looking to start a program that goes out to nonprofits, human service agencies that operate in the city. Or maybe what we need more importantly than that without getting this road is funding organizations that will help us with the situation around all this grant this morning before we do that. I think but, I, I would love out of the, the result of this particular conversation is for our residents to hear that we are pressing pause on some things mm -hmm. because we recognize how expensive stuff is mm -hmm. and we want to get it right going forward mm -hmm. and that we are pausing investment in stuff so that we can get their priorities and then make a map to follow. And so next year, folks, you you will can expect to see economic development expenses happening, but in a more orchestrated and specific way. Mm -hmm. I, I would love the optics of what this discussion has been to be shared with the community because it's important. I think we just made an important decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Then we've got health and human services. Um, this we sort of looked at before because that's the got the police budget in it. Um, also in here you have Essex Rescue. Um, and and I ask a question about the cemetery. Yes. So last year they asked us for twenty thousand dollars. Yep. Uh, we gave them twenty thousand dollars and allocated that. Um, do we need to do it again this year? Did they send a formal request this year? So they haven't. And I thought on occasion about reaching out. Um, so the last time I talked with them about this, uh, because they invited me to their annual meeting after we did this 20,000 to thank us for that. And, but their ask really would be more and will the city <laughs> take over maintenance of the cemeteries? Well, isn't that required? Because now that we're no longer a village of the town, the cemetery like my understanding was that the village of a town had to have its cemeteries maintained by its town but once there was a certain capacity reached or a certain level or maybe if we separated we're now our own municipality it's all ours to take care of and it's not theirs to take care of anymore I'm, I'm very I curious it's a statutory responsibility as well. yeah I'm there's sure. this weird thing about if you're a village your town gets it but then there's a, a point where it's not the town anymore and so we're the fallback where it basically is the nonprofit that's that's serving or the organization that's serving as a caretaker for a cemetery can no longer do what it goes to the municipality to take care of okay but now that we're a separate municipality it's on us it's on us mm -hmm. and so are we saying that we're giving them twenty thousand a year to take care of ours because we don't have a cemetery commission? Is that what's happening? This here? is our cemetery this commission. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they um, have been struggling and 20,000 does not cover their budget. And it will, my understanding, if we were to take it over, um, 20,000 is not enough for us to take it over either. So 20,000 was a good, helpful way to help patch them through last and year. them is the town cemetery committee or do wow. we have our own now we've well, always had our own right the village as far as i know they only i think they only serve the two cemeteries in the city mm -hmm. okay yeah. i don't know that i've ever seen a list of people who were on this i've never i never knew we had our own they're a separate entity, so that it's a separate non it's, it's it's not a municipal organization no. correct yeah Got it. Okay. And who who are they? Fairview Cemetery Association yeah. is their name, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same people. The one right here by the auto place, yeah. and then and the one by the, the yeah on Lincoln. Yeah. Huh. It's a good number of people. There was maybe like ten or yeah ten ish people around the table. Is that who they are? Yeah. 
It's not the one on Lincoln. That one's by Holy Family. That's Holy Family. This, okay. But the one on Old Colchester is also part of it. Oh, it is. Side. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, dissolution of cemeteries. A whole another group of people I had no idea existed. I yeah. seriously thought that it was the town yeah. and the town sexton and all that. My goodness. Yep. Who yep. Knew? So, uh, Amber, to your question. Yeah. They have not officially asked for anything. And I have not asked specifically, but kept in this 20,000 specific. Yeah. Just put a pen, put it in the parking lot for now and talk about it at the time, I guess. Circle back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the more we talk, the more we, to be clear, the more we talk about it, the more expensive this line gets. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Next. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we still need to know what they spent it on. No, and I mean, so moving on. Yeah. Yeah. We did. We did actually give them the twenty. They they've already collected the twenty thousand for this year. It's in the it's in the expenses we've seen. Yes. So, is there a report that happens in the annual or like an annual report budget that they sub? Uh, Annual report report that, that mm -hmm. they put in. Um, we haven't seen anything with the hours. You know, I, I, yeah, I'm no. sorry. I hate to say it, but I want to talk more about that just so I can see what they're spending and who they are and what when they meet. And it reminds me of the, uh, you know, wants and needs are on the tree farm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like what kind of information do we know? Oh my goodness. News is I don't think the county and regional I don't think we can do anything with any of these. No, nope. these last two count uh, these yes. last two costs and these are all. Yeah, I would actually say let's just write CBSD entirely. We get yeah. nothing from them. Yep. There's thirty-seven fifty. Okay. Yeah. So you've been waiting all afternoon to say that. I have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think Regina died. <laughs> so CCRPC Sorry. last week. We had uh, the executive committee had a conversation because they were asked, EBIBC was asking CCRPC for a work plan of all the projects. And we were going through this plan and we're like, is it, couldn't we have just sent them the UPW pay? First of all, was our first question. But we got into it, it devolved into a conversation where multiple members who would sit on boards across the county were like, what the hell do we need GBIC for? And so there's like four different people from different towns that were upset with GBIC. Well, it's an interesting because they're applying for some special economic development yeah. designation or yeah. not that they're, what was it? An authority. Authority. Yeah. For the so, county. For the county. So in our response to, in CCRPC's response to the request for um, this new plan that they want from CCRPC, we insisted that they include our comments. And I even sent them the minutes from our meeting where we talked to the chair. And I shared with them that when he said, well, we asked them if they would please add more diversity to their board. And the answer was, well, we have some women. And everyone just cracked up. I mean, so like there is general dissatisfaction throughout Chittenden County with GBIC. They are focused entirely on Burlington mm -hmm. and the wants and needs of their board. So. Well, I think when you can't identify because of confidentiality reasons what, what you're doing, I mean that's a pretty yeah, exactly. that's a state yeah. thing though. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, whole other yeah, yeah. I mean, and the whole thing where what when there's when some I, way around that. Yeah. There's got to be. I mean, like if you're trying to sell it to us that we're giving you money, like we need to know a little bit about how. What are you doing for me, kind of? Deal. But that's because all they do is pass through state funds. Yeah. So they were saying, oh, we gave bars and hairdressers money this time around. Like, yeah, I know what you did because that application went through ACCD, yeah. and yeah. you did nothing. You did nothing. They were just a pass through. <clears throat> gotcha. And the other secrecy yeah. part is veggie. Mm -hmm. They're deeply involved in veggie, yeah. and. ACCB like cannot will not ever share any data from that program. It's like the one thing I agree with Doug Hopper. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little crass. So I was a little crass in saying let's cut GBIC. I'm wondering if as somebody who has worked with GBIC, <laughs> uh, I'm yeah, sorry. Information that you could add as to why that would bring value to us as a community. I said that all out loud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look. It, it's <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. It's it's 
it's really, really difficult. I mean, I think my understanding, but I don't know any of this for, for sure, but my understanding is Frank Coffey and GBIC pretty instrumental in trying to help keep Global Foundries IBM here over, over the years. Um, and they might be doing a lot more going on with Global Foundries than I'm aware of, again, because they can't necessarily tell us what, what's happening. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they are a good um, partner at the regional level. Um, but I, I hear you because many municipalities do indeed feel this same way. And it's, you know, I told Sam last year, I prepped Sam this year, you send us this letter with this table with acronyms and numbers that don't mean anything to anybody. And the, we got to have a bet. There's got to be a better um, output stream here, and it it doesn't do anything. And at the same time, it's three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, so, like, I say that only because um, I just don't know. Um, it it is a significant dollar amount to us when we're in a position when we're trying to figure out how to make our budget work. Um, collectively, I think it's a decent amount of money for them. Individually, it seems like a small amount of money, but collectively, countywide, I think it adds up to. Um, it, it will have some impact to them, certainly for sure. Um, Could we propose that we give them the same amount that we give the chamber, the two organizations that serve the businesses in Chittenden County? I I I, well, I mean, because I'm trying to <laughs> reckon, like, like when you started talking about CCTV, like maybe we should shift to Media Factory. Like, I'm the chair of the CCTV board, and I'm like, crap, that's not good, right? So I can understand when one municipality pulls their support, that's a problem. Um, but we are unhappy, mm -hmm. and I know there's also some sensitivity from way back. They've poached a few businesses from Essex Junction and sent them to Milton, and. That's ages ago, water under the bridge, but it's still there. I mean, I, I'd agree to 500 today and replacing it, hitting our next part of our discussion at the next couple budget meetings. We're talking you know, about creating our own EDC. Right. And so it we, is, yeah. know, they, do, they do service our largest employer and they are actually a resident, uh, you know, employer in our city. So I want to be sensitive to the fact that that's not a great look, regardless of how I feel about it. You know, it's not funding. I'm certain global gets more than 3750 back to the efforts of GBIC. So I guess the only thing that I other things that I would add in here is um, their total revenue in 2022 was 856,000. Um, so the 3,000 is kind of peanuts mm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. They ended the year 33,000 in profit. Previous year was 220,000 in profit. Uh, Similar to the comment about how the town of Milton pays 170,000 for their manager, um, and nothing for the CJC services that we cover for them. Correct. Uh, Frank is apparently a 20-hour per week person, making 195. What? So. Okay, I'm not going with 500 either. Sorry. <laughs> and I think there's ways that they could find that 3,000 dollars. And, and this could be a one time we're making a point. Perhaps they say, "Wait, what?" Essex Junction doesn't want to pay us. Why? And they might come talk to us and have a more substantive conversation than the one we had with their chair on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Well, I did say I'd support them this year. I have to wait and see on that. So I'll just leave what I said earlier and all of a sudden because I don't want to go against my word. Like, I'm fine yeah. striking it out. Okay. Zeroing it out. That's up to you. That's, gonna, that's fine. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll keep my suggestion of 500 if you want to go in. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I have a <laughs> and I just heard Ron Burgundy's voice in my head. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, based on based on my, I, I don't have to get into all my reasons, but I, I believe based on the things that I've heard, based on some other feedback, I, I am supportive of moving this to zero. Um, I. Though I, you know, I come back to another point where this reflects an economic development here. Sometimes I wonder if we don't need somebody on staff 
that specifically does this work. We're going to need to see first, and then it's going to be desperately known that we need a stabber. Sorry. No, I, I, I confessed to Regina a couple of weeks ago that, like, since I was a baby trustee, I've been wanting this a position it, and an EDC. It seems like a staff, it seems like a staff position that, that um, we don't have in this particular budget, but I, I see here. I mean, I will say as right now, one of the participants, you know, we as a community are participating, I'm participating in the conversation around the tech hub. Boy, it'd be really nice if we had an economic development partner, let alone a staff member to also assist in this particular process, because that mm -hmm. attention and focus would be really helpful. Um, so that's that's the project I'm, I'm thinking about. And boy, it would be nice if, based on what I know of GBIC, if they were that partner, great. This would be a perfect type of project for them to work on. Mm -hmm. But the, right now, they're not part of that process. Right. So I'm yeah, seeing more pressures from the social services end on our community right now. That too. Economic development end, in the sense of what GBIC brings to that. Yeah. Because that work for Global is going to go on by. Many, many, many different organizations, including the governor's office. I don't think our 37 bit is going to make a dent in that effort. I just think it's a messaging thing. So, yeah, I'll stick to what I said there. If you all want to do something different, I'm fine with that. Too. So. I'm on board with removing the 37. So, I think you got four to one. Good. Can I ask a question about GMT? Yes, we have. A representative on that board, right? Yes. Who is our representative? Oh, wait a minute. Well, well Andrew stepped down. Raj is the alternate. We've been advertising to fill the position okay. to get the right to get yeah. somebody to fill that position. I'm going to reach out to him and just try to get involved. It, it fell apart. Like they had an orientation. I wrote to them and said, I can't make the weekday. Okay, I'll email you everything and we can check in later. And I never heard back again. And I forgot. I never heard back again, and then this is back and forth with Regina and I. And I I've got to get in touch with them. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to get in touch with them anyway because they, you know, they're supposed to get back to us with what they were doing about. Wait, they don't think they ever changed the schedule. He's supposed to be coming, isn't he? Like he's coming to. Yes. Is he coming to this coming meeting or the one after January, January, okay. January. the first meeting of January? Yeah. One of the things you know, for tech hub wise, we're not going down this road right now either. But one of the things that is possible is talking about transportation issues for workforce development and everything else, like how to service. Okay. I, I want tech hub people to start focusing on transportation and how to get how to bolster GMP, how to bolster them up that way, how to how to get the workforce to this community and not in cars, you know. And and the I think it's criminal that that number two bus, whatever ten, runs on the hour. It goes yeah. all the way out. I mean, it's a ridiculous. And all the workers for a work major yeah. manufacturing hub in the town. Yes. And and for our community and as a connector to groceries, I just think it's absolutely criminal that the bus runs on the schedule it does. Yeah. Um, they are so strapped for money. They're like checking between the seats for pennies between rides. And um, mm -hmm. But the bus is busy, you know, and the time that it's busy, it's really full. And I, right I now, they're waiting for one the other day. And right now, they're fear free. So it makes right. it even harder for them to make changes. Okay. Um, do we have another one? No. Oh, yes. We just wanted to look at the lots fund. Uh, so that is next up. That's page 61 of your PDF packet. Um, so I can't wait to look new policy for this. Yes. Um, very excited about that. You're I know what did, did we get the numbers for, I, I wrote that key one, but it doesn't seem like for the fair, including from the lot revenue for the fair. Yes. Yeah, is, I is saw that somewhere. Where is that? That's, that's a 20. 20. So it's in the November kind of that I emailed out. Okay. Um, let me see if I... 
was in the lot part of this. I should be able to find it. Yeah, I mean, the lot of the lot, I guess, but it's just a, an estimate of, I think there's much to it. Yeah, it's just a little bit of information. Um, revenue that we received November 21st, which would have covered the fare, is 280, just under 285. Okay. So we just now, with that payment that came in, we just now have a full year of revenue. Um, so the lot fund, what I did here was I, I projected this out several years. Um, based on what you'll see in the lot revenue policy next week, um, just to kind of illustrate what we're proposing in that capital committee is proposing in that policy. So essentially um, the notes over here, FY23 and FY24, we had specific expenditures assigned um, coming from that fund. But in FY25, um, we are, so the lot policy proposes that 25% of the revenue is going specifically to sidewalk projects. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then years FY, uh, 26 through 29, what I've done is I just kind of randomly threw a number in just for analysis sake of $800,000 going to capital um, in addition to the sidewalk amount. Um, just to sort of illustrate, and again, the revenue that's budgeted in here is conservative, I think, based on what we have this first year. But this, I think this is a budget where we need to be conservative on the revenue because the economy could go mm -hmm. and yeah, and we have no one we have fund balance. Correct. And no fund balance. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Are any of these higher dollar funds put into a, an account that has a higher generating yield? They will be, yes. Okay. Yep. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of the capital funds that are set aside, basically lot revenue, um, ARPA could have been, I mean, we have it, it's sitting in, it's not sitting in a checking account right, right. now. Um, but we will, I'll be looking into like short-term and longer-term investment options, CDs, money, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, we've just been, because the cash flow has been so heavy with Crescent Connector and the Main Street Waterline projects, yeah. I've been holding off until those are a little more settled, um, so that I'm not tying up cash. Yeah, because these could go into like a six-month CD. Yeah. That, that would be yep. an amazing amount of difference in terms yes. of revenue than just a checking account. Yep. Yep. Questions? Thoughts? I mean, this doesn't... My, this my, doesn't yeah, yeah, my questions would be more for when we, when we discuss the policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I have a lot of... As they relate to this particular budget year, it's going to be a conversation. Because I have... Yeah. So anyway, yeah. But not necessarily this right now. I think this is great news. I think this is kind of what we hope for. Yep. Um, in terms of helping us with capital long term. Um, it's interesting looking at the looking at the capital charts. <laughs> Bills like it doesn't make a dent, but mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, it, it, it yeah, really does make that so honestly without this, I think the story is without this, it would be a, a, a vastly different yeah, picture. So I think um I think it's great. We're ready for Andrew's like proposals. No, eight years too late, but we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember the first time we came up in I do. And the town meeting specifically, and like nobody defended them. Or oh, they just know. they just stood up in the town meeting and the select board sat there as everybody mischaracterized what it was, yep. how, how it worked, yep. who paid everything, and they just sat in their hands and let it go. I was like, wow. It's because you didn't have the right person doing it. You gotta put some humor into the conversation. Oh, <laughs> Totally not. Um, yeah, we still have businesses like collecting it on high press. Still have businesses on high press, but they're collecting it. Yeah, so, um, in the Red Mall, I can well, reach out to my contacts at the state. 
you do you have names that you can email to me at the end? Yeah, just don't tell my wife I told them. Perfect. I will. <laughs> she doesn't watch this stuff, so you can submit an so, anonymous. I was like, how much did you pay on that stuff? <laughs> There's a lot of problems about it, but I narrowed it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um we're in discussion time. There's any thoughts? There are, um, there's one thing in particular I'd like to talk about, but I know that it also has to do with our association contracts. Um, and so given that that is an active negotiation, I'm wondering if I should hold those comments until another point in time. It should probably be under executive summary. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I may have a yeah. similar question in terms of how to put it. Right. Yeah, I, I have right now. Right now. something to also, sure. no, no. Yeah, can we do an executive session after next meeting? To, Cover all these questions, or yeah, depends on how up, long yeah. you would like to be here. No, not now. Next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a big, big, big agenda. agenda. Is it? Yeah. Um, but we can put it on right there, and we can table it if you don't. If you don't, it like, won't hurt us to put it on, and then if it gets tabled, it gets tabled. How about? Coach, you know what they were going to bring up to Regina hmm. in the next two or three days, two days. Tomorrow. Just thinking about tomorrow, Friday, to hear the thing out. And if you think that it's narrow enough um, that it can be done in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, it's for us to get an idea of an impact if we're all thinking about the same thing, then go for it. If you don't, maybe you just decide. Um, or you can decide to just put it on the table. Um, if we're on the same page and it's essentially the same question, we could probably get through it. Um, maybe that's just too much clandestine behind the scenes work, but I'm just trying to move this along. And it is a big agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if people are going to have the energy at that point to be able to do it. Okay. Okay. Or is that where they both? Where were they all? Why are you me? Like <laughs> you're the one that set it up. That, <laughs> that you had all sorts of funds, like no, kicking my two thousand dollars and saving out the door. This is the whole reason Amber stuck around. <laughs> so, so one thing I do think we need to talk about. Um, for me, uh, having a million dollar library. I think we really need to ask ourselves some questions about how much we as a community um, want to have in terms of services. Uh, as such, our library is open longer than any other library than uh, in the state with a population over 5,000, according to the Department of Libraries uh, 2022 data. Um, our library is open 3,056 hours per year. The next closest from that one is the Brooks Memorial at 3019. From that, uh, it then goes down to 2700. How long is Fletcher Free open? That's a bigger population center. That's the 3016. So we're open more than Fletcher Free Library. Oh, bigger okay. uh, the average library with a population uh, of over 5,000 is open 2,186 hours. We are open on average 58 weeks per year. Uh, I would personally like to see that reduced to 48, I'm sorry, 58 hours per week. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> I personally would be curious budgetarily what that would mean if it were to be reduced to 48 hours per week, which would mean that we are open 2,500 hours per year, which is still uh, which is still over the average. So in terms of communities over 5,000, our communities would be getting more open hours uh, in terms of library time. That's the question. In comparison to those hours, where is the brown owl in circulation and services? Because last time I remember when I was on the board there, we were one of the top five most used libraries in the state. And so the usage dictated the hours. I do think it's going to be important to see the statistics that I asked for. Yeah, I mean, that is that is driving that that is driving that. 
Um, again, if you if you have some, if you have two people that are coming in between five and, and eight, why are we keeping the library open for three hours and staffing four people? Do you mean like numbers? Of, sorry. No, you're good. Do you mean numbers of books? Um. Well, Is that it's it's hard because books are down, digital services are way up, computer services are way up, programming is way up. And because the nature of libraries is changing, Brownell can't necessarily record everything. And so I just want to make sure, I totally understand what you're saying, Andrew, and I don't disagree, but I also want to make sure that we are doing as best we can to be apples to apples because I would instead compare in popul instead of population of community, I would be comparing volume mm -hmm. and I would put us in the same level of volume as Fletcher Free and compare ourselves to Fletcher Free because that is the only other library in the state that's even close to well, our level of volume. But we don't have them. I mean, I understand. I would also look at the last library report that just came out, the most <laughs> recent, I can send it to you. Or if, she yeah. imported it to me. It's, a, it's widely available. It's massive, but don't get... It has a salary study, it has millions of appendices. So the, the main part of the um will get you what you want. It's a little more clear. We don't have the tax base for all. So, no, we don't. You know, and I I don't know that we can we have to do something because next year it's gonna be one point one something. And it just with that with the average increase, unless they bring it down to three and then it's a little over one. I, so if you're talking, I don't about, know how we do that, and I wasn't trying to be. No, I. Uh, they have so many challenges right now mm -hmm. that I don't know how we address that because they're those challenges are huge and they're real, and we also can't sustain it. So I, I, I think we need to look at some of this stuff. I think we're going to hear from an equal number of people that would give us that feedback around that use some services, right? We're gonna have a population oh, of people that use libraries. The fact that we're talking like this, I can guarantee you there will be a hundred people sure. online at our annual meeting defending the library. No, and that's why I, I think. So if you're talking about total number of books, Fletcher Free has 110,000 total books. Uh, Brownell has 60,246. No, I was talking about circulation, not quantity of books. See, right, like, exactly. There's- And I'd wanna know circulation into city in the city right. versus Versus people, but these are people public. accessing programming and then from other communities. So well, so okay, but the numbers that she has, they want right. yeah. Yeah. Fletcher yeah. Free has a subscription. You can only borrow if you pay for a card. Whereas Essex uh, Brownell is part of the home card system, mm -hmm. which is connected to all the other libraries in Chittenden County. And so anybody from Jericho can come into the Brownell and borrow a book. You can't do that in Berlin Fletcher. Yeah. So if you're talking total circulation. Brownells was 84,753. Fletcher free 339,000. Yeah, I mean, in some in some measures, Fletcher free is off the charts compared to us, but in right. others, I, I think we're similar. Williston is a similar size community. What is Williston might be the Allen Memorial Library is or Jericho? Yeah. Williston. Dorothy yeah. Allen is probably more appropriate. Yeah. My big my well, biggest concern it. about that. that that problem again, realizing that the, the problem is the problems are real, the challenges are real, is the fact that we're we're trying to fulfill this need and protect or, or create a situation where it's a safe space, it's a welcoming space, all of that. But I'm gonna word it, I'm gonna word it once. They're librarians, not counselors. Right. They're not right. social workers. Right. And I hear a lot about the work that's going in to like get them up to speed enough to be able to assist enough, but I still keep falling, I still keep thinking though, that's an inappropriate, it's not the right interaction. Create the right create the right space so these people can be welcomed in, but let's get them, let's hurry up and connect them with someone who has the expertise get them connected to the right services or give them the right assistance that they require in order to, again, hopefully put them on, on, on a better path. But um, or it feels it feels weird to me because it feels like what we're doing is we're creating, are, are we maintaining a library 
or we're maintaining a safe space for those in need. I think those are two very different things. By statute, a library requires certain things in all of this. And I get that there's been some creep here on their scope. So I, I'm a little concerned about how we look at this from a manpower standpoint, how we look at this from an availability standpoint. I mean, I mean I've been thinking about this too, Marcus. And you know, there's there's it's gonna have to be a larger conversation about what services are missing in Essex Junction. How could we bring services that are located in Burlington out here, like cots, perhaps? Do we need a conversation about a day center for homeless people? Yes. Do we need a conversation about um, going? Do we need to go to the Howard Center and say we want you to? We want a part-time social worker staffed at the Brownell. I mean, like, can we put a person in the Brownell who is specializes in that, and then the librarians don't have to deal with it? Like, what are all the different ways? But. This is not a, I mean, we're going to have a million dollar library, whether we like it or not, because this is not a thing we can fix right now. No, but I think the difficult decision we have to make is that is after today, one of, it, it's just one of those tiny, it's a tiny little things that we can do with this, like throughout this, to keep this down and nothing that, is obvious to me, except rating some other sources, which I don't think is a good idea, will bring this down significantly. But what was your mean? proposal? Cut the hours by 10 hours a week. Yeah, I mean, I think that's yeah. the only. You know, when back in the day, Penny Pillsbury told me once, she said the best way to get the community to pay attention to what the library needs is to make the community feel pain. So cutting hours is a great example. But I think what we could also say is if we did that and then maybe we did a few other things like the stipends and the, or the phones and like whatever, and we say to the community, here's what the library told us. They are completely distracted by people who need a lot of help and they cannot do their job. So community, until we solve that problem together, the library is going to have to be reduced because we cannot sustain that amount. Like so that's what I propose. Yeah, balancing think, that difficult conversation. I think on top of that, we need to really inventory the what I will call some of the innovation that they've brought, which is really cool. And subscriptions and expected norms now and and really present that, you know, as a combination of things. You know, I, I think it seems to me I've heard the locker program presented to me as a time savings now today. Mm -hmm. And then a source for new staff needed, new hours needed, so they can make sure that they associate and get those picks. So now I'm almost 100% sure that if I go back and watch the video from last year or the year before, that I'm going to hear that they need extra staff to fulfill the picking, pack and ship for the books. And now it's saving time at the desk. And that could have changed because of the nature of what they're dealing with, could very well, very well have evolved. But I I don't know. And this is a very difficult decision to have in public. Um, they're not here. And I feel bad. Um, but I think it's a combination of things. I think if if we are serving people with these lockers and if we plan to make the front door open a couple hours earlier in the morning and a couple hours or an hour and a half open in the evening past closing, which sounds reasonable, sounds like what the goal is. Then it seems to me that we can constrict the hours a little bit for people who are getting their, they're getting most of their information or much of their information now on the digital subscription or having the books picked and put in a locker they can access without it being open. Mm -hmm. And while we figure out how to get some of those support services in, mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, outreach is probably not the right source. I mean, but but um, just because they do crisis with law enforcement mostly, um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've thought for a long time this community needs a lot of a lot of services, and I think there are more services here than people actually know about. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few services in Essex Junction that, that exist, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be a whole different conversation on how that gets funded. But um, but yeah, so I, I I don't I don't know what the number is, but I, I think we need to figure out both how to make it affordable for this coming budget and to control it, the growth, but also to support 
the staff to um like, like they can be librarians for that kind of work. Right. Um, I agree. One of the things that I heard and that I've heard before, and one of the things that I want to I would like to see happen is to get away from some of the fear of the situations. I think they're doing some mitigation on some of that before an instance. The locker technology it gives a gives the community a convenience and an accessibility that most well, I've never seen in the library before. This is a fantastic service, but yet it's only open during hours if they're open. That to me seems like the wrong move. This type of the accessibility should be wider. Fine, I totally understand if you narrow that down so that it's not open midnight to four a.m. Whatever it is. But, but I think it should be more open and more accessible. So I think if we were to take like your suggestion about reducing hours, we should also ask that there be open up those open up those doors earlier. The technology is there, so those, I don't know if if those doors currently work this way, but there is technology in in the marketplace to make those doors open and lock and unlock. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, based on the time. So it doesn't require that a physical person have to be there necessarily. Um, I want to talk about the services piece real quick because hear everything you're saying. I just want to throw this out here because this is a conversation that I've had multiple times with residents, especially though centered around the conversation around Burlington, because the concern for a lot of people is you go down to Burlington and the environment has changed. The environment has changed such a way that people feel unsafe by going to Burlington. Why are these people here? Why are these people doing these things? Blah, 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 blah. What I have also heard from people in that community who are helping those in need, it's also about the fact that Burlington is also a central hub for so many services. So if I were in distress, I would probably find a way to get myself down to Burlington because I would have access to more services than in any other surrounding community. And I, and I don't want to say, don't bring those things here. I'm just saying it because of the fact that I know we're gonna hear that when, when we do say, we want to bring those services here. I think based on the need, based on what we're hearing from people like the, li the library staff, we need to bring those services here so that people have access to it. I just wanted to verbalize the fact that I have, I've heard from an opposite side and that particular point of view so that, again, it's out on the table. We're aware of it, and we can discuss it if necessary. So, are there any other areas where people thought they saw some potential um, opportunities I think unfortunately, I feel like there's so many, it would be so many little things yeah. that it'd almost be easier to go. Everybody just cut back by 1%, 2%, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't see it. I didn't see those chunks that I can necessarily grab and start pulling out of the crowd. We've addressed some of them, but it wasn't that many. I think it's to back to a comment that I made about the tree advisory. If you give somebody ten thousand dollars, they're going to spend it. And so like just being mindful of the fact that, you know, I did this exercise where I would have literally went through every single expense line item and said they've only spent 14% of that line item six months into the budget. Like, do you need to add another four thousand dollars on top of that? Like just having that like conversation with department heads, maybe at that level and Really, do you need another two thousand dollars for uniforms or whatever it happens to be when you haven't spent that this year? You know, and and I mean that's that's those are my like that was my big takeaway. And then looking at things like again, like walk, you know, just kind of again, they're little. If you even if you cut them in half, you're talking about ten, fifteen thousand dollars. It's not a ton of money, but it's something. Um, just trying to be responsible there. <laughs> And, and again, if you don't have anything identified, then why are we 
where we're allocating. If there is a logic there that there has to be in order to have tree advisory, that the tree city and stuff, we have to allocate ten thousand dollars. Then yes, I get that. But if really bike walk hasn't identified some flashy beaky whatever whatever thingies to do, like do they need both? all the money this coming year. I do think that if we are going to ask departments to try to find 1% just broadly, I would be highly concerned about some of the things like a fire department, yeah. where at the end of the day, if they cut 1%, then that means if you call 911, yeah. they need to have an amount in their budget. So I think there's some departments where they would should be exempt from that, whereas others, yes, you absolutely should have that conversation. And if that means we can have a as a board here, you need to talk about services broadly, then let's do that. We agree with that. Yep, agreed. Just looking at that calculation, you suggested, Andrew, cutting back 10 hours a week would bring the Brown Owl to being open the same amount of time as the Dorothy Allen and just a little bit more than South Burlington and a little bit more than Essex Spring. Brown Owl is open more hours than any other library in Chippewa County. Mm -hmm. Yep. I sent you all the link to the same data that I had on from the yeah, Department of Library's you. website. I highly encourage you to look at the tab that says POP 5000 plus. So you can see for yourself, the columns go all the way to GK. So there are things in here that I just don't understand uh, broadly. Uh, <laughs> programming, circulation, collections, like all that stuff is in here. Um, I don't know what it means. Okay. Have yeah, no and there is the yeah. there is the very recent just release. Um, I'll try to send that link out, or maybe Jan has it. But, um, or I can just email the PDF the report. Um, I have that little thing. I've got to try and get through it. Um, but um, I will say broadly on that report, um, this issue of um, essentially the libraries filling in in that social services role is. Um, a very big issue. Lots of librarians feel undertrained. Um, that isn't necessarily the sense that Brown Owl. Um, they do feel well equip equipped, and they feel like um, they're doing a good job with it. Um, but it is a um, component that is newer and more frequent than um, previously. Uh, so just keep that in mind that that um that report um is a real direct reflection of exactly what's going on there uh, the feelings of drama i'll also just put out there that before this board talks about like mental health services that there be a conversation with the department of mental health as well as mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. organizations and the state system for mental health is extremely stressed no organization of the definite agencies are anywhere near staff to full capacity mm -hmm. so if we're going to go down that route we're going to be competing against the system mm -hmm. which is going to further harm the system in some ways so in terms of how to better align efforts would have be a way i would highly advise this time to go mm -hmm. yeah i would agree and and, and i think I think we could we could offer we could even offer Howard to, to fund that person and they still wouldn't be able to fund it. Right. Um, yeah, right. Six hundred and some odd vacancies or something else like that. So yeah. um we're you know if that's a road to go down, we're probably gonna be competing in the market to get somebody on our own of our own employee. Um brings up a whole other cascading discussion with other agencies that we already contract with. Um which adds to the cost. Awesome. I'd, I'd, prefer, I'd prefer not to choose me, I'd prefer, I'd prefer to work with the yeah. community in order to satisfy the need. The yeah. Totally yes. recognizing the shortcomings that well, currently have. You want to get along? Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there anything to know? Oh, no, we're just um, All right, is there anything? Sounds like everybody's done. <laughs> totally fine with me. I'm good. No, I just want to give anybody that you want to figure it out. So I would entertain a motion. There's nothing else from Jess or Regina. I don't think so. I mean, I, th I think we've got some clear directives of some things that we can cut and we can see what that looks like. We have a very clear, I mean, let me not say clear, but we have a list of questions uh, that we will sort through and try to get some answers on. Um, and then 
I think we've got some more unknowns, but just so folks know, we don't intend to have a budget discussion next week because we have a lot of other things, some of which will answer some of the questions you have today on various different projects and components and pieces. Um, we will have a January 10th, we'll be heavily focused on the budget, including a presentation from GMP and a presentation from Winooski Valley Parks District. Um, and then, um, your second meeting in January is where we hope we get a good, good to a, get to a good place with a draft budget that we are ready to present at the community dinner, meal, brunch, kind of thing. <laughs> How, you know, we didn't talk about this tonight. Um, are we talking? When are we talking about the or is the outreach? The yes. outreach methods schedule. Where is that stand at this point? We put the draft of that in the reading file for this package just so folks can sort of see roughly what that looks like. It will be a business item discussion next Wednesday. Okay. So you can sort of really think on that a little bit more um, about what we're intending to do and if there's anything missing or. Okay. Yeah. Well, if that's it, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Great. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your first budget day, both of you. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. Is it really? Yeah.